Savage Secrets, Savagery and Skills Book One by Ciara Graves Chapter One Seneca The envelope lay next to my hand, waiting to be picked up by my latest client. In my other hand, I held a bottle with no label. All it had in it was spring water. No reason to drink around this crowd and lose my edge. Not that any of them had to know I wasn't really drinking. I was always armed, a stake and two daggers concealed beneath my green leather pants and black top. My short swords would be too obvious here, so sadly those were at home. I sat with my back to the wall, bare feet on the chair next to mine. Waiting. Watching. That's what I was good at doing these days. Always watching. I shifted my right hand, and the white gold rings on three of my fingers glittered in the neon light. The gemstones, sapphire, ruby, and emerald, glowed in response to the phi blood running through my veins. No trouble was headed my way tonight, at least. The ruby would be flashing if it was. The man I was supposed to meet, however, was late and I hated late people. How's it hanging tonight, Seneca? Not tonight, Harry. I didn't even glance at the phi. Meeting a client. You're always meeting a client. Yes, because I work. Unlike you, who do absolutely nothing for a living, last time I checked. You're a contract killer or thief or whatever you want to call yourself these days. Not exactly work either. He shrugged, leaning back in his chair instead of getting up and leaving. At least not honest work. And I do too have a job. No, you don't. You're damned lucky you're protected, or I'd get you off the streets myself. For free. Harry was one of many Phi banished to the human world, who, instead of finding a way to be a productive member of the supernatural society here, or blend in with the humans, fell into the darkness. Phi dust was a real thing, though it was hard to find and store. The only way to procure it was to drain blood from a Phi and break it down. Most were not willing to donate their blood. The right buyer could bring in a pretty penny, and for the humans who bought it, it was better than any drug they could ever hope to make. Harry was one of the dealers, and I hated him with a burning passion. Too bad he was protected by the head of the Phi dust trade in this state, or I'd put him out of his misery. It was because of Phi like Harry, this town was falling apart. Madwich was not a large place at all, but that's what I liked about it. There was too much noise in the larger cities. We were close enough that the lights and sounds still reached us on very clear nights. So much commotion made me anxious. Too much chaos that wasn't controlled. Harry started out in Boston, then migrated here. The second he stepped foot in town, I knew he was bad news. Told him so, but he explained who he worked for. I had no choice but to shut up about it. How about you leave? I asked, annoyed. Oh, come on. You know you want me around for company. You know, he said, his eyes dark and breath overly sweet. A sure tell that he'd sampled some of his product tonight already. Another sure tell what type of fi he was. He half winked as he continued. My boss keeps asking about bringing you on. We could use the muscle. What do you say? Not if all nine levels of hell froze over, I muttered. Go away. You're no fun. You know that? You need to learn to loosen up. Harry, the client I'm meeting is a fed. He's a warlock too. You really want to be here when he shows up. Be my guest. I'm sure he'd love to speak to you in depth about this business of yours. My gaze remained focused elsewhere not even bothering to look at him. Didn't have to. He gulped. His chair scraped against the floor and then he was gone. The feds had been cracking down on the selling of dust. Or at least attempting to. They had enough backup to go after the dealers and their bosses without fear of retaliation. I did not. Rotten piece of fi trash, I whispered. I might be fi too, but there was no real kinship between me and all the others. They had their reasons, and that was just fine by me. Who needed to belong to a people anyway? Right? Another ten minutes had ticked by when my client finally made an appearance. He tugged at his leather jacket, looking completely out of place. His black slicked back hair made him look like a D-bag, 
and that's pretty much what he was. A job was a job, and the feds usually paid damned well when they wanted intel on someone. I let him stand there, looking uncomfortable for a solid two minutes, then raised my hand over my head, catching his attention. He hurried to my table and sat down. Well? Good evening to you too, Agent Williams. I slid the envelope toward him. Here. He took it and opened it up, but didn't pull any of the photos or pages of intel out. This is it. It's all I could get. You were on Draven for a month. How is this all you got? He shook his head as he rifled through the pictures again. There's no evidence to tie him to the murders. None. Draven needs to be taken down. I got you enough to justify further investigating him, I assured him. There's proof in there he's involved with the Phi in charge of the dust trade in town. Start there. I can even give you names of his dealers. You should have plenty to cast suspicion on him, and have a reason to drag him in for questioning. This is not what we agreed to. I'm after him for murder, not the trade. Look, I said, sitting up, do you have any idea what coven that vampire belongs to? Because I do. If you think I'm going to find a way to get close enough for him to spot me, you're insane. Not happening. And no way am I risking my neck by venturing into other world. Agent Williams's eye twitched in anger. This vampire has killed four agents in the last three months, he snapped in reply. Maybe you should train your agents better. Teach them to not get killed. Agent Williams slammed the envelope on the table. I'm not paying you for this. If you think you're going to find anyone else crazy enough to even get remotely as close as I already have, you're wrong. I won't do it, not for the amount you're offering. So, this is a holdout then for more money? No, you idiot. This is me telling you, I'm not risking my life for a murderer. I'm not a cop. Why don't you just hire me to kill him and be done with it? Why go through all this trouble to get intel on him? I can kill him for you. Love to kill him for the agent. I always jumped at the chance to kill any vampire in that godforsaken coven. I held my breath, waiting for him to make that decision, but he shook his head once in a firm no. We need him alive. There are others in that coven we want more than him. Like who? Like the vampire who runs it, Rue Darius. The rings on my hand glowed briefly until I tucked my hand out of sight. Agent Williams's eyes narrowed at the sight, and he stared at me. What? I stared back. You know that name. Everyone knows that name, I hissed. And you're an idiot to think you can stop him. He's behind the Phi dust trade here and in the cities. Runs half the East Coast, Agent Williams explained. He's been harvesting it from your people for decades. I would think you would want him gone as much as the next Phi. Don't presume to know anything I think, Agent Williams. The threat to cause him pain was evident in my voice. You'll never get close enough to bring him in. Not yet, but we're going to, and to do that, we need this intel on Draven. He's the first in a long line leading us to Rue Darius. I held up my hands. Unless you want him dead, I can't help you any further. You will get us the proof we need, or you won't be paid, and perhaps we'll stop using your services altogether, Savage. I ground my teeth, the rings on my right hand glowing with anger instead of fear this time. The supernatural feds were my main source of income mostly for spying and gathering the intel they needed to prosecute supernatural beings. I could go where they couldn't, without breaking laws or being caught. I stole for them too when need be. The only thing they would never admit to, was the supernatural killings I did for them under the table. Those were few and far between. No humans though. That was where I drew the line. They were too easy of a target, and would bring down a whole lot of trouble on all our heads if word got out about killing humans. Tensions between the humans and supernatural beings were always on shaky grounds without my killing their kind. I can't get any closer without risking exposure. Not sure how many times you need me to tell you this. It's just a vampire coven. Can't be that bad. Find a way or there will be consequences. Oh yeah? Like what? 
I leaned closer to him, unnerving him. Good. Remember, I keep records too. All my money came from somewhere. You're a fool to think we have any record of ever hiring you, he shot back. Refuse to do this job, and you'll go down for every crime you've ever committed. Every crime. That's at least one death sentence if not more, isn't it? How many have you killed over the years? Ten more? It was thirteen, to be exact. Two of them from very old royal witch families, who would love to see me executed for my crimes. My rings flared to life at having him threaten me like that. Agent Williams should know better, but he had a point. If they ever decided to turn on me, I would be on the run and not just from the supernatural government. The human one would want me too, for all the spying and thieving I'd done to their people when the time called for it. He appraised me with no expression whatsoever. We are too close now to find another person to get close to Draven. Still I kept my mouth shut. Glad we understand one another, he went on. Do what you have to do to get what I require or your face will be splashed all over the state as our latest most wanted. He slid the folder back to me as he stood up. Fair warning Agent Williams, I said when he started to walk away. If you ever do decide to turn on me, remember what I am. I have no problem adding another name to my list. What you are? He laughed derisively. You are nothing but a part Phi who is shunned by her own kin, and part vampire who will never be accepted by any coven for the Phi blood in your veins. I know very well who you are, Savage. I'll be in touch, and I expect at our next meeting you give me something worthwhile. He walked away and I bared my fangs at him, hissing quietly. If only I had no moral code at all, I'd kill him now and be done with it. That plus, starting a feud with the feds was not a good idea, so I let it go and finished off my water, ready to order something stronger now that my time was my own. I raised my hand to motion to the bartender, when a figure shifted through the crowd at the bar. I froze, sure I was seeing things. The lighting dimmed as the hour grew later and I spotted the head of white hair again. It wasn't possible. Shouldn't be at least, but I could have sworn on my favorite onyx blade that the man I hadn't seen in seven years, the man who up and left me in the middle of nowhere and without finishing my training was standing in this very club tonight. The crowd moved again. I held my breath, waiting for his face to come into view, but the white head of hair was gone. Just gone. Like he had never even been there. Macron. I hissed again at the thought of his name, and decided I was no longer in the mood to stick around. I could relax just fine back at home. Heading out of the club, my mind drifted away from the vampire I was paid to spy on, to a very different vampire. The one who made my life my own personal nightmare for years. He was greatly to blame for why I was so messed up. My bare feet made no sound outside on the sidewalk taking me where I needed to go without having to think about it, which was too bad because I could have used the distraction. Growing up hadn't been perfect, but I'd been happy until a freak accident killed my parents when I was nine. They'd been on a train headed home while I stayed with friends. The track was taken out by a storm, and no one knew until it was too late. The train went off the side of a cliff, and they were gone just like that. I should have gone into the system, but I'd been too distraught so I ran away from my parents' funeral. It had been the worst mistake of my life. As a Phi, I thought I'd be able to survive in the woods on my own, and I did for a while, using what my mother had taught me about our nature magic and plants. I avoided the veil at all costs, not wanting to travel to Otherworld. All the stories I heard growing up were far from fairy tales. Both my parents left Otherworld to create a new life for me. Dealing with humans, was preferable to the chaos that occurred in the supernatural kingdoms on a daily basis. They came here to keep me safe, and then I wound up losing them and getting sucked into that freaking world anyway. All by yourself there, girly, a voice purred from nearby. That's a shame, wouldn't you say, boys? Sniggering met his words, and I glanced up in time to find myself surrounded by vampires. Four of them, three not long turned by the thirst in their eyes. I stopped a foot from the one who'd spoken, now blocking my path, and glowered at him. He appeared a few years older, 
but that still made him young in terms of vampire years. Move, I ordered. Why would we do that? Do you want to die tonight? The silver stake I kept tucked in its special trigger sheath at my forearm was a comfortable weight. Four against one were not bad odds for me, especially considering my blood was death to any vampire who drank it. Guess not everyone in this town knows about me. And what I am. The four vampires moved in closer, and I shifted my bare feet slightly on the concrete as the rings on my right hand glowed faintly. We know what you've been up to, and you're going to stop. Damn. They knew who I was after all. They just had to go and ruin my fun. Don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think you do, the vampire hissed. I snarled right back. He hesitated. You really think you can scare me? You and your boy band here? You're outnumbered. Check again, vampire. A slow smile spread across my face at the sound of that growling voice. It had been three months since I'd seen him. How he always managed to find me when I was in trouble was beyond me, but damned was I glad. The vampires turned to look at the tall, silver-haired, dark-skinned demon stalking toward them, the portal to the demon realm of Valesk behind him closing in a ring of fire. His hands were loose at his sides but his face was set, ready for a fight. Well? Care to continue this conversation? Or save yourself some hurt, Owen that silver-haired dark-skinned demon asked. The vampires hissed and backed away. The one who threatened me lingered a moment longer, narrowing his gaze as he bared his fangs, breath stinking of blood. Best watch yourself half-blood, or you'll have a lot more to deal with than just four vampires. He reached toward me. I hissed viciously. Owen growled, closing the distance between them in two long strides. He grabbed the vampire by the throat and threw him to the side, giving him a swift kick to the ass to get him moving along. He scampered away after his friends, throwing glares over his shoulder. Why is it every time I come back, I find you staring down a pissed-off crowd of supernaturals? Owen asked me as he turned back around. It's a gift, I replied. He rolled his eyes but reached an arm around my waist and drew me in close. Gods, I missed you. His lips brushed against mine, and I melted into his embrace. Same. I kissed him right back, then walked along with my arm around his waist, leaning into his side. How was Valesk? Any exciting news from Otherworld? Owen was a bodyguard for one of the demon ambassadors, and worked for three months on, one month off. It wasn't the best schedule in the world but he had some time off in between, when the ambassador didn't need his full guard. We'd made it work these last couple of years, but there were days I wondered how long I could keep our relationship going. Owen wasn't the problem. It was me, I worried about screwing it up. Honestly, wouldn't know what I'd do without him by my side, saving my ass all the time. He was 25, just a little older than me, and had a large family. To say he was a great boyfriend was never good enough. I didn't deserve him, and was quite certain no one understood what he saw in a messed up, tainted fi like me. Nothing, he eventually replied, though it seemed there was more to whatever he'd heard recently than nothing. Same old boring news. That's depressing. I was looking forward to something making my night better, I pressed. But if it had anything to do with the ambassador's safety, he couldn't tell me. Oh what? I'm not enough? He put on an overdramatic frown. More than enough. I'm really glad you came back tonight, actually. You could have handled them on your own. Not arguing with you there. I frowned and shook my head. Never mind. Don't want to ruin your first night back. Been too long. He let it go, but his tense body told me this conversation was far from over. We reached my small cottage on the outskirts of town, but I didn't want to go inside quite yet. I took the stone path, around the back of the house to the gardens illuminated by magic orbs of light floating through the air. They brightened at my presence, and I smiled, reaching out toward the blues and purples as they moved out of my way. At the wooden bench Owen had crafted for me when I first bought this cottage, I sat down heavily, tucking my feet under me. He turned about slowly taking in the garden and all that changed since he'd been here last. The honeysuckle is coming in better this year. 
and the roses. I need to do some work out here. Haven't much felt like gardening. His gray eyes narrowed at my words. Since when? A few days ago. This new job's gotten under my skin is all. Have anything to do with the vampires tonight? Might. He sat down beside me, picking up a lock of my red hair in his fingers. Seneca, if you're in some sort of trouble, I'll get you out of it. I don't want you always having to save me, I whispered, annoyed. You think I care, he growled. It kills me every time I leave, knowing any day you could get hurt or worse, doing what you do. But I know you'll never stop. Only reason I don't ask you to find another job. Oh yeah? Like what? I asked, curious, resting my head back as he continued to play with my hair. Being with him was more relaxing than sitting in that club all night, seeing ghosts from my past. You're fi. You could garden, open a flower shop. Hell, you could run a great cafe. A cafe? Seriously? I said with a laugh. Why not? You're sociable when you want to be. Hum, not sure I could see myself serving tarts and lattes. You would have to leave your swords at home. Better than you risking your life for another payday. He growled quietly. I knew what was coming next because it was the only thing we ever got aggravated at each other about. You know I make enough to support us. The ambassador even gave me a raise. You could stop taking the risky jobs, at least. Those pay the best, and you are not going to take care of everything. That's not what we agreed on. Not like we're married. I thought I heard him murmur, not yet, and my stomach nodded, not in a happy nervous way. Things change, he said, this time louder. I said I could handle it, I insisted, and moved to get up. He caught my wrist and turned me back toward him. Those vampires tonight, what were they talking about? I considered not answering, but he was a damn stubborn demon when he wanted to be. Draven? The feds wanted me to get proof that Draven was involved in the murders of four of their agents. His grip on my wrist tightened as if he was going to be able to keep me there. Keep me safe. You can't. I did, I corrected. Sort of at least, but didn't get what they needed. And? And the Fed wants me to keep trying, or they're going to throw me under the bus. They really want this one. I should have told him what else Agent Williams said, about them going after Rudarius, but if there was ever a way to ruin a night, mentioning that vampire was it. I'd keep that bit to myself if I could. Owen would march down to the Fed building himself and call Agent Williams out on it, which would lead to me having to explain why I knew the vampire. That was not something I wanted to do. Ever. They can't threaten you like that. I'm not a demon, so your ambassador can't protect me. I laughed harshly as I added, I'm not all fi either and definitely not all vampire. No one's going to save me from this mess. I will. He pulled me down on his lap, making me feel so small against his broad chest. I don't care what I have to do, but you are not going to keep working on this case. You're too close already, if Draven is sending his goons to scare you. Not like the head of the coven is actually here. He's in Otherworld. Oops. Hadn't meant to say that but too late now. Owen's arms closed protectively around me. Doesn't mean he can't suddenly come here. And if he catches you poking around his coven, what do you think will happen? Sen please don't do this. I worry about you enough as it is. I held his cheek in my hand as he shifted his face enough to kiss my palm. I won't get caught. You don't know that. If I think I'm getting too close, I'll pull back. I promise. They won't get me. He wasn't happy with me, but he didn't argue anymore. He got up, setting me on my feet. You eat yet tonight? I'm starving. Of course you are, I said with a laugh, and we went inside, leaving the colorful orbs floating through the garden. A scream ripped out of my throat as I thrashed, fighting against the hands holding me down. They'd found me again. I was trapped with no way out. I kicked and punched, struggling in vain to get free. I had to get away. 
Couldn't let this be real. Not again. Seneca. Come back to me, a familiar growling voice said. You're safe. You're with me. But it was a lie, had to be a lie. There was no such thing as safe. Nothing good left in the world. Sen, open your eyes. Look at me. A warm hand cupped my cheek. One by one, my eyes opened to find Owen's worried face hovering over my own. He rested his forehead to mine the second I stopped fighting him. I clung to him instead. You're safe. There's no one here but me. He didn't let me go for a long while. Not that I wanted him to. My cheeks were wet and I wiped at them. I'm sorry. No, he growled loudly. What did we talk about? Right. Don't be sorry. Were you having nightmares while I was gone? No. I cleared my throat. None that bad. This is why I don't want you working this case, he said firmly. It drags everything back out into the open. I can handle it. His arched brow said he highly doubted it, especially after what he just saw. Seneca. I need some water. I pushed away from him, climbing out of bed. I walked into the bathroom and shut the door, flipping on the light. The water was cold when I splashed it on my face, but I hoped the shock would be enough to chase the rest of the nightmare away. It wasn't. I gripped the sink hard, glaring at my reflection and doing everything I could to not let my gaze drift lower. Too bad it never worked. My eyes found the scars at my wrists first, jagged and puckered from where the skin had been viciously torn open. Not once or twice, but more times than I could even remember. More slashes and burns created a roadmap of pain moving up my arms to my bare shoulders. Many were silver. More were red and twisted. When I first met Owen, I expected him to be disgusted at the sight of what resided beneath my shirt and sleeves. The worst scars were on my back. The time he saw those, I was sure he would leave me, but he hadn't. Every phi prided having wings. We hardly use them here in the human world. I vaguely remembered using mine a few times when I was little, but the drain on our magic here was too much to have them out constantly. Not that it mattered anymore. I reached a hand around to my back, but before my fingers found the scar, Owen was there, stopping me. Don't do this to yourself. He squeezed my hand, kissing my bare shoulder. Can't help it. I can feel them all again. Like it just happened. I'm going to ask you one more time to not take this job. I will pull whatever strings I have to, but I will get you out of this. I clenched my jaw, wanting to keep arguing, but maybe he was right. That vampire took too much away from you already. Don't let him take away whatever life and happiness you have. He wrapped his arms around me as I leaned back into his chest. Don't let him keep ruling your life. If only it was that easy to forget the horror those few years of my life had wrought. But it wasn't that easy. How could a Fi ever forget that she once had beautiful wings before they were torn from her back? That once I was simply Fi and not tainted? I let Owen take me back to bed. I snuggled against his chest, listening to the steady beating of his heart, the sound eventually lulling me to sleep. Chapter 2 Seneca. After I fell asleep, there were no more dreams. I woke with the sun, feeling refreshed for the first time in weeks. Owen shifted beside me, and I kissed his cheek. His first day or so back from Valesque typically found him sleeping. He usually pulled the night shifts while he was on duty. I padded out of our bedroom to the kitchen, brewed some coffee, then stepped outside into the chilly morning air. The warm mug heated my palms, and the orbs that glowed at night shimmered during the day. They floated toward me as I moved through the dewy grass to the edge of the garden. You do need some love, I murmured to my poor neglected plants. Tugging my hair back in a bun, I found my small rake and shears, then went to work weeding and pruning the beds. The cool earth beneath my hands eased my tense muscles, and I lost myself in the chore. Memories came to my mind of gardening with my parents. They were fi, and the gardens at home had been beyond magnificent. One day, I might return there. Owen wanted me to quit my job and simply enjoy life, 
but I worried I'd get bored. No, not bored. I worried the darkness would surface, and with nothing to distract myself, I'd be lost in it until they locked me away in the loony bin. Or worse, I'd turn into the heartless person I feared I would become. A killer without a care in the world for whom I hurt. The sun rose higher, warming my back. There was one benefit to my phi blood, after being bit by a vampire. The sun had no effect on me whatsoever. I'm not sure I could have lived without it. It was as much a part of me as the earth beneath my feet. I reached for the roses to prune a few dead leaves away when I stuck my finger on a large thorn. Really? I muttered. I drew my hand back to check my finger. Blood welled and I watched it, fascinated by the crimson color. There was no thirst to drink it. My phi blood helped keep that hunger in check. Drinking blood only aided in making me stronger for a time, which meant I rarely, if ever, drank blood from another living being. I could count the times on one hand that I had a sip. Mostly to see what it would do. My eyes remained locked on that drop of blood, and though the sun was warm, a chill rushed over me, raising the hair on my arms. I blinked. The garden shifted away from my view. Digging my hand into the grass, I willed my mind to remain grounded, but the pain and fear were too strong. They dragged me back to that very first moment when I prayed for death, wanted it to come and take me away. But death never heard me. What's the matter pet? A voice hissed in my ear. You don't like your new home. This isn't my home. I shook, making the chains that held me to the wall rattle. Please just let me go. Why would I do that? Precious thing like you is hard to come by. So very rare. I'm afraid I can't simply let you go. I'm no one. Just let me go, I pleaded through my tears. An icy hand grabbed the nape of my neck, forcing my head back, so I had no choice but to look up into those fierce red eyes. Fangs protruded from his gums as he opened his mouth wide. The sweet smell of your blood is tempting, so tempting. Alas, you are not a simple fi, are you? I had my suspicions but now I have proof. A dead vampire lay nearby, his lips covered in blood that had sizzled right out of his veins after he'd bitten me on the arm. The bite wound stung, and I was in shock at seeing the monster bleed out. All because of me. My captor shoved me aside, and I fell to the cold stone in relief. You are special yes, very special indeed my pet. I shook my head. No. I told you I'm no one. We shall see my pet, we shall see. Ah, and look at those beautiful wings. I gasped when he grabbed hold of one and forced it from my skin. He held it up to the light, shifting it back and forth, so the color played through the opaque violets and greens. Please, I begged. Please don't hurt me any more. Hurt? Oh no, pet, I am not going to hurt you, he hissed. I am going to break you. I had no idea what he meant at that moment. No idea. Seneca? A firm hand grabbed my shoulder. I whirled around with the rake ready to embed it in that monster's face. Except it wasn't him standing behind me. Owen caught my wrist and yanked the rake out of my stiff grip. His brow wrinkled as he looked at me, and I failed to form words. He checked my hands then and found the speck of blood. Come with me. I didn't argue, letting him drag me back inside the cottage. He grabbed a kitchen towel and wrapped it around my bleeding finger, squeezing it hard to make it stop. I'm fine, I mumbled. He growled. Why aren't you still sleeping? Because I'm not, he replied shortly. It was nothing. Just a prick of the finger. It's not your finger I'm worried about. You were back there again, and don't even try to lie about it. You were. It's lingering on your face. Working my jaw, I attempted to think of a story to tell him, but he knew me too well. What are your plans for today? He asked, checking my finger to see if the bleeding stopped. Go to the city. Track down Draven's contacts. See if I can't find where he's going to be over the next couple of days. I'm going with you. No, you're not. He snarled. This is not up for discussion. What happens if you fall into your memories again, and it's not me who sneaks up behind you? What if it's an innocent? 
or Draven himself. I have time off. I'm coming with you. I don't need a bodyguard. Not your bodyguard. I'm your boyfriend spending time with a stubborn pain-in-the-ass girlfriend, he muttered. I smiled. He returned it briefly, then examined my finger closely. Good news, you'll live. Thanks, Dr. Owen, I teased. He kept hold of my hand and then drew me into his bare chest, holding me in his arms. I shut my eyes, breathing him in, reminding myself I was far away from that dreadful place. This was where I should want to be, right here with a guy who cared about me for more than what was in my blood. Even as he held me, a strange anxiousness filled me and I fought the urge to pull back. Want to talk about it? he asked, his voice rumbling through his chest, tickling my ear. My arms closed around his waist as I shook my head. All right, why don't you get cleaned up then? You're a mess. I'm not. He reached down and ran his thumb along my cheek. You're covered in dirt. I thought you liked me messy. Oh I do, he agreed. I pulled away, headed toward the bedroom and the shower. I winked at him then took off, and he sighed heavily about my driving him crazy. This is not the city, Owen pointed out, as he parked his truck along the curb outside of the only cafe in Madwich. Not even close. We're stopping here first. You just want to drive your truck. Can you blame me? I miss the poor girl. Hardly ever gets used. You know I left you the keys for a reason. I am not driving that gas-guzzling monster, I said as we stepped into the cafe. Who are we talking to this morning? Who said we're talking to anyone? He grunted. I know how you work. He leaned down and whispered in my ear, it's how we met. Remember? I do. Never forget that day. Bet you don't. You want a coffee? Of course. I'll be at that corner table in the back, I told him, pointing it out. He held onto my arm when I started to walk away. What? Her? You came here to talk to her. Why wouldn't I? He scowled at me. Don't much like her. And you know why. I do, but she's the only one in this town who might be able to help me. I can't be constantly having these flashbacks when I'm after Draven, I said quietly. You don't have to talk to her, but I need to. If you want to wait outside. No, I'll be joining you shortly. He eyed the woman suspiciously, then set off for the counter. I walked toward the back table and pulled out a chair. I barely sat down when the woman with long, flowing black hair at the table right next to mine turned her head. She sniffed the air once, then smiled, her white eyes looking at nothing and everything. Ah well now? This I did not see this morning. Why don't I believe you? I asked, taking my seat. I don't know. No reason not to. You see everything, Minnie. Surely you saw this happening. She shrugged as she stirred her coffee slowly. What can I say? Sometimes it gets old, seeing everything. You aren't here alone. No. Owen has returned. Perfect timing that demon of yours has. I frowned. Why do you say that? You came here this morning for more than just coffee. You want answers about your nightmares of late. About seeing your past far too vividly. I shifted in my chair, glancing around, but we were in Madwitch in a cafe. There were no other vampires out in this bright sunshine. Certainly not the one who haunted my dreams. I do. I'm afraid I don't have any to give you. Don't lie. She shrugged. Sometimes I lie to try and save people from truths they don't wish to hear. Meaning what? I asked, leaning closer. What have you seen? She craned her neck to the side and nodded her head. Owen, so good to see you return safely from Belesk. Minnie, Owen said gruffly, sitting down beside me with our coffees. You don't have to try and be nice with me, Minnie teased. I know you don't like Sears. Don't trust them. There's a difference but please, carry on. I worried she wouldn't now that he was here, but she tilted her head back, eyes wide open, then sighed. I see many things as always. Some will come to pass, others I cannot say for certain. 
The one thing I do know is your life will be forever changed. A shiver raced down my spine. Even as Owen muttered under his breath, course it will be. Hush, I told him. What? She hasn't told you anything concrete. Nothing at all. Yet, Minnie said, tapping the side of her nose with her finger. These nightmares of yours, I fear they will get worse before they get better. That's not what I want to hear. I know but it's the truth. There is something buried in your mind that needs to get out. The more you suppress your memories, the less chance it has of coming forward," she warned. And it is very important you face it. Can't you just tell her? Owen asked. I am a seer, and we cannot change the course of destiny or fate. All we can do is guide and warn. You know this, as do all. She reached out and took hold of my hand. My skin tingled from the contact of such strong magic. The tides are changing quickly, Seneca Savage, and if you're not ready for it you will lose yourself. Lose everything you love. You must remember who you are. What you are. Her words annoyed me. Agent Williams's words from the night before about who I was came back to me like a slap in the face. I drew back. I know who I am. Do you? Yeah, I do. Thanks very much. I'm the freak that doesn't belong anywhere. You know, I think I agree with Owen today. Unless you can give me something solid to work with, I'm finished with this conversation. Seneca Savage, danger is on the horizon. Always is, I muttered as I stood. Thanks Minnie, see you around? She said my name once more, but I turned my back on her and left the cafe with Owen right behind me. I waited for him to tell me I should have listened to him, but thankfully he wasn't petty enough to do so. We reached the truck, but Minnie's words stuck with me, and the idea of sitting in the truck for the couple of hours it would take to get to the city made me anxious. So I kept walking. Summer was wearing on, and eventually fall would arrive. The temperatures would plummet, and snow would make it hard to get around. Not that I minded the cold. Being half-vampire meant I hardly felt it. I wandered through the streets of Madwich, not really seeing the faces of those I passed. My mind replayed Minnie's warning about my nightmares getting worse. I didn't want them to get worse. I wanted them to stop forever. I was tired of waking up drenched in a cold sweat. Tired of Owen having to snap me out of whatever dark thought dragged me down, again and again. I was done with it. The past needed to stay in the past. Whatever truth she claimed I needed to know, I'd just have to deal without it. I should have known it would be too much to ask for a simple solution to solve my problems and stop me from waking up, day after day, feeling more of myself breaking away. I considered turning around right then and asking Owen if we could disappear for the rest of the month. Hop in the truck and drive off to the west. Somewhere no one knew who I was. If I asked him, he would contact the feds and get them off my back too. I could leave it all behind. As much as living in Madwich drove me crazy some days though, this was my home. Had been for years. I loved my cottage and my gardens. Plus, Owen was here for the most part. If I left, I knew I'd wind up right back here again anyway. What was the point in trying to get away? I was about to tell Owen we would head to Boston first thing tomorrow morning when he tapped me on the shoulder. Come. Think you're needed, he said, pointing down the sidewalk. I found what he was talking about and handed over my coffee. Damn. You going to stay nearby? I will. Don't worry. Go see what happened this time. I continued down the sidewalk to where a teenage girl sat on a bench, swinging her legs. She was crying, cheeks wet and eyes all red and puffy. I sat down beside her and waited to see if she would talk first, this time. The minutes ticked by, and after a while, she fell into my side and my arm went around her. How bad was it this time? Lexi, the 13-year-old I somehow managed to bond with, sniffed hard. Bad enough. Did she hurt you? No, not this time. Just kept yelling at me. Then she locked me in my room, and I climbed out through the window. I ground my teeth wishing I had an actual helpful career so I could help her out. 
I spent too many years on the streets, using my skills to do whatever anyone needed to land a job in the government. I'd be arrested before I would get through the interview. Lexi's father was gone. Just up and left one day. Her mom. Well, her mom was a piece of work. She was human and an alcoholic to start with. Lexi's father was part fi. She had a bit of it in her blood, though it didn't really show through. I sensed it when I was near her, but she had no powers from it. Nothing to help defend her from a mother who blamed her for everything that went wrong in their lives. I wanted Lexi to just come live with me, but who was I kidding? I wasn't stable enough on my own, and my life was too damn dangerous to have a mostly human girl living with me. Not that I had a good childhood experience to go off of either. She asleep right now? I asked. Passed out on the couch from what I could tell. You want to come back to my place and hang out for the day? Just doing some gardening and whatnot. When was the last time you ate? She shrugged. My anger shot up another notch. I hated that woman. If I had any power whatsoever to do so, I would find a way to get rid of her. In all honesty, I could arrange an accident, but then Lexi would be thrown in the system. I had no way to adopt her. No agency would ever allow it. Right. Let's go back to my place. You'll be safe there. For a while at least. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Let's go, kid. Not that much of a kid, she muttered but got up to walk beside me. She wiped at her eyes again and tugged her hair back in a messy ponytail. She looked weary, and I worried she might not be strong enough to survive the life fate dealt her. Some days I wondered the same thing about myself. When Lexi saw Owen, her face lit up and she ran to him. He picked her up in a hug and spun her around. He had four younger sisters, one of them about Lexi's age, and was a damned good big brother to her even though she wasn't related. What's up kid, he asked, messing up her hair even more. Enough I guess. Seneca said I could stay with you guys today. Course you can. The more, the merrier. He opened the back door of the truck, and she climbed in. The second he closed the door, his smile fell away, and his eyes darkened. I really hate that woman. You and me both. There's nothing you can do, legally? All I can do is call CPS, but Lexi would hate me for it. I blew out a heavy breath, hating how my hands were tied. Won't do anything unless she asks me to. Owen glared one final time, then got in behind the wheel. Once I was in too, he made for the cottage and we headed right for the garden. Lexi enjoyed being there with the flowers and the plants, and the colorful orbs that would follow her around. It was nice to see her smile and laugh like she should be doing at this age, not wondering where she was going to get her next meal, or if her mother was going to lock her out of the house for days on end. Which had happened. I went inside to make her some food for lunch, and Owen followed. You know, he said hesitantly as I stood at the stove, my parents keep asking about you. Oh yeah. I had to clear my throat when the words got stuck. And what do you tell them? That one of these days when you're not busy, you'll meet them. And my sisters. I put the skillet on the burner and heated up the oil, then dug around in the fridge for some bacon, steak and whatever else I could think to make. I might not have a thirst for blood all the time, but my appetite had increased and changed over the years. Most Phi were vegetarians. Me, I'd grown to love red meat. A lot of red meat. Owen didn't seem to mind my diet and let me cook most of the time. Except now, when his hand covered mine over the skillet handle and he turned me around. What? You're stalling, he said. Can you blame me? You know what I'm like and your family, are you sure you want them to meet me? I don't want them thinking you're crazy. They won't, he assured me. They know who you are and what you do for a living. That's a great way to make a first impression. Hey mom, want to meet my girlfriend? She's a contract spy, thief and killer but nothing to worry about. She won't murder you all in your sleep. He rolled his eyes. What are you so worried about? You're a good person. 
even after everything you've been through. If that's what you want to believe. He took me by my shoulders and bent down until we were eye level. You are. You just refuse to see yourself like that because of all this damn tainted talk. I am tainted, I snapped, removing myself from his hold. I'm a Phi who was tortured by a vampire for years. My blood was used to make Phi dust. Then after I finally got free, I was bitten by another vampire who turned me. I can never be a part of the Phi world again. And what vampire would accept someone who can kill with her blood? Huh? Who? It was known well enough, Phi blood could be toxic to vampires, but I'd never heard of one being killed by drinking it. As I'd witnessed happen several times with mine. His eyes darkened, but he made no move to hug me. Am I not enough then? I don't deserve you, I argued. You know I don't. You're ridiculous, he growled as he stalked away. I'll never understand why you insist on bringing yourself down, instead of seeing the good in you. In us. Oh, I'm ridiculous? Really? Yes. I'm here for you whenever you need me, you know that, but I can't help you if you won't help yourself. Then he was gone, and I spun back around to start cooking something for Lexi and to get my mind off the hurt in his eyes as he'd walked away. What did he want from me? How was I supposed to wake up every day and be happy when I had so much darkness in my past threatening to drag me down? Even after I told myself today would be different. Today, I wouldn't see the scars or feel the lingering pain that I refused to tell Owen about. Or how most days I waited to be taken away back to Otherworld so that rotten piece of filth could finish what he started. I didn't take the dangerous missions for the money. Not even close. I took them because it was the only time I felt fear that would chase away what was left behind. Lexi's laughter pulled my gaze to the window. I watched her and Owen digging in and around the flowers, pulling weeds. Owen never said it aloud, but I knew what he wanted out of his life. Family. It was important to him. He wanted what his parents had. I didn't have the heart to tell him I could never give it to him because of too many reasons to count. It would break him, and I wasn't damned near strong enough to push him away. It was selfish of me, and just another reason why I wasn't the good person he thought I was. As the meat cooked in the skillet, I went to grab some eggs from the fridge, but when I turned, I cursed and froze. There in the mirror on the far wall was Macron. He watched me intensely, his lips moving but I couldn't hear anything he said. I shut my eyes, knowing it couldn't be possible, and when I opened my eyes, he was gone. I brushed it off as more remnants of my nightmares, but a warm breath blew across my neck and I jumped. Seneca. No, I snapped to the empty kitchen. You left me, and I am not doing this. You are not here. I counted to ten as I held my breath, but there was no reply. No more breaths. Nothing. Macron might have saved me from Rudarius, but in my mind, he wasn't much better. He took me in until I was sixteen, and then he just up and left me all alone with no explanation. I hadn't heard from him since. As far as I knew, he was dead. Perhaps it was for the best he was gone. At least one asshole from my past would be gone and buried. The second was in Otherworld, and unless I did something extremely stupid, I would never have to see him again unless it was to drive a stake through his heart. Chapter 3 Draven Blood filled my goblet, but I wasn't thirsty this evening. A very important guest was going to be arriving within the hour, and my stomach rebelled at the idea of having anything in it. The dust trade was good, and we made a hefty profit in the last few months, but depending on what type of mood the leader of our coven was in, it might not be enough to satisfy him. Why do you look so nervous? Lacey asked, running her hand along the back of my shoulders. You have no bad news to report. We even have a new batch of Phi coming in. We don't know if they're usable or not. Not yet, but we will. You and I both know the number of Phi with good blood is dwindling drastically, year after year. Unless we find a way to get our hands on some full-blooded Phi, the dust trade is likely to dry up in less than a decade. 
Many phi had integrated with the humans, and it diluted the bloodlines over time. The best phi blood came from royal stock, but was the hardest to procure in Otherworld, and rare to find here in the human realm. Very few ventured so far away from their homes. Royal blood was hard enough to handle as it was, seeing as it was toxic to our kind. I spun the goblet around and around, my throat starting to burn with hunger. I gave in. The blood soothed my burning throat, but as soon as it touched my stomach, I resisted the urge to vomit. Lacey wouldn't approve, and though she said she was here for me, everyone with eyes and ears knew she worked directly for Rudarius, the master of this coven. Technically speaking, I did too, since I was also part of the Black Hawk Coven, but I was far from happy about it. Not as if he was the most grateful or caring coven leader. And I had more reason than most to despise him. I hit it well, very well, especially around those like Lacey, who constantly wanted to please him. It had been a long time since I'd seen my true face in the mirror. Some days, I was sure I forgot who I was. I stood up, needing to move, and paced the length of the Grand Hall. The mansion resided in the middle of nowhere, on the outskirts of Boston. That was the way we liked it. Less likely to have unwanted visitors. And it cut down on the phone calls to the police about all the screaming that echoed upward from the lower levels. You should have another goblet of blood. Or perhaps you'd like something fresh. Lacey suggested. I can have someone brought in. No, I hissed through my teeth. I will be fine, thank you. If you say so. Why don't you go and see to the others? I can wait for Rudarius on my own, I suggested, facing the tinted windows that looked out over the ground surrounding the mansion. Go, Lacey. I am not a newborn who needs to be watched over. No, of course not. Hitting 210 soon, aren't you? Something like that. I glanced over my shoulder when she said nothing else, and found myself alone. About damn time. I clasped my hands behind my back and willed time to speed up so I could get this unscheduled meeting over with. Rudarius hardly left Otherworld. He checked in usually, once every couple of months at most, to ensure everything on this side was running smoothly and that I was still loyal to him and only him. When we received word he was coming tonight, I feared an issue had arisen that I wasn't aware of and was about to get lectured like a bloody child for it. He was nearly 2,000 years old, one of the oldest of our kind still living, and he seemed to believe that made him invincible and in charge of every single vampire, whether they were in his coven or not. Granted, the Black Hawk Coven had slowly taken over most of the smaller ones, though there were still several that could pose a threat if they wanted to. Not that they ever would. Their leaders were too cowardly to make a move against Rudarius. They knew far too well what happened to those who failed in their efforts to stand up to him. A scream resounded from the lower levels. I snarled, stalking around the room until it finally ceased. I would have to see to the soundproofing and improve it. I hadn't started living here until a few months ago. Before then, I resided in Otherworld where Rudarius could keep an eye on me. Then I killed four feds that were breathing down his neck, and now he trusted me. I saw their faces in my nightmares, the light leaving their eyes as I drained each one of them dry. Each one of them died, believing I was a monster, and there was no changing that fact. How long Rudarius's faith in me would last, I hadn't the slightest idea, but if I was going to be stuck here, I was going to be comfortable. Hearing the screams of our victims did not put me anywhere close to a good mood. Voices eventually sounded down the corridor and I made certain to be facing the door for when Rudarius would enter. Never turned my back to him if I could help it. Being so old made him incredibly strong and faster than any other vampire. He was exactly as the stories and rumors said. Dangerous. Damn dangerous. The doors opened, and said vampire himself strolled in, head held high, shoulders back, red cloak dragging the floor behind him. The man's sense of fashion was trapped in the Dark Ages. Not that fashion really changed much in Otherworld anyway. He had black breeches with knee-high black boots, a white blouse shirt beneath a black silk vest, 
red scarf at his neck, and wore several rings, rubies, and pearls, all of which he gained from his victims over the years. Five rings. I assumed he wanted them as trophies, since vampires did not have control over any form of magic except mind control. He spread his arms wide in greeting as he neared me, and I bowed low from the waist. Oh, come now, he said in a happy tone of voice I didn't expect from him. I have traveled here to surprise you with a feast and news from Otherworld. You can save the bows for another time. He grabbed me by my arms and looked into my eyes. Master Rudarius, it is good to see you in such high spirits. Yes, it is indeed. His eyes, always red from the amount of blood he consumed, glimmered back at me with hints of a plan he hadn't shared with me yet. His blonde hair was pulled back, giving his face a stern, taut look. He might be an evil bastard, but even I had to admit he was good-looking. Classically handsome is what some of the female vampires called him, always hanging around, waiting for him to take another bride. The man was up to four, last I heard. Please sit down, I said, motioning to the table behind us. He clapped his hands as he approached the table, and four servants hurried in, carrying jugs and goblets. They set them on the table, as Lacey and several more vampires joined us. Rudarius sat at the head sat, his cloak spreading out around him like a pool of blood. The smile he wore would have made any other vampire in his coven excited. Me, I wondered what he was up to and who he would make me kill to get what he wanted. The servants poured the blood, hands shaking, making the chains around their wrists and ankles rattle. When one took too long, I hissed at him and waved him off, impatient to get this meeting started. I'll do it myself. He set the jug down, bowing his head low, and scurried to the back of the room to wait with the others. Where minutes ago I wasn't thirsty at all, now my throat burned like a newly turned vampire's, and I wanted to down the entire jug right there. Now. Then Rudarius said loudly, it has come to my attention that in recent months, our Phi dust production has gone down. May I ask why? There are less and less Phi with the correct blood makeup, I explained. Is that so? Here in this realm, yes. I am sorry, Master, but that is the way of it. And what of the Phi in Otherworld? I blinked a couple of times, fighting the urge to laugh in his face. Master! It was rare we took any Phi from the kingdoms in Otherworld. To do so was a suicide mission none of our kind were willing to undertake. They were too heavily protected and had magic on their side. Not to mention sunlight. You want us to start taking Phi from the kingdoms? He grinned, so his fangs hung over his lower lip. His fingers swirled the blood in his goblet, then he removed it and licked it clean. I must confess, all this time, the Phi dust trade here in the human realm has all been a ruse for a much greater plot. For far too long, our kind has been forced to remain in the darkness. Forced to be labeled as the underbelly of all societies. Here and in other world. He sipped from his goblet, swirling the blood around in his mouth, then swallowed. What if I told you I had a way to change our current position for the better? Permanently. I wasn't the only one who looked at him confused. And how would we do this? Phi dust. This time I shook my head slowly. You want to use a drug against them? It's never been about the addicts, he hissed. The money was a bonus, of course, to help convince others to join our cause. No, Phi dust is much more volatile in the right form. It's why the Phi kingdoms are so against the dust trade. I glanced around the table but no one else seemed to understand what he was talking about. Why are Phi so much better than us? He asked as he pushed back from the table and stood. Come now. It's not too hard of a question. Their magic, Lacey spoke up and beamed when Rudarius smiled at her. Their magic. Magic we vampires have long coveted but could never have. So many other races have magic running through their veins, but we only have whatever blood we've drunk in ours. And though we can drink Phi blood, those with true power would kill us the moment their blood entered our bodies. Nice way of preventing us from absorbing their magic all these years. However, he said, holding up the hand with the rings on it. Time's chain. From inside his vest pocket, he removed a small velvet pouch and opened the drawstring. 
Inside was five dust. A puff of light fluttered out telling us that much. He reached in and picked up a pinch. I waited for him to ingest it, thinking our dear old leader had finally lost his mind and his brain was addled with the dust, but then he sprinkled it over the rings on his fingers. The rings sparked and sputtered as if woken from decades of sleep. The vampires closest to Rudarius shoved their chairs back, worried looks on their faces. I leaned closer, watching the pearls and rubies pulse with life. How is this possible? I asked. Years of searching for the correct phi carrying the correct blood, he said quietly, glancing down at the rings on his fingers. Years spent believing their power was forever beyond our reach. No longer. He curled his hand into a fist and spun around, aiming it at one of the servants. The man's hand shot to his throat as he was lifted off the floor by Rudarius. See what power I have now. The man choked and gasped, pleading for his life. Rudarius twisted his fist and the man's neck snapped. He dropped him to the floor without a care. And that, my children, is only the beginning. Rudarius turned again and aimed his fist at the wall. When he pulled his arm back with a jerk, a bolt of pure white phi light shot out of the rings and struck the stone. It exploded, creating a hole in the wall leading straight to the outside. Those closest scattered to avoid being struck by debris, but I was on my feet hurrying over to examine the damage done. Quite impressive, is it not? All this time, the weapon I needed was right under my nose. All this time. Slowly I glanced back to see those red eyes watching me closely. Careful to keep my face set, I bowed to Rudarius. It is magnificent. But if I may ask, what are your plans now? He curled his fist against his chest and stalked toward me. My plans are to do what I have waited centuries to do. He said nothing else until he stood right in front of me, eyes narrowed with hatred. Take back the lands that were ours from the five scum who stole them away in the first place. You want to declare war, I said slowly, on the five kingdoms. Not just the five, Draven. All of Otherworld will fall to our might. Age-old anger sprouted in my chest, but I swallowed down the hiss that started to form and bowed my head instead. And they will all fall to you, I have no doubt. None at all. Master. He raised my head using his sharp nails beneath my chin, his eyes searching my face. I have new orders for you and those here, he told me. As I said, only certain blood works. You must find any phi left here in the human realm who bear rings such as these. He held up his hand, the magic already fading from the stones. As you can tell, the magic does not last long. How much do you have? I asked, hoping I didn't sound too eager. Not enough to win a war, but plenty to get one started. He patted the pocket of his vest where the pouch was. Whatever else there was would be back at his home in Otherworld under heavy guard. Rudarius was many things, but sadly, a fool was not one. His eyes narrowed. We need the five dust and the rings. You understand me. And you must keep them together. It's the only way this magic works. The longer the five live, the more dust we can get from their blood. No wonder it took so long for him to figure out how to harness their magic. In years prior, all Rudarius cared about was slaughtering Fi in droves and getting what dust he could from them. He was too impatient to understand how their magic worked. Now that he knew, he was kind enough to share it with the rest of us. My lips twitched in a smile, and I mentally cursed when I realized my mistake. Rudarius's eyes zeroed in on my smile, and he lifted his hand. Leave us. The vampires quickly exited the room, the servants scurrying out behind them with their chains clinking. The doors slammed shut behind them, and Rudarius backed away from me, his hands clasped behind his back as he walked the length of the hall. Have I done something to upset you, master? I asked, holding myself perfectly still. Have you? He asked in turn. Not to my knowledge, no. Fascinating, isn't it? How two people can be in a room and see two completely different situations, when it's all the very same one. He ran his fingers along the table, walking, until he reached his chair again. I'm afraid I don't follow, Master. I believe you do, he hissed quietly. 
Do I need to question your loyalty, Draven? Of course not. I squared my shoulders and stood tall as I held his red gaze. I am loyal to you and this coven. No other. And yet I sense a change in you. And just when I believed you had finally come around. It would be a shame to have to return you to the dungeons back in Otherworld. If you are wavering, I will have no choice but to do so. My skin crawled at the mere mention of going back to that decrepit and dark place. I swear it. I am behind you, truly. I have no reason not to be. Don't you, though? Master, I... Don't lie to me. He bellowed so loudly it shook the windows. I gave you a chance after your coven fell, when I removed your father's head. A chance to become someone so much greater than you ever could have been, trapped in that weak, pathetic coven of yours. I let you live. I let you become a part of me. And I am forever grateful, I insisted. Are you? Why do I feel as though you are simply biding your time when you can get your revenge? Hum. I don't know, Master, but I swear I have no intentions other than to fulfill your orders. And if I ordered you to take your own life? This test of loyalty was not new to me. He did it to many vampires, but me most of all. Without any hesitation, I withdrew the dagger at my hip and pressed the tip against my chest, right where my heart resided. Then simply say the word, and I will do so, Master. My life is in your hands. And your desires. My desires are yours. To see the five kingdoms fall. To have all other world bow down before our great coven, with you as our master. I emphasized the last words. My fingers itched to lower the dagger, but I forced myself to hold it in place. He returned to me, and when he reached for the dagger, I expected my life to end right then. His hand wrapped around the hilt, and the tip pressed through the fabric of my shirt pricking my skin. Warm blood oozed around the blade, and I made it a point not to move. Not even blink. He twisted the dagger slightly, then lowered it, placed it back in my hand, and smiled. You truly have changed then. That is good to know. I will need you when this war begins, Draven. A vampire with unwavering loyalty. Unlike some of your kin. Master. There are those within this coven that would like to see me without a head. I want you to weed them out and kill them. I cannot go into a war with enemies on both sides, he told me. Find them. Destroy them. Then you and I will march on Otherworld with an army at our backs. We will be victorious. Yes, we will, Master Rudarius, I said, bowing again. Good. Very good. He strode for the door but paused when he reached it. And Draven, if you do decide to betray me, know that I will make you suffer far worse than I did your father. Can you handle centuries of pain and torture? That is what will await you. The smile he gave me was far from friendly, and then he exited the hall. I hissed quietly under my breath, studying the hole in the wall. For many years I'd been waiting for my chance to get my revenge against him, but I wasn't strong enough. Now with this new discovery, I just might have my chance. I owed him for killing my father and half of my coven when he attacked us. I owed him for all the blood spilled in the name of his glory. Owed him for the years I spent in agony trapped in that dungeon, begging for every new day to bring my end and be finished with it. I was alone in my fight against him. Though I had turned two men recently, only one knew of my overall scheme. The other, well, he wasn't exactly the sharpest mind around. One day he'd have his use. As I left the hall, striding through the mansion toward my chambers, I grinned darkly. Rudarius did give me permission to start weeding out troublesome souls from the coven. But who would argue with me if I called another vampire out for disloyalty? It was time to start slimming the competition, and I was going to take full advantage of it. Chapter 4 Draven I spun the dagger around in my hand as I paced before the line of vampires standing in the hall. The table had been shoved to the side for this gathering. Lacey was absent, 
having accompanied Rudarius back to Otherworld to aid him with some matter or other. I didn't care if she wasn't here to contradict what I was about to do. I have brought you all here because there is a question of loyalty within the coven of late, I announced. The six vampires standing in front of me were probably the most loyal to Rudarius beneath this roof. Each one glanced to the other suspiciously at my words. I have found evidence against some of you that leads me to believe you wish to do our master harm. The evidence points to all of you, though I sense it is only three of you who are truly at fault. I paused long enough to gauge their reactions. All six glanced sideways, wondering who I meant. If you turn those three over to me, the other three may live. None of us would ever turn on our master, said Gregory, the vampire on the end. It's true, Helena said next. We will forever be loyal to him. How dare you stand there and accuse us of such crimes? I am merely going off the proof I've found. And what proof is that? Helena challenged. I beckoned one of the chain servants forward, and he stood at my side, shaking, head lowered. Tell them what you told me, I ordered. When he failed to speak, I flipped the dagger over and aimed the point at his throat. Tell them, or I will see how much pain you can endure before you scream. I heard them plotting, he mumbled, repeating the lie I told him to tell. The woman and two men. Heard them say they were going to take Rudarius's head. That's absurd. Helena screamed, but my guards were already moving up behind her. What's the meaning of this treachery? Gregory snarled. You can't believe the servant over us. This is madness. He swore on his life, I said lightly, looking aghast at Helena and Gregory. You are in on it with her, are you not? That's why you defend her so loudly. I snapped my fingers, and two more guards moved in to take hold of Gregory. I am amazed at the thought that you two are behind such a horrendous act of betrayal. Who else? I asked the servant, hiding my evil smile as Helena and Gregory continued to scream and rant. Who else? The servant lifted his hand and pointed to Philip. He immediately snarled and lunged for the servant, but I was faster. I dug my nails into his throat and threw him backward into the arms of two more waiting guards. He's a liar. A filthy liar. I'll rip your throat out, Philip bellowed. Take them away and execute them, I told the guards. The last three vampires standing, ones barely thirty vampire years old, were wide-eyed as their elders were dragged from the hall. If I was ever to start gaining loyalty within this coven, I would have to start with those who hadn't been under Rudarius's care for centuries. Now then, I trust you three were not a part of this. Or should I have the guards return for you as well? No, Taylor said and dropped his head low. The two beside him did the same. Good. If I catch wind of your being involved, you will come to regret it. Taylor? I want you to gather a team and begin hunting down any fi in the south. We haven't ventured there in a long while. Find me any fi who bear rings of power. Find them and capture them. Try your best not to kill them or be killed. Understand? Taylor nodded. Right away, Draven. Now away with you three. I waved them off, and when it was just me and the servant, I paced a few steps away from him, listening for the vampire's retreating steps. Now then, your reward for a job well done, I said, turning to face the man. Yes, sir, my freedom, he whispered in disbelief, holding out his chained hands. Freedom. That is what we agreed on. If you're certain. I am, he said, as if that was even a question. He held out his hands again. I sighed, and in a blur of speed, I grabbed hold of the man and bit down on his neck. His scream died in his throat as I drained him of his life, his warm blood filling my mouth as his body weakened. His eyes rolled back in his head, and with one final pull, I tore my fangs free and let his body crumple to the floor. Strength flowed through my veins, and I licked the last few drops from my fangs. Freedom it is, I whispered to the dead body. Guilt warred with the beast inside me, and I turned away from those accusing eyes, looking wide-eyed up at the ceiling. Trust me, death is far better than this life. I wiped the blood from my lips, 
hardening my resolve for killing the man. It had to be done. To tie up loose ends. The door opened, and one of the guards loyal to me since I was the one who turned him stepped inside. Christian, remove this trash if you would, I said as I walked for the door. Yes, Draven. Did our prisoners make it to their final deaths? They did, screaming all the way and cursing you until their heads and hearts were removed and burned. He glanced at me, worried. They're just words, Christian. They hold no power. You don't think? He asked quietly. I've heard of people cursing others, and it doesn't end well. As I mentioned, not the sharpest mind around. Just stories. See to this body. I'll be in my chambers. I left him to clean up my mess. So much blood gave me incredible energy, and I did not want to spend the entire day cooped up in this house, but there was no leaving until the sun had set. The evening rays wouldn't kill me, but they would burn like a son of a bitch. I'd experienced burn pain. Enough for several lifetimes, courtesy of Rudarius and his damn torture chambers. He'd tie a vampire to a stake in the middle of a room and crank open the ceiling to let a single ray of sunlight in, striking the victim right on the chest. I rubbed the spot. I remembered screaming until I was hoarse and begging for death. I remembered it all too well. Death never came. Rudarius should have just killed me and been done with it. Once in my chambers with the door closed and locked, I stood before the full-length mirror and removed my black shirt. The brand Rudarius gave to all those in his coven was prominent in the center of my chest, an image of the Black Hawk. One day, I'd replace it with the sigil of my house, of my coven, the one I was rightfully the master of. The Bleeding Crown had been the only coven able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against Rudarius, but my father had been weak, and we fell. Our people were scattered. At least, those who survived the initial assault. I wanted to track them down, but it had taken so long for Rudarius to be convinced I was with him now, I didn't hold on to hope of finding any of my old coven members. At least not alive. I whiled away the afternoon hours, mulling over a new plan for securing a bit of this fi dust and a set of rings for myself. Rudarius would keep all of it in Otherworld. Getting to it without being caught posed a challenge I couldn't face alone. I would need at least three, maybe more to get in and out with the dust and rings. And that assumed he had more than what he was wearing. A knock at my door toward evening had me picking up my shirt to cover my chest. Once my shirt was back on, I unlocked the door to find Shane standing in the corridor, wringing his hands. You have news from Madwitch, I presume? What took you so damn long to get back? Several reasons. You're not going to like all my news. We found some more fi. And for the rest? I snapped when he didn't just answer me. I saw the defeat in his eyes and growled annoyed. You had one simple task to complete. And we were working on it, but she had backup. What do you mean she had backup? Who? I demanded. He bared his fangs as he muttered, a demon. Her demon? That bodyguard from Velesk. Bodyguard. I thought over his words, then sighed. The demon ambassador's bodyguard. Yeah, him. A big bloke. I'm loyal to you, Draven, you know that. But I'm not going to get my neck wrung by some damn demon three times my size. Then I'm assuming you didn't deliver my message. Oh, we did, but she's a tough one. I doubt words are going to be enough to scare her. Which was why I sent four of you to take care of the matter. You should have killed her and been done with it. Shane crossed his arms, watching as I picked up my daggers and sheathed one at each hip, then slung on my leather jacket. She's not some simple fairy running around in a damn tutu, you know. She's a trained killer. Where are you off to? taking care of what you couldn't. If I was to fully focus on my plan for bringing Rudarius down, I couldn't have Seneca Savage, the bloody contract killer, breathing down my neck, spying on me constantly. She was in my way, and that meant she was a problem. I'd end her, and get on with finding a way to get the dust and rings I needed. You're strong, but she's a damned hellion, he warned me. She won't be so easy to kill. I know well enough who she is. 
Do you? She's a strong fighter who's been through as much shit as you have. If not more, Shane said as I stormed for the door. She's got a dangerous reputation for a reason. She works for the feds. How dangerous can she be? She works for them when she wants to, he corrected, following me into the corridor. She'll do nearly anything for pay. Nearly anything. Where does she draw the line exactly? Humans. What do you mean? I asked as we walked. She won't kill humans. I smiled darkly. Perhaps it was time she started. I would make her life a living hell if I couldn't kill her, force her to break her rule. She was part vampire, after all. The hunger might not fully drive her, but if she wanted to fight against me and the nightmares I was about to bring down on her, she would have to start. She was an outcast. No one from the Phi or vampire communities would ever accept her. The only one who stood up for her was the demon. One small obstacle that stood in my way. I'll be back by sunup, I told Shane. With her heart in my hands. You won't be able to kill her, Shane said. I snarled at him. Merely being honest. She's stronger than you think. And I'm over 200 years old. I can handle one half-breed freak. If you say so he replied, and stayed at the door as I stepped out of the mansion. I would start in Madwitch and track her down. Seneca thought she could spy on me and get away with it. I knew from the first moment I was being watched. Whatever she was hoping to find, I would have to disappoint her. The time had finally come for me to enact a new plan for my revenge against Rudarius. No one was going to stand in my way. If I had to kill her, then so be it. Madwitch was quiet when I arrived, running directly from the mansion. Normally, a few hours away. It only took me around one hour to get here, and the run had been good to clear my head and get my mind focused on the task at hand. I sniffed the air, searching for any hint of vampire and fi blood. I walked through the shadows, staying out of sight as I searched for my target. I half expected not to find her here. Figuring she would be back to tracking me down, then the breeze shifted and a strange scent struck my nose. Fi and vampire. There you are, I whispered to the night, turning until I faced the diner on the corner. A figure had just emerged with long red hair. Seneca. She wasn't alone. I hissed at the stench of human by her side. She was young, barely a teenager. That was too bad. After I dispatched of Seneca, she'd make a nice evening snack. With the dead servant's blood pumping through my veins, I crept along, following Seneca and the girl as they meandered down the sidewalk, without a care in the world. I would do what Shane should have done, and be home before midnight. Quietly, I removed a dagger from my hip, holding it, so the blade was against my forearm, and picked up my pace. I was only a couple of yards behind now. Seneca laughed with the girl, a sound that came across as forced. Did she not like the girl? Why was she with her, if she didn't want to be? There was a chance she was important in some regard or another. Not that I planned to waste time asking questions. Lexi, you sure you're going to be all right at home tonight? Seneca asked. Yeah, she'll probably be passed out by now. Thanks for the last couple of days. Hope I didn't take you away from anything. Nothing that couldn't wait. Seneca suddenly stiffened and grabbed Lexi's shoulder. She tilted her head, just as I made ready to attack. Get down. She shoved the girl to the side and spun around, meeting my dagger with one of her own. She drew it faster than I could see, and our blades clashed as I unsheathed my second one. Run, Lexi. I snarled at the girl as she took off, ready to go after her, but the movement distracted me long enough to take a knife hilt to the face. I snapped my jaws and went in low to trip Seneca. I was used to fighting Fi and vampires, but didn't expect her to be as fast as I was. Or to be crazy enough to fight barefoot. Vampires grew quicker with age, and here she was practically a newborn, keeping pace with my moves. Her red hair flew wildly around her face as she suddenly had a short sword in her left hand keeping the dagger in her right. She spun around, 
her onyx blade whirling in a mad arc, aiming for my heart. I barely managed to block the hit and shoved her back hard enough to stumble, but she stayed on her feet. Heard you've been spying on me, I hissed as we circled. Just doing my job, she replied. Taking down murderers is what I do best. She said it with bravado, but there was a sliver of fear in her eyes. The way she attacked me full said the fear wasn't for me. So then what was she afraid of? A few people on the streets yelled in alarm, and she screamed at them to keep moving. I took advantage of the moment and slashed downward with my blades. One met her short sword, but the other cut down her shoulder. She snarled, and a bright flash of red light appeared out of the corner of my eye. Our fighting had been so fast, I hadn't noticed the rings on her right hand. Fire rings. The sweet scent of her blood filled the air, but the injury did nothing to slow her down. If anything, it lit a fire in her, and her second dagger disappeared to be replaced by another short sword. Her footwork was beyond incredible. If I hadn't come here to kill her, I'd be impressed. As it was, I realized I couldn't kill her anyway. Not anymore. She had five rings, which meant she was my ticket to getting five dust and stopping root areas. Whatever bloodline she came from didn't matter. If she could power those rings, then so could I with her blood. She headbutted me, and I grunted, holding a hand to my face as she landed a kick to my gut. You won't win this fight, she warned, swinging her short sword casually in her hand, along with her dagger in the other hand. You run off now, and I won't hold it against you. Not happening, love, I hissed. I wasn't hired to kill you. Pity, looks like you're missing out on a payday. I wiped the blood dripping from my lip with my sleeve and smiled. Then again, I don't plan on dying tonight. Back off, Draven. Or what? You aren't strong enough to kill me. My eyes flickered to her rings, unable to look away as they pulsed, as if in time with her rapid heartbeat. Is that a challenge? The rings on her hand glimmered a range of red, blue, and green. She craned her neck to the side, then glanced from me to her rings. Something interests you. Fine bit of jewelry you have there. Yeah, thanks, she said slowly, sounding confused. She started to lower her blades, lulled in by our conversation, and that's when I lunged forward. All I had to do was knock her out and get her away from Madwitch, but unlike others I'd fought in the past, she did not wear out quickly. More people screamed in panic as our fight moved down the sidewalk, but I didn't care. Not right then, when I was having trouble watching how fast her two blades were moving toward my face. I had been around a hell of a lot longer, though, and no tainted Phi was going to get the better of me. I caught her right wrist and twisted. She gasped and the blade clattered to the ground. I smashed my head into her nose. She cursed as I threw her backward. She rolled barely managing to avoid stabbing herself with her sword. I blurred to her and kicked it from her hand, then kicked her in the side again. I brought my boot back to smash into her face and end the fight, but she grabbed my ankle and yanked. I crashed to the ground with a snarl. She scrambled to get away, except I was faster. I grabbed her by her shirt front, hoisted her up and punched her, over and over. Somewhere in the middle of the hits, she started to cackle like she lost her mind. I paused, thrown off guard. It was all the time she needed to draw her arm back, and with a furious yell, she rammed her fist toward my heart. I staggered away, confused when a sharp point pierced my flesh, a hair away from staking me. I let her go and carefully backed off. She gained her footing, spitting blood from her mouth as she scooped up her short sword. It didn't have to end this way, she said as she stalked toward me. I continued to walk backward. It's not going to end at all, not tonight. I reached up, but the wooden stake with a silver core was embedded too close to my heart for me to safely remove it. I'll be seeing you again, Seneca. You can count on that. And next time, it won't be a draw. She raised her blade as if to finish me off, but I blurred away, not giving her a chance. Her angry scream followed me for a mile or so, until I was too far away to hear it. An hour later, I staggered up the front steps of the mansion then collapsed, keeping a tight grip on the stake's hilt. Shit, Shane snapped. 
We need help out here. I'm fine, just get me inside, I argued through gritted teeth. The pain had caught up with me along the way, and I grimaced with every small movement I made. Shane put his arm under my shoulders, and together we managed to get into the mansion and to the hall. He sat me down in a chair, then examined the stake stuck in my chest. You want me to yank it out? No, I want it to stay in there for the next few hours as it inches closer to my heart. I bared my fangs, hissing viciously as his brows shot up to his hairline. Man, someone's touchy, he mumbled. I warned you before you left this would happen. You should have listened to me. I couldn't kill her. Yeah, got that from the stake sticking out of your chest. He grabbed hold of it. Count of three. Ready? I nodded, bracing for the pain. One. I yelled hoarsely as he yanked it out a split second later and tossed the foul weapon on the table. I hate you. I know, he replied. You should heal now. I pressed my hand to the bleeding wound, feeling it closing already. She has five rings, I told him. Three of them right there on her hand. I can't kill her. Rudarius will want her if she has rings. I eyed him closely. He tilted his head just enough for the message to get across. Out of all my years spent with Rudarius in his coven, there was a single vampire I trusted with almost all my planning. I had been the one to turn him, just as I had Christian, and he swore loyalty to me and only me. But one vampire on my side would never be enough to take on Rudarius. We would need an army of our own, or enough fi dust and rings to be able to take him down for good. Yes, he will, I finally agreed. We need to keep eyes on her at all times. I'll see it done. Good. It would be a few days, I assumed, before Taylor and his team came back with news on other Fi with rings in the area. I cared little for who else they found. Seneca made it personal tonight when she nearly staked me through the heart, something no one else had ever gotten close to doing. I would let Rudarius have the other Fi. I would take the rings from Seneca and drain her blood until I had enough dust to bring down Rudarius and his reign of terror. If he was able to start his war and take over the five kingdoms, he would become unstoppable. Time was short, very short, to stop him. Seneca would be collateral damage once I was finished with her. Chapter 5 Seneca What the devil happened to you? Save it all right? I muttered to Owen as I stepped into the cottage. My face throbbed along with my ribs and the wound on my shoulder. All I wanted to do was sit down. Lexi, is she here? Right here. She gasped as she poked her head around Owen. Seneca, your face. Thanks, kid. I sighed and sat down on the couch, holding my face. You all right? I'm fine. Who was that guy? I mulled over whether to tell Owen the truth, but there was no point in hiding it from him. Begging him with my eyes not to make a big deal out of it, I said, Draven. Owen growled but didn't say anything. I assumed because of Lexi. Can you make sure she gets home tonight? I asked him. I'm going to go lick my wounds. You need to call the feds and report this. Contract killer, remember? They won't care, but if it makes you feel better, I'll do it later. I held out my hand. He pulled me to my feet, scowling when I winced and limped away. Stay in your house tonight, I told Lexi. You call me if your mom gives you any more shit this week. Her face said she wouldn't, but she nodded and gave me a hug. I winced through the pain, and then she hurried for the door. Owen promised he'd be right back, and kissed my forehead then left with her. I sagged in relief to have them both gone, then tugged off my torn and bloody shirt, leaving it on the floor since it was ruined, then walked for the bathroom to take a shower. My face was a grisly mess of blood, and I would have a few good bruises in the morning. My sides were red from where Draven nailed me, and I had a good slash wound at my shoulder. He hadn't fought with solid silver or iron blades, at least, so the wound would heal fast enough. The hot water stung, so I washed quickly, towel dried and went to find comfy clothes to put on for the rest of the night. I was just sitting back down on the couch when Owen came back. 
You want some ice? For which pain? I asked, eyes closed. He grunted in reply. What? I'm alive, aren't I? Debatable. His heavy steps moved away, and I heard the freezer open close, then he was moving back to me. A cold pack pressed to my face, and I took it from him. Still want to keep spying on Draven now that he's tried to kill you? With any luck, he won't be a problem anymore. Meaning? Meaning I staked him very near, if not directly in his heart. He could be dead in a ditch somewhere. My luck was never that great, but it was a nice thought all the same, instead of Draven coming back to finish the fight he started. I lowered the ice pack and opened my eyes. The right one was beginning to swell, so it was hard to see. I'm not sure what he was after though. Your life. Owen pointed to the ice pack. Keep that on your face. What you don't think I'm pretty all bruised up? I teased but his scowl only deepened. I replaced the ice pack. There. Happy? No. I knew I should have gone with you both tonight. You had business to take care of. You can't always be here, I know that. Not the point. He could have killed you. You doubt my fighting skills that much? Did you forget who trained me? I rarely talked about Macron, and Owen's brow shot up to his hairline. What? That's the second time in three days you've mentioned him. And? And it's curious, that's all. Your nightmares. Are they about that day? Which one? I grumbled, shutting my eyes again. The day Macron rescued me from Rudarius was etched in my mind as one of the bloodiest in my memory. He slaughtered ten vampires to get me out of there, and took on the head of the coven himself. The fight had been brutal. Even to this day, I had no real idea of how we got out of there alive. For several days after, I expected Macron to die from his wounds, but eventually he recovered. The second memory, I would never forget, was watching him walk out the front door of our cabin in the mountains. He said nothing to me, didn't even look at me. Just up and walked away. And never came back. I hadn't told Owen I'd been seeing my old savior and mentor, not wanting to complicate an already delicate situation with Draven being so close to Rudarius. Owen was already more protective than usual, and it grated on my nerves. What aren't you telling me? And don't say nothing. I lowered the ice pack again, the swelling lessening as my vampire side worked at healing my face. I've been seeing Macron. In your dreams? Not exactly. I thought I saw him at the club the other night. Then in the mirror, when I was making breakfast for Lexi. Heard him that time too. Like he was standing right behind me. What did he say? Just my name, but his lips were moving like he was trying to tell me something. I rubbed a hand down my face then stopped when it hurt. I'm sure it's nothing, just memories getting stirred up as you said. I waited for him to agree with me, but he sat there in silence, not meeting my gaze. Something you're not telling me. I asked, shifting on the couch so I faced him. Owen. No of course not. It's just you don't know what happened to him. If he's alive or dead. Guess there's always a chance he's reaching out to you. Alive or dead? That's the question. He's a powerful mage. I wouldn't put it past him to reach out from beyond the grave, just to tick me off some more. I hunkered down lower in the couch, putting my feet up on the coffee table. Never mind. As I said, I'm sure it's nothing. And even if it is something, I don't need to worry about it right now. Too much other shit going on. Like Draven. I know that tone. Don't start with me. I don't have a tone, he argued. You do. It's the, I'm going to stick around and watch over you day and night, because I'm worried my girlfriend is going to get herself killed tone. I got up and limped into the kitchen, ignoring his worried growls that were following me. My stomach rumbled, and I dug around in the fridge for the leftover steak. Think I have every right to watch over you. You do, but it's annoying. Can we not have this argument again? I pleaded, as I popped the container in the microwave. It's late, I'm tired in pain, 
and have to figure out what I'm going to do about the killer who wants me dead. How is that supposed to make me feel better? Never said it was going to, I pointed out. Just being honest. You need to call the feds and tell them to hire someone else. They won't care. I'm nothing to them, remember? You are to me. He pulled his cell from his pocket and moved his thumb over the screen, a determined look in his eyes that I did not like. What are you doing? I demanded when he held the phone to his ear. Calling in a favor. Don't you dare. I tried to snatch the phone from him, but he was too tall and he simply turned away from me. I jumped up, wincing at the pain it caused in my ribs, but I was not going to be that girl whose boyfriend made a call on her behalf to take care of her business. I pinched the back of his arm, and he whirled around with a glare. Hang up right now. No, he replied. Tim? It's Owen. I need you to. What are you doing? I had climbed onto his back and yanked the cell away. He'll call you back in a month, I told Tim, then hung up and got off Owen's back. You can have this back when you leave, or if you swear not to do that again. I am trying to help you. And I've told you time and again, I don't need it. When are you going to listen to me? Maybe when you're not being attacked by a killer. I sit his phone down on the counter, glaring at him. It's my job. I'm always going to be attacked by killers and thieves, and whatever other shitty beings I go after. It's what I do. I can't sit here and watch you do this to yourself. Do what? Throw yourself in the line of fire like your life means nothing. He slashed his hand angrily through the air as he said it. Watch you tear yourself apart because you can't let go of your past and move on. I know why you take the dangerous cases and don't feed me that bullshit line of the pay being better. You don't need it. He ran a hand over his face as he paced away from me, then back. It's like you need the danger in your life. The edge. Is that what this is all about now for you? Laughing at death in the face? Seeing how far you can push yourself before you crack? My lips parted at hearing those words coming out of his mouth. How long had he been onto me? You make it sound like I want to die, I whispered. Do you? Because from where I stand, sometimes that's what it feels like. No, it's just... I blew out a breath and crossed my arms. It's just what, Sen? I don't know, all right? I'm scared, I admitted, surprising us both. He flinched backward. Of what? Draven? What? No, not him. I tugged down my sweatshirt, just needing to do something with my hands. This was exactly the conversation I longed to avoid, and now I was thrown right in the center of it. Of this. You and me and this life. Of what you want from me and with me. And you're right. I can't let go of the past, and I don't think I'll ever be able to. But that's not good enough for you. Never is. When have I ever told you that? You don't have to. It's how it is. Seneca, he breathed as he pulled me into his arms resting his chin on my head. You deserve to be happy, to have a good life. I know, I mumbled against his chest. Do you really? I'm doing everything I can to be here for you, and support you, keep you safe, but I don't know what else to do to make you see I want to be with you. I hugged him tighter, unable to tell the truth that needed to be said. Owen saw me as the woman I could be if I simply let go and moved on with my life. If I let him be protective and embraced his help all the time. If I followed his suggestions and opened a cafe or a flower shop. I saw that version of me, saw her happy and smiling. Saw a brilliant light in her eyes. She was a faraway dream I would never reach. Part of me never wanted to. My dark past made me who I was. Strong, fierce, independent. I was a fighter, and the notion of setting that piece of me aside forever was what really scared me. Owen could say all he wanted he would be here with me, but I couldn't promise that I would be there for him. I tried, I really did, but there were times when I missed being on my own. I had grown accustomed to coming back to an empty home, nursing my wounds and waiting for the next phone call to come around. There had been no attachments to anyone. 
Life was dangerous, but it was simple. The whirlwind of emotions grew tangled inside of me, and I longed to be alone to sort them out. You don't have to do anything else, I said as I lifted my gaze to meet his. I just need more time, that's all. I think what you need is time away from this life, he replied. Let me take you to meet my family, leave Madwitch for a week. It'll give you a chance to heal and clear your head. That was the last thing I wanted. Especially when Draven was probably out there plotting how to kill me. Or maybe he didn't want to kill me anymore. The way he looked at my rings said he wanted them for a reason. He was up to something. Which meant Rudarius was too. I should be working on tracking him down first thing tomorrow. As well as contacting Agent Williams to let him know the terms of our agreement would have to change. Owen tucked my hair behind my ears and kissed my forehead. What do you say? If I said no, it would hurt him, and that was the last thing I wanted to do. You sure your family won't mind us stopping by at the last minute? No. I'm pretty sure they'd be thrilled to have you around. Finally get to meet you. Wonderful. I'd get to meet his perfect, ecstatic family. There would be questions, so many questions, and I'd have to find a way to screw a smile on my face for the entire time we were there. Sounds perfect, I lied. He grinned. It'll be good for you, you'll see. Might even stop your nightmares. That I doubted. I paused at the way he said the first part though, wondering if he was up to something else, instead of simply wanting me to take time off. He reached around me for his cell, telling me he was going to call his mother and give her a heads up, nothing more. I let him do it, taking my steak out of the microwave and eating it standing in the kitchen. When I finished, he was still on the phone in the living room. I wandered out back into my garden to give him some privacy. The colorful orbs floated toward me, shimmering in the darkness. I ran my fingers along the rose petals, then picked one to twirl between my fingers. The orbs glittered against the gemstones on my fingers, and I closed my eyes running through the fight with Draven again. His whole demeanor shifted after he saw my rings. There'd been a glint in his eyes, one that reminded me of myself. The thought didn't sit well with me, but it was true. I knew very little about Draven, except for what the feds handed me and what I saw. None of it gave me a good clear image of who he was, aside from being involved in the dust trade. The feds' info had only been enough to know what coven he belonged to, and where I'd be most likely to find him hanging around. The longer I pictured the vampire's face, the more details I remembered. His bright blue eyes after they shifted from red at the end of our fight. The scar that ran along the right side of his jaw, a testament to who he was before he was turned. And he was a freaking good fighter. Quick. Those daggers had been deadly. I'd barely been able to keep up. I opened my eyes to find I was still alone. I pulled my cell from my sweatshirt pocket and dialed the number for Agent Williams. Williams here, he answered on the second ring. There's been a development, I said. I hope you're calling to tell me you have all the intel we need to bring him in. Not exactly but before you bite my face off, there's been a slight change. I told him about the fight and Draven's sudden interest in my rings. Is there anything about him or this coven you're not telling me? Especially if it has to do with Phi. He's involved in the Phi dust trade. This was different, I argued. I'm putting my ass on the line here, Williams. If you know something, you better tell me. Why do you care if he's interested in Phi at all? Not like you're a full one anymore. Still part asshole, but thanks for the reminder of how effed up I am. The orb shifted to red sensing my anger. I tried to contain my irritation. By the way, I'm going to be gone for a week but I'll be sure to pick up the job as soon as I get back. Where are you going? You can't just leave. I can and I am. Pretty sure you'll be fine without me. I suggest you watch your backs. Draven seems to be out for blood again, and it might not just be mine. Not hard for him to figure out who I'm trying to get intel for. Is that a threat? No, it's a warning but you can take it however you want. Talk to you when I have something. I said, then hung up when he started to yell at me. 
You know I hope Draven comes for you dipshit. Maybe then I won't have to hear your whining anymore. I sat on the bench, closed my eyes and with the rose in my hand, let my mind wander. I saw Draven's evil smile, but it faded away, and then I was with Owen. We were laughing and dancing around the garden, seemingly without a care in the world. One of the few times I was able to put my fears aside and relax. That image disappeared too, and I saw the darker parts of my life in reverse. The night my training failed me, and I was bitten by a vampire. He'd nearly drained my life when my blood burned him from the inside out. As he bled out, collapsing on top of me, his blood dripped into the open wounds at my neck and my mouth, turning me. I'd awoken with a burning throat, fangs, and the sinking feeling that I would never be a true Phi again. I was tainted. Poisoned. No one took me in. The Phi turned from me. The vampires called me a plague. To this day, I still had no explanation for how I killed that bloodsucker, or any of the others Rudarius set on me. The rose in my hand crumpled as I squeezed it in my fist, my mind drifting back further to when Macron left me. Then before to when he trained me to fight. To survive. Trained me to use my fi magic through the rings my mother left behind. Back and back my mind drifted, until all I saw was Rudarius's cruel smile as he tortured me and drained my blood. As he ripped my wings away. I gasped at the pain, and glanced down to find the thorns stabbing into my palm as petals fell to the ground. Blood pooled in my palm, and I moved my hand around, watching it glide along my skin. The puncture wounds in my skin mirrored those caused by the fangs of the vampire's Rudarius forced to bite me. My blood was cursed, that was all he ever said. Cursed blood. Though every time he said it, the notion seemed to fill him with glee. The horrors I saw in my past were beyond measure. Owen told me he understood but how could he, when he was never kept in a dungeon for years and years without the sunlight on his face. Or the ground beneath his bare feet. He'd known love every day of his life. He wanted to save me from the world, from my past, from me. Except I didn't want to be saved. I couldn't be. I was broken, and there was no fixing me. No going back to a time before all this shit turned my life upside down and inside out. Closing my bloody hand in a fist so Owen wouldn't see it, I returned to the house. He was on the phone in the living room and barely nodded at me as I passed on my way to the bedroom. I washed the blood as quickly as I could, then splashed water on my mostly healed face. As the water dripped down my cheeks and chin, a strange vision struck me. One of not water but blood streaking down my skin. Minnie's words whispered across my ear, as if I was hearing them all over again. Danger was on the horizon. My life was about to change forever. Why did I feel a foreboding like a shadow in the back of my mind that whatever was coming would drag me down even lower than I already was? Seneca. My head snapped around but I was alone. Cursing Minnie and Draven for throwing me off my game, I faced the mirror again, falling backward into the wall at the sight waiting for me. Macron's aged face looked back at me as he reached out a hand to the glass. Seneca, remember. You have to remember. Macron? Tentatively, I reached for the glass. Are you, where are you? Time, it's time, help, you must save them. Save them, he repeated. A scream of pain had me flattening my hand to the glass as if I could reach into the reflection and pull him free. Then he shimmered out of view and was gone. Macron? Don't do this to me, you old bastard. I banged my fist on the glass as if that would let me get through to him. Seneca? Owen asked from the doorway. What are you doing? What's wrong? Macron. He was in the mirror. You sure you weren't seeing things? He reached for the glass, pressing his hand to it too as if it would magically open for him. There's no one here. I saw him, I insisted. He was there, looking back at me, reaching for me. Seneca, he said with a sigh. What, huh? What? You think I'm crazy? All this time I thought he just up and left me, but what if he didn't? What if something happened to him and he's trapped? I have to find him. How are you going to do that? 
What did he say to you? He said my name. I ran my hands all along the mirror, willing for it to show me Macron again. He told me to save them, but he didn't say where he was or who to save. Then there was a scream, a woman screaming, and he vanished. Owen pulled my hands from the mirror. Seneca, look at me, Macron isn't here. How do you know? I asked loudly. How? Why would he come to you now after all this time? He's been gone for several years. What five? Six? Seven years? He left you, remember? But what if he didn't? I repeated. This is what I mean about you living in the past. It's time to let go and move on. I clenched my jaw, glaring at the mirror. He was there, I know he was there. Just like I knew I saw him at the club, and heard his voice in the kitchen. Owen wanting to protect me, was not going to change the fact that Macron was alive. He might have been gone for years, and I was ticked at him for leaving without a word, but a nagging voice in the back of my mind said the man who risked his life to save me needed my help. Seneca please go to bed. You had a long couple of days. It wasn't worth the fight to convince him he was wrong, and I was right. I gave in, and went to lie down as he got changed and eventually snuggled in beside me. All throughout the night my eyes remained fixed on the bathroom mirror, waiting for Macron's face to appear again so I could figure out where he was. And this time save him. As we stepped through the portal leading to Valesque, I held tightly to Owen's hand. I was meeting his family. His entire family, and not just meeting them. Oh no, I was staying with them for a week. To say I was worried was a major understatement. I hadn't slept the night before, as one terrible scenario after another played out on how this vacation would go. That, and I had been on edge hoping to hear Macron's voice again. See his face. Neither happened. If you squeeze my hand any harder, you're going to break it. Sorry, I mumbled and loosened my grip. Can you blame me for being nervous? There's nothing to be nervous about. Says the guy with the perfect family. I don't know about this. Can't we pop in for dinner and stay somewhere else? Never been to Valesque, unless it was for a job. Let's go sightseeing. Be tourists for a week, I suggested, already knowing the answer was going to be no. You'll relax once you get through the door, he promised again. Trust me. I do but still. The house we walked up to was massive. I wouldn't say mansion, but it was big enough to hold Owen's large family. Whatever the human seemed to believe Valesque was, it was not dark and scary. It looked pretty much like the human realm, except the days were a bit longer and there were two suns and three moons. Other than that, it was quite the cheery place. I squinted up at those two suns now, part of me wishing I had the vampire vulnerability to sunlight, so we could have put off this trek for a bit longer. I really needed to learn how to stall better. A lot better. Owen walked right up to the front door, and didn't even bother knocking. He opened it and stepped inside. When I began to hesitate, he gave me a gentle tug. With a groan, I followed. He set our bag in the entryway, and closed the door behind me. The loud click of the door latching was like a stake to the heart, but somehow I put a smile on my face. We're here, he called out. Owen. Hurried steps echoed through the house, and then there was a demon hurrying forward. She held out her arms, and Owen picked his mother up as he kissed her cheek. They chatted excitedly for a moment, then he turned her around. Ah, and this must be Seneca. Hi, I said awkwardly, holding out my hand. You have an amazing home here. Thank you my dear, but in this house we don't shake hands, she said. I frowned. Then she broke into a large warm smile and hugged me. It's so good to finally meet you. Owen got his smile from his mom, that much was easy to tell. She held me tightly, and all I could do was hug her back. Owen beamed at me behind her back, as if satisfied his plan would work. Glad to know he was buying my happy smile, and didn't see I was cringing on the inside. His mom was nice enough, that wasn't the issue. She stepped aside and then his dad was there, then his sisters each hugging me, the notion that I did not belong fell over me hard. 
This was not the home I was used to, not since I was a little kid. It was strange to me, and before long, I was fighting the urge to run outside for fresh air to get away from all their smiling faces. Their casual bantering and laughter as they caught up with each other on their lives made me anxious and did nothing to relax me. I found myself itching for a fight to break up the surreal experience. But Draven never showed up to try and kill me again. Agent Williams didn't call me. Nor did anyone else needing my services. It appeared I was stuck in this overly happy setting for a week with no way out. Chapter 6 Draven. No sign of her anywhere in Madwich, Shane reported. Think you might have scared her off. Even you don't believe that. I looked out the window of my chambers. She must have gone somewhere is all, but she'll be back. And when she comes back, I'll be ready for her. You sure about that? Want a steel breastplate just in case? I hissed at him over my shoulder, but he merely shrugged and went back to drinking blood. Since my first encounter with Seneca, I'd been healing from the stake to the chest and analyzing every second of our fight. The next time, she would not get the upper hand on me. I needed those rings of hers, as well as her blood. Taylor mentioned they found two fi, Shane said from the chair by the fireplace. And they had two rings each, working on distilling the dust from their blood now to see if they're usable or not. Shane was swirling the blood around his goblet when I glanced at him over my shoulder, waiting for the rest of what he was going to say. And I snarled when he was silent for too long. And Lacey sent word to Rudarius. He's going to be here this evening. Did he happen to say what for? The captured Phi. Or the vampires I executed while she was absent? He did not say so could be either. My bet would be the latter. I smiled as I watched night fall in. Helena had been one of Rudarius's favorites. She certainly had the brains to run this post if he had ever allowed her to. But since I was the son of a master, he believed I was better suited for the role. Good for me, shitty for her, seeing as how she was nothing but dust now. Rudarius would question me about their loyalty and I would give him the same story I gave Lacey when she returned and learned of Helena's death, along with the other two I'd labeled as traitors. I thought she was going to rip my throat out. Too bad she was really close to Rudarius, or I would have named her too and saved myself some trouble down the road. She was already a problem. If Shane and I were going to have a hope of succeeding with our plans, she would have to go at some point. Killing her would be a joy. Bells clanged loudly throughout the mansion, and I whipped around. Shane was already on his feet and at the door by the time I reached his side. What's happening? I called out to the nearest guard, who was pressing his finger to his ear to listen to his calm. Fi escaped from the cells, he told us, making his way through the mansion. Armed? I asked, making for the stairs. No. Wait. He just got one of his rings back. Shit. Send everyone to the lower level now. Contain this before he causes any major damage. I ordered and blurred for the cells. The main lab where the Phi dust was collected was in chaos, as vampires frantically worked to save the blood they collected before it was washed away down the drains in the floor. Broken glass was everywhere. Several vampires appeared burned. He's armed with his ring, one of them yelled to me. Watch your backs. Where is he? I asked Christian as he sprinted toward me. Near the east stairwell and moving fast. Shane, you and Christian with me. The rest of you, secure the cells and ensure no one else escapes this night or it'll be your heads. I warned. Drawing an iron dagger from my hip, a mistake I made with Seneca not having one and would not do so with another phi. I charged toward the east stairwell, intent on stopping the Phi from escaping. A scream shattered the night, followed by another, and then an explosion of stone. I dodged fallen debris from the ceiling, then leapt over two vampires that were missing their heads. Whoever this Phi was, I was curious how Taylor managed to capture him if he was this strong. We turned the corner at the landing, 
and made it to the main level in time to see a barefoot man with dark red hair facing down a line of vampire guards at the front doors. Surrender now and you'll live, I told him. He spun around madly, holding out his left hand toward me, the red ring on it pulsing with fi magic. So you can drain my blood. No, I think you best let me go. You're not leaving this mansion. He glanced around, keeping that infernal ring aimed toward me. I took a step closer, the dagger ready in my hand. He staggered backward, weakened from whatever blood the vampires below already drained from him. Stay back. He pulled his hand back toward his body, and white light exploded outward. I fell to the floor, and the wall behind me exploded in bits of sheetrock and brick. I'll kill you all if I must. You can't, I hissed as I got to my feet. A dark smile lit the Fi's face as he lifted his hand over his head toward the ceiling. How do you care for the sunlight, vampire? Too bad it's night, I pointed out. Not for me. Not for any royal Fi. He lifted his hand higher, looking up at the ceiling. I wasn't sure what he was going to do. Blowing a hole in the ceiling and then the roof above would do nothing since, as I told him, it was too dark to harm any of us. The ring pulsed brighter, and a beam of light shot out toward the ceiling. I waited for the explosion, but there wasn't one. Instead, a brightness filled the room, increasing in intensity and heat, until it felt like we stood beneath the sun at noon. Vampires screamed and yelled, diving for cover as the light encompassed everyone. Shane and Christian collapsed beside me, burying their faces in their hands as they burned. I crouched low, snarling at the pain and the scent of burning flesh filling my nose. He was harnessing sunlight with his ring. This phi was not a normal phi. Staying low, I crept toward him, cursing each time more of my skin burned away. I crawled, iron dagger in hand, and when I didn't think I'd be able to bear the pain of my flesh turning to ash any longer, I rammed the dagger into the phi's shoulder. He gasped for air, and his arm faltered. I twisted the dagger and dragged him to the floor, holding him there as the sunlight vanished back into his ring with a loud pop. You will regret this, the Fi grunted at me over his shoulder. My response was to yank the dagger free of his back. Hold him. I yelled to whoever was left standing. Christian and another guard with half his face missing joined me and pinned the Fi to the floor. What are you doing, he shrieked. I grabbed his hand with the ring on it and stretched his arm away from his body. Stop, stop, he screamed. I raised the dagger over my head, and as he yelled and thrashed, brought it down on his wrist. His hand came free of the rest of him, and I scooped it up, ordering the guards to wrap the stump and get him back to his cell. The Fi continued to moan and curse me over his missing hand, until I smashed the butt of my dagger into his face to shut him up. He was taken away and I was left holding his severed hand, the one bearing the ring. It was a ruby set in a bed of smaller pearls, encased in gold. Too bad it wasn't silver, or we might not be able to use this ring. I tugged it off the index finger, and tossed the hand aside, examining the ring closely. There on the band next to the ruby was a sigil, a sun wrapped with a rose vine. It was small and hard to make out too much detail, but I tucked it away for later. How many dead? I asked Shane, holding the ring in my palm. Six. The rest were wounded by that damned sunlight trick. As I watched, his face stitched itself back together, and the vampires able to rise began walking around, gathering the bodies of those we lost to this pointless attack. Six more dead. None of them were mine, so it wasn't a great loss, but Rude Arius would not be pleased when he heard about this. How did he break out of his cell? I asked the guard closest to me. I don't know, but I'll look into it. See that you do, and triple the guard down there. I will not have this happening again, not when the master is on his way. The master, Ruderius's voice rang out. I shut my eyes, annoyed. Is already here, Ruderius finished. Taking a few seconds to compose my face, I turned and bowed my head to Ruderius, who was standing in the open front door. Master Ruderius, I am sorry you had to arrive during such an unexpected situation. Did I hear correctly? 
he asked, stepping around debris with Lacey at his side. She bared her fangs at me, and I imagined ripping them from her head. Soon. Soon I'd get rid of her. Did a fi escape the cells and cause all this damage? Yes, master. Was I wrong to charge you with this new task, Draven? He pinched my chin between his fingers. Well? No, master. It would appear I made a mistake in not having enough guards below. Who is this fi who caused so much damage? He mused, releasing my face. How many dead did you say? Six, master, and I'm not certain of the fi's name. He was brought in a few hours ago. But he bore a ring. I remembered the item I clutched in my hand. Should I try and slip it into my pocket and keep it for myself? The thought crossed my mind, and then Ruderius was glaring at me. No, I'd stick to the plan and get Seneca. No one would know about her. He did, I replied, and held the ring out to him. This one and another still in holding below. He used it to call a light as powerful as the sun. He picked the ring up and examined it closely. Walk with me, Draven. I did so. When Lacey made to follow, Ruderius held up his hand to stop her and told her to help with the cleanup. She glowered at me as I walked with Ruderius to the parlor. He told me to shut the doors, and I did so hesitantly, knowing this room was completely soundproofed. Either he was going to talk to me about something he didn't want any other vampire to hear, or he was going to kill me and be done with it. He removed his cloak, draped it over a chair, and paced toward the fire burning away in the hearth. This ring is much like the ones I have already, and yet I sense the heaviness in it. It's power, he said quietly, turning it this way and that, so the flames reflected in the facets of the stone. It appeared quite incredible. That it is, and for good reason. Did the Phi say anything to you of who he was? Anything at all? The fight happened so quickly, I didn't recall anything that was said. The power to call the sunlight can only be achieved by a select number of Phi. Very select number. Royals, you see. I frowned, but then the Phi's words came back to me. He said it was not night, not for any royal. I didn't know they had such power in them. They are quite dangerous, which is why vampires have never been able to overthrow them, why we can't drink their blood and survive. They can call the sun. And alas, we have no way to protect ourselves. None. This ring, however, this ring will give me a chance to use that power against them now. The ones you have already aren't from royals. I asked, thinking back to the rings on Seneca's fingers. Sadly, no. Only noble bloodlines. Then not all ring bearers are royals. No. The sigil of their house is here on the band. Ruderius pointed to where I saw the mark moments ago. He is a prince, it would appear, of the royal family of the Third Kingdom. The lesser of the three, of course, but still quite powerful. I am impressed you managed to catch him at all. So am I. I would have to ask Taylor what he did if he survived the attack. I just realized I hadn't seen him, though. Huh, it would be a shame if he died at the hands of the very fi he captured. This is quite a find, Draven. Quite a find indeed. I am happy it pleases you. This does, he said, holding up the ring once more, then tucking it away in his vest pocket. Other news, however, does not. Lacey sent word you had several vampires of this household executed. I did. And what proof did you have that Helena, my sweet Helena, was a traitor? Sworn statements of a servant, master. I usually would not listen to one begging for his life, but right before their heads were taken, Christian told me they all confessed and that they all spoke of nothing but ill will toward you and your coven. I lied, knowing my guard would agree to whatever Ruderius questioned him about. I see. That is tragic indeed. And unexpected. I had high hopes for Helena. For all three of them. I fear they would have been your downfall, Master, and with this war of yours drawing closer, I am simply glad they will no longer pose a threat to you or your plans. His eyes narrowed, and suddenly I was the prey caught in the sights of the predator. And what about you, Draven? 
Do you pose any threats to my plans? Master. Lacey tells me you've been distracted of late. Came home the other night and were wounded. I was tracking down Phi for you, ran into a bit of trouble. She says you were nearly killed, he commented. By who? A woman who will not be trouble for much longer. I have plans for her. His lips twitched. Good, I do not take attacks on this coven lightly. Did you happen to catch her name? No name, but she had bright red hair. I lied, wanting to keep Seneca a secret. Ruderius's gaze took on a faraway look as he nodded slowly. Red hair. I once had a fi in my keeping with red hair that shone like a fiery sunset. She had heart and a fight that kept her going long after so many others perished. A fine catch she was and so young. I planned on keeping her until she was grown and then turning her into my weapon, but alas fate had other plans. I remained perfectly still, though my mind raced off in a thousand different directions. Could he be talking about Seneca? What happened to her? She was stolen from me by a mage, he spat. He killed many good vampires that day. Macron thought he was invincible. Thought I would never come after him for what he did to me. But he was wrong. All those bloody mages were wrong. Is he why you started taking them? Mages are troublesome beings, rude area sighed as he picked his cloak up and fastened it around his neck. They like to insert themselves into every situation, regardless if it involves them or not. Warriors for the races, that's what they call themselves. Meddlesome fools. And now captured and dead fools. If I am to have a war, mages will only get in the way. Best to take them out of play before we attack. One less factor to contend with. His eye twitched as he spoke. There was more to his plans, but he moved past me for the door. And Draven. Yes, master. See this troublesome woman is taken care of. I need you focused if we are to move forward with our plans. He exited the parlor. Shane joined me a second later, closing the door. He leave? I asked him. He's speaking with Lacey in the entry, he said. Well? I think I just found out something very interesting about our dear Seneca. Something that might change this plan of ours. Do tell. Soon. First, I have to find someone who would be willing to speak of an incident that occurred a few years ago in Otherworld. You going to be asking questions about Ruderius? His widened eyes told me how much my plan worried him. Guess why? Might not be the smartest thing to do. I'm loyal to you, but there are others who will hear you poking around and report right back to him that you're looking for answers. I suggest you find someone else. Who else would know what happened except someone in this coven? Shane leaned in close as he whispered, There are plenty others if you know who to go to. You're speaking of what? A witch. A seer. If you're that desperate for answers, then yes. They can be bought or killed. Rude Arius never did like witches. Who does? I said absently. There were several local witches, but they were too close to home for comfort. I would find one far away, not in a major city. I would get the answers I needed, and then ensure there was no trail to lead back to me. I'm leaving you to keep an eye on the mansion while I'm away, I told Shane. How long are you going to be gone? Not long, I hope. I said, ready to open the door. And if Lacey should ask where you are? I paused, wondering what lie I should tell her, then simply said, tell her I'm following our master's orders. Technically, it was the truth. He wanted me to take care of this nuisance that was Seneca, so he could continue with his plans for war. He didn't have to know. I was planning on using her, instead of killing her. The shack appeared out of nowhere, in the densely overgrown forest in the mountains, as the sun was setting. I tracked down a witch who very few had heard of, but who was known for her power of sight, if you could find her and convince her to work for you. I had a hefty payday to offer, if she would agree to my terms. The locals in the town at the foot of the mountain said she was a recluse, but all I cared for was her power and if it was genuine. 
There were plenty who claimed they were witches, who clearly were not. When I reached her door, it swung inward before I could knock. What do you want? A ragged voice called from the dim candlelit room. Questions answered, I replied, not stepping inside yet. About a woman. Ah, typical man. Always seeking questions from a stranger instead of asking the poor thing herself, the witch mused with a light chuckle. At least, she wasn't psychic. What do you offer, in return for services rendered? I tossed in the small bag filled with money. A wrinkled hand picked it up, and it disappeared into the shadows. I waited, hearing the paper crinkle, then she set the bag aside. Come in and wipe your boots. I won't have you tracking mud in here. I did as she asked, and ducked to get through the sagging doorway. The witch sat at a small round table with two chairs in front of it. A crystal ball sat on the table, and I smiled, though cynicism filled me. Really? You doubt the simple magic? She said, but she was smiling in return. I will admit, it is mostly for show, but the tourists enjoy it after trekking through the mountains for hours to reach me. Now then, have a seat and tell me what you would like to know, vampire. Her name is Seneca, I said, shifting my tone of voice to a lighter one and acting as though I was infatuated with her, instead of wanting to track her down so I could capture her. After years of playing someone I wasn't, changing personalities was easy enough. She is amazing, truly amazing, but... But, the witch urged when I paused, working on what to say. I remembered our fight and the cold, hard look in her eyes. Seneca had been through hell. Only a survivor had that look in her eyes, the need to survive. To win. She's haunted by a dark past, I said quietly, sadly. I want to help her, but she won't open up to me. I just want to be there for her, understand what she went through. The witch reached out and patted my hand, her brow furrowing with concern. I understand, but are you certain you wish to know? Sometimes we keep our past secret for a reason. I do, I want to help her. She has no one else in her life. Very well then. She closed her eyes and placed her hands on the crystal ball. The clear glass grew foggy, and the witch opened one eye to wink at me. Mostly for show, she whispered, then cleared her throat and whispered Seneca's name repeatedly. I had never seen a witch use this method to see into the past before, but shapes began to form in the crystal ball. I saw Seneca's face framed by that fiery red hair. Her green eyes were cautious, hard. There was certainly no fear in them. Her face was gone for a few seconds, and when it returned, she was much younger. Standing before her was a vampire I knew all too well. Rudarius, I whispered. He was talking to her, but I couldn't hear the words. Seneca began to cry when she lashed out as two more vampires appeared in the image, chaining her up in his dungeon. The image shifted as the witch gasped, her face scrunching as though in pain. My gaze darted back to the crystal ball to witness Seneca's blood being taken. She appeared a bit older, but that fire was in her eyes. A fire that proclaimed that she was not going to die there. She fought against the vampires. Even managed to get a hand free to strike out at Rudarius. He retaliated, and she screamed as he slashed her arms more and more, draining her nearly dry. Then the image shifted again and again. Each time, the scene grew worse, and my stomach roiled at the sight, remembering my own time in that very same dungeon. The images cut off completely quite suddenly, and I was left reeling from everything I'd seen, and knowing it probably didn't cover half of what she endured. The witch sucked in air as she pushed away from the table. That poor girl, she whispered horrified. So many years with him, so many years spent in pain. I nodded, thinking over a new plan. I didn't see it all, but I didn't have to. Seneca was just like I was. The notion opened several intriguing possibilities. Here was another who wanted revenge against Rudarius for all the hurt he caused her. She was the redhead he captured and lost. The one he wanted to turn into a weapon, which meant she was strong. Damn strong. Was Seneca a royal? Why was she on her own, without protection of any kind? Had her kin dismissed her so easily, simply because she was turned by a vampire? 
You appear lost in thought, the witch mused. I hope this was able to help you. It was, I said quietly, pondering. I always knew she kept something from me, wanted to protect me, but didn't understand how bad it was until just now. Her life has indeed been tragic in the past. Yes, I agreed. Was that all you required of my services then? I smiled at her as I stood. There is one more thing I must have from you, I'm afraid. I shall help you if I can. Good, that's very good. My fangs tingled with the promise of fresh blood so close at hand. Getting here so quickly had taken much out of me, and I was famished. Sadly, I could not leave evidence of my visit. I'm afraid I have not fed yet today. The witch's look of horror was astounding when I charged her. She shouted a spell, and a burst of fire struck my shoulder, but she was too old and feeble to fight for long. Too trusting of strangers who came knocking at her door. Her screams died away after a while, as did her flailing. One final desperate kick dislodged the crystal ball from the table, and it rolled toward the front door. When I finished draining the witch, I wiped my lips and found a box of matches to set the place on fire. Regret churned inside me. No loose ends. I picked up the money she took, struck a match, and tossed it against the dry herbs on a shelf. They caught instantly as I walked toward the door. The crystal ball caught my eye, and I scooped it up. As the shack burned like a torch in the night, I studied the artifact in my hands. Seneca's face shimmered into view, those green eyes latching onto mine, as if she was looking at me as I was her. Was this the present? I held the ball closer to my face, studying the fake smile she wore and the strain around her eyes. Whatever she was doing, she wasn't happy. Soon, we'll be seeing each other again. It appears we have much more to talk about than I first assumed. If she was truly as powerful as Ruderius believed, then I would have to succeed where he failed. I would convince her to join me and turn her into the weapon he had wanted for his war. She would be mine to use against him and kill him. The crystal ball fell from my fingers, cracking against a stone on the ground. The fog inside rose, and with it came a scream that did not sound like the witch's. It struck me deep to my core, and I staggered away from it. I had the strangest urge to protect the woman who had screamed, but who the hell was she? The sound died away, and I walked through the forest, heading back down the mountain. When I had cell service again, I called Shane. You coming back soon, he asked. Lacey's chomping at the bit here to go track you down. I got what I needed. On my way back now. Any sign of Seneca yet? No, but I'll keep looking. Good, because we need her. I think we just found ourselves an unwilling ally. How are you going to get her to talk to you without killing you? That was the question, wasn't it? I wondered the same, until I remembered the human girl she protected that night. Lexi. She'd called her Lexi. I need you to go to Madwitch. Track down a girl named Lexi. We'll need her. I'll find her. And the witch. A crash sounded in the distance as the shack collapsed from the flames. What witch? I hung up and blurred away into the night. Chapter 7 Seneca I flipped the lights on inside the cottage and went straight for the fridge and a bottle of wine. The week had finally come to an end, and after an hour of saying goodbye to Owen's family, we were finally able to get out of there and get home. All week long, I had to sneak away to check in with Minnie to see if there'd been any more news on Draven. Though I was annoyed at her for her lack of helpful answers that day in the cafe, she was my eyes, so to speak, when I wasn't in Madwitch. Aside from Lexi being out on her own again, there was nothing to report. No sign of Draven, or any other vampires in town for that matter. It nagged at me. He was not the type of vampire to nearly be killed and leave it alone. We had unfinished business. He was waiting for me to be seen, and since I'd been gone for a week. That went well, don't you think? Owen said, cutting through my thoughts. Seneca? Yeah, no, it was completely relaxing. I had a great time, I rambled pouring a large glass of red wine. You have a great family. 
They're all really nice. If you had such a great time, why are you chugging that glass of wine? I'm not, I said in between large gulps. Just ready to get back to normal, is all. Normal as in, you're risking your life again? He rested his hands against the counter opposite me, watching me. Something like that. He hung his head, like I'd disappointed him, and I set my glass down so hard I was surprised it remained in one piece. The sound startled him and he frowned. What? I didn't say anything. No, but you want to. So go ahead, let it all out. Stop it, he said. I poured more wine into my glass and waved for him to spit it out. I don't understand why you're acting like it was a terrible week. My family likes you a lot. Mom kept asking when we were going to be back, so you could spend some time with her and my sisters. They want you to be a part of the family, as do I. His words reverberated a panic in me, and I emptied my wine glass. Be a part of the family, as in becoming a part of the family by marriage. That was nowhere in the cards for me, especially right now, with Draven out there dogging my steps and Minnie's warning about danger on the horizon. Or the fact that Macron appeared to be alive, after all. Why do you look like I told you your dog died, instead of that I want you to be a part of something amazing, he asked quietly, hurt. That's all I'd been doing to him lately, hurting him. Owen. I. I grunted in annoyance and my inability to speak the truth. I can't. Can't what? Do this. Keep pretending that everything is right in the world, I blurted. Being with your family, seeing how happy they are together. And how happy you are, you won't get that with me. I didn't belong there. They wanted you there, he argued. They did, but I was about ready to tear my hair out, I admitted, hating how the words were tumbling out of my mouth so carelessly. I never grew up with anyone but my parents, and then I lost them and there was no more happy family life for me. No more family at all. I see what you want me to be, and it kills me because I can't be that for you. He swallowed hard, moving around the counter. He reached for my hands but I drew back, confused by my emotions as much as he was. If you would let yourself enjoy life, instead of fighting it every time something good happens. That's not what this is about. Then what is it? Tell me please because right now I don't see the problem. Because you don't want to. You want to pretend that our lives can be perfect. That we can be like your parents and have a normal white picket fence life. We can if you would let it happen. I don't want that. My yell shocked us both. He started to speak then stopped, shaking his head at me. I don't, I went on, quieter. It's not who I am. That kind of life is out of reach for me, and I'm okay with that even if you aren't. You talk as if you're a terrible person who doesn't deserve a good life, he mumbled. Maybe I am, I said, and he scoffed. I've killed people, Owen. As part of your job, he argued. I stalked away wishing more than anything we did not have to have this argument right now. You're not a cold-hearted killer. You're not a murderer. The hell I'm not. I whirled around to find him right behind me. I have killed more people than I've been paid to. And you know what? I feel nothing when I do it. Nothing. I'm numb to it. There's no remorse, no guilt. Only emptiness, and the annoyance that it wasn't the one being in this world I want dead more than anyone else. I am just like Draven. No, you're not. He grabbed my shoulders, as if he wanted to shake the madness out of me. Do not compare yourself to that monster. Why not? We're the same. At the end of the day, we're exactly the same. You can't be serious. I am. I removed his hands, then backed away. I thought I could do this, I said, motioning to the cottage. Have the home and the garden, the boyfriend who's always there for me but I'm broken. I took a deep breath. And there's no fixing me. You don't have to stay this way. Did you ever think that maybe I like how I am? There's no chance you mean that. I waited for his words to sink in, and that I was overreacting. Except that moment never came. A long time ago I accepted who I'd become, 
and there was no more going back to change myself. This was who I was. End of story. I do. I've thought it all along, but I was too much of a coward to admit it to myself. And to you. I don't believe you. This Draven business is dragging all your past fears out. That's all this is. Owen, I started. He held up his hand. If you're asking me to leave you, he said slowly, if that's what this is I'm not going anywhere. Not until you know for certain that the life you're living right now would be better without me in it. I never said it would be better, I told him. But I can't do this to you. You've done nothing to me. The sleeplessness nights. The constant worrying. I drive you nuts most of the time, I pressed on. If I didn't want to be with you, I would have left. You feel guilty, that's all this is. I tried to make him see. Or worry that the second I walk out that door, you're going to fall apart. I hadn't been angry at him yet, but those words aggravated me more than anything else he said so far. You think I can't take care of myself? You think you're really the only reason I haven't gone insane and wound up locked up in a mental hospital somewhere? Or fallen in with the same sort of crowd who hires me to kill people? Is that it? So what if it is? You think I'm helpless that what if you leave I'll get myself in trouble? That I'll get killed? Look what happened the first time you were on your own, he shot back. You were kidnapped by the worst vampire on the continent, hell in both worlds. And the second time you were turned. Not like you have the greatest track record in the world, Seneca. I slapped him so hard my hand went numb, but I was furious at his words. He growled as he glared at me, but then his words seemed to click and he cursed, trying to reach for me. I raised my hand to punch him this time and he paused. How dare you, I seethed. Sen I'm sorry. I don't care. I turned on my heel and stormed into the bedroom, slamming the door behind me. I locked it, then leaned against it as I sank to the floor. His steps moved closer, and I sensed him right on the other side of the flimsy wood. I heard him sit on the floor too, though he never said a word. All week long, I told myself I was going to give being content and happy a try. That I could be someone whose thoughts weren't constantly wandering in the darkness. Who was not concerned if her daggers were sharp or not, because she didn't need them. Each time his sisters laughed with me, I wanted to feel it, really feel it in my gut. Wanting to feel it and being able to, were two very different things. Rudarius, tore the ability to feel from me all those years ago. Macron's leaving only solidified it. When Owen came along, I was drawn to him because I thought he could help me feel again. Instead, I let myself be taken in by this fantastical life that could never exist for me. My chest ached to imagine him gone, but at the same time, how could I keep dragging him through the mud with me? I had no idea what was going on inside my head anymore. It was all so damn confusing. And all the wine did was make everything fuzzy. I sat on the floor until my ass hurt and my muscles cramped in protest. At some point I thought I dozed off. I hadn't heard Owen leave, but also didn't hear him on the other side of the door. With a grunt, I got up and quietly opened the door. The cottage was dark, but as I stepped out into the hall, I tripped over a leg and went tumbling down into Owen's lap. He held me close and I let him, as he rested his forehead to mine. I'm sorry, he whispered, brow wrinkling. I don't want to change you, I just want you to be happy. I know. I'm sorry too. But I need time, and there's a chance this is all I can ever be. I don't want to disappoint you. You could never do that. You hear me? His lips brushed mine, and I let myself get lost in the moment. His love for me surrounded me and though I told myself I felt the same for him, these last few weeks the hollow feeling I'd known before Owen returned. Bit by bit, it threatened to consume me until that was all I felt. I'll give you however much time you need, he promised. I let him hold me, then pick me up and carry me back to the bedroom. Time, there would never be enough of it for me to deserve Owen. Not even close. One day, he would have to accept I was not the woman he thought I could be. Chapter 8 Seneca 
a couple of days back from Valesque, and Owen was driving me crazy all over again. Any time I left the cottage, he was right there with me. Even if he said he was going to do something else once we got to town, I'd catch him a few steps behind me, as if he expected Draven to appear out of nowhere. I asked him once to leave it alone, and that I was fine, but all he did was grunt and ask if I was going to stop going after Draven. I hadn't bothered answering, and he continued to be my overbearing shadow. Having nightmares every night wasn't helping my case at all. I woke up screaming each time. Owen was there to pull me back from that dark ledge, but when he asked about them I shrugged it off and said I was fine. The nightmares shifted from being about what Rudarius did to me, to seeing Macron in trouble. I'd seen him two more times, warning me to stay away. Whether he saw me or not, I had no way of knowing, but my gut told me he was there and he was alive. Owen refused to hear any of it, and continued to brush off my concerns. That pissed me off more than his following me around all the time. A week after we got back from Valesque, I stopped talking to him. The conversation about my needing time and his waiting came back to bite me in the ass. I should have ended it that night, but once again I was too much of a coward to follow through. How long are you going to give me the silent treatment? Owen asked as he joined me one night in the garden. I shrugged, not bothering to look up from my weeding. You're acting like a child. Me? I snapped, throwing weeds over my shoulder attempting to hit him in the face. You're the one stalking me. I need space to do my job, and you are not letting me do it. I want you to stop searching for Draven. Ha right. I'll be sure to do that. Why do you want to find the vampire trying to kill you? Once, I got to my feet and poked Owen hard in the chest. He tried to kill me one time. Just once. If he really wanted me dead, he would have been back by now or sent more of his goons to F up my life. But he hasn't, so back off. I don't need you to protect me. Is it so hard to understand I care for you? That's not why you're doing this. No? Then why? I marched through the garden, the orbs changing from calming blues and violets to angry oranges and reds as they channeled by emotions. You think if you push hard enough, you'll finally break through whatever wall you think I have up. That you'll convince me, I don't have to do this job any longer. I like my job Owen, I like it, and I'm not about to quit. Besides, if I don't find him, the feds are going to turn on me, remember? I told you I could take care of it for you. I don't want you to. Get it through your thick demon skull, all right? I threw the back door open so hard it slammed into the wall, denting it. I searched for my leather jacket, pulled it on and hurried toward the front door. Where are you going? Out. I'm going out, and you can stay here or go back to Valesque, I don't care but you are not coming with me. It's night. Draven could be out there which is why I'm going out armed. Owen reached over my head and pressed his hand to the front door, preventing me from opening it. I sighed and yanked on it. Though I was strong, he was stronger. Freaking demon strength. I don't want to do this right now. Your nightmares have gotten worse, he said as if I hadn't said anything at all. You won't admit it, but you're getting worse too, and it's because of that vampire. So what do you want me to do? Hide. And what? Hope the problem resolves itself? I'll take care of him. The dark tone made my skin itch. What did you say? If getting rid of Draven will help you stop being crazy like this, I'll take care of him. Tonight. You can't go kill him, I pointed out. You're a bodyguard for the ambassador. You'll be arrested for murder. You could be too. Yeah, I agreed but I'm not connected to any political office. And as much as you think you could do it, you're not a killer, Owen. Murdering him would tear you apart. He clenched his jaw as he narrowed his gaze. You're saying I'm weak? Not what I said at all. I'm saying, between the two of us, you're the good guy. I want you to stay the good guy. That's what I've been trying to tell you all along, if you'd take the time to listen. I tugged on the door again, but he didn't budge. 
You are not going to kill Draven. If he comes for me, it'll be the last thing he does, but I'll end him at my hand. He growled quietly, but the conflict was clear on his face. Owen, let me go, all right? I'll be back in a few hours. Just need to clear my head. It took a minute, but his hand fell and he backed away from the door. The confusion warring with hurt on his face nearly stopped me from leaving, but I had to get away from him. I slipped out, leaving the door open and wandered into the night, heading toward the center of town. I glanced back once when I sensed eyes watching me, but Owen remained in the doorway. I hated myself for being so vicious toward him, but what did he expect me to do? If he killed Draven, it would solve one small problem for me and create an even worse one for himself. If I was lucky, Draven would show up tonight, we could have our fight, and I would kill him and be done with it. Agent Williams couldn't complain to me if his target was dead. The danger would be off the streets, and his agents would be safe from one threat at least. Madwich was a mostly supernatural town, so the sidewalks were busier when the sun went down. Most of us preferred the dark. I could be out in the sun, but every now and again I was drawn to the night and the bright moon in the sky. It soothed the vampiric side of me and stopped it from lashing out in anger. That anger had grown of late, another tidbit I failed to tell Owen. As had my urge to drink blood. I cooked my meat a bit rarer than usual, but that wouldn't be enough, I sensed. I rolled my neck, clamping my lips shut tight around my fangs. Drinking blood enhanced all my abilities, but the cost was not worth it in my mind. I did it so rarely, the worry I would go too far and add another victim to my list was always on my mind. My cell rang loudly in my pocket, and I groaned, assuming it was Owen. I said I'd be back, I answered without looking to see who it was. Heavy breathing came through the line, followed by a whimper. Owen. Not exactly, a male voice said. Who is this? I stopped in the center of the sidewalk. Talk girl, the man ordered. My heart thundered away in my chest. I said talk or I'll make you scream. Seneca, Lexi yelled. Please help me. Please. Lexi, where are you? Who has you? I turned around wildly, as if there'd be a helpful arrow pointing me to where she was. Answer me. I don't know, she cried. I can't see anything. Seneca, he's a vampire, no. Get off me. You leave her alone, I shouted into the phone. A few people nearby stopped to look at me, but I snarled and they moved on in a hurry. I can only guarantee her life until midnight, the vampire said as Lexi continued to cry in the background. If you refuse to show, you'll find her body in the morning. If you agree to come, things will turn out differently. Where are you? I demanded through gritted teeth. Abandoned farmhouse outside of town, you know it? I do. Good. We'll be waiting for you. If you hurt her, I threatened. Or at least began to, but there was a click and the line went dead. Damn it. Shoving my cell back in my pocket, I turned around and sprinted down the sidewalk. Being part vampire gave me their speed, and I used every ounce of it to reach Lexi in time. Midnight was less than an hour away. The vampire hadn't sounded like Draven, but had to be connected to him. Draven saw her with me the night he attacked. I should have seen this coming, should have watched out for her better, but I was distracted by my own shit and Owen. At the gravel drive leading to the house, I slowed and armed myself with one of my short swords and the stake. Candlelight flickered in the front windows, and I saw two shadows against the wall. I sniffed the air and picked up Lexi's mostly human scent, along with the smell of vampire. Instinct screamed at me that this was a trap, as my feet carefully made their way along the drive. If not for Lexi, I would have told the vampire to go screw himself. But she'd been through enough in her life already to add being kidnapped by a vampire to the list. When I neared the front door, I held my breath to listen. Lexi was crying, and the vampire was talking loudly, counting off the minutes till midnight. There was no time to search the house and surrounding yard. I leaned back and kicked the front door open so hard it flew off the hinges and slammed into the wall. Seneca, Lexi yelled. Shut up, 
the vampire snarled and she cried out in pain. I hissed at the sight of him standing behind her, using her as a meat shield. His hand wound through her hair, and he had his sharpened nails aimed at her throat ready to strike. Cutting it close, Seneca. I worried you weren't going to make it. Lexi, you all right? I asked. She nodded until the vampire snapped his jaws and yanked on her hair. Who the hell are you? I aimed the stake at his face. I squinted, then my eyes widened. You're the chicken shit from the other night. Something like that, he replied with a leer. Tonight I'm the bait. Shit. It was a trap after all. I waited for more vampires to descend, but none came. Let her go, I ordered, gripping the stake in my fist or I'll make sure you meet the sun. He'll let her go, another voice hissed from behind me, and I shifted so I could keep Lexi in my sights and watched as Draven approached from the rear of the house. I thought there was only one vampire here. How hadn't I smelled him? But first you have to agree to something. Why would I listen to a damned word you have to say? Because it would appear we got off on the wrong foot, so to speak. Draven held up his hands and spun slowly around, showing me he had no weapons. His shirt was too damn tight to hide anything, as were his damned leather pants. Waving a white flag here, Seneca. Why? What do you want with me, except to try and kill me again? I asked, confused. We need to talk, he said. Simple as that. Agree to stay and have a conversation, and my associate will let her go. You have my word. The word of a murderer? I scoffed. Don't make me laugh. And what right do you have to judge me? He asked quietly. The only innocent in this room is the girl, and you know it. You can even keep your weapons. All I want to do is talk. About what? I said impatiently. What could you possibly have to say that would stop me from killing you? Seneca, Lexi whispered, voice shaking in fear. The vampire holding her shushed her, and I snarled at him as he winked at me. You spill one drop of blood I'll rip your throat out, I warned the vampire. Shane enough, Draven said. To my surprise the vampire Shane rolled his eyes but stopped flashing Fang and loosened his hold on Lexi. Slightly. I tried to tell her with my eyes that I was going to get her out of this mess and she subtly nodded her head. I knew her hanging with me had always been a bad idea. I'm waiting. I glowered at Draven. You have three seconds to tell me why I should stay, or your boy over there is going to lose his head. Shane snarled at me, but Draven held up his hand and the sound cut off. Rudarius. My blood turned cold. What about him? You want him dead, he said, taking a slow step closer to me. And? You have a problem with my wanting your master dead? Quite the opposite. I tensed when he took another step closer, believing this had to be a trap of some kind. Had to be, right? I want him dead too. It would appear you and I have a common enemy. Care to talk now? My fingers fidgeted on the stake and the short sword. I waited to see a flicker of the lie in Draven's eyes, but they shone with the same hatred I recognized from my own reflection. Let her go, and I'll hear what you have to say. Draven snapped his fingers and Shane released Lexi. She staggered toward me, but I shook my head then tossed her my cell. Seneca, I'm not leaving without you. Yes you are. Take it, walk back to the diner and call Owen. I'll be along. Seneca, she whispered hesitantly but I hissed loudly at her and she took off for the door. Her steps crunched along the gravel, and I let out a relieved breath when the sound changed to smacking against the pavement. No other vampires waited out there for her. She was safe for now. Interesting relationship you have with her, Draven mused. You wanted to talk, so talk. Why would you want to kill Rue Darius? Let's just say I owe him, he told me. I found myself hanging on every word coming out of his mouth. Chapter 9 Draven Seneca was more than ready to kill for that human girl. That fire burning in her for violence, I needed that, to take on Rudarius. The rings glinted in the firelight, 
and my gaze darted to them briefly, then back to find her watching me intensely. Curiously, she kept her weapons level and shrugged. Well, you want Rude Arius dead, and I might have a way to do that. Why would you kill your own master? If you fail, you'll bring the entire Black Hawk Coven down on your head. True, but then I don't plan on failing. I clasped my hands behind my back and slowly paced around the room, Seneca not taking her eyes off me for a second. Those rings on your fingers. They're powerful, yes. I guess, she replied slowly. Why are you so interested in them? Not like you can use them. My hand wavered in front of me. That's not entirely true. What are you talking about? Rudarius has found a way to use Phi Dust to trigger the power within your rings, I explained. Her face paled, and she lowered her weapon slightly. That's not possible. I would have agreed with you if I hadn't seen it for myself. All those years of his using Phi Dust as a drug were a ruse for a much bigger scheme, it appears. I caught the shudder that raced over her. Flashes of her past came to mind. There was no room to be sympathetic to what she suffered at the hands of Rudarius. I needed her for her power, and that was it. She was a means to an end. I cleared my throat, buying myself time to get my emotions in order. Rudarius. He was all that mattered here. And that scheme is what, she asked. Or. War on who? Shane hissed quietly. She glared at him, raising her stake toward his face. He snarled at the threat. I shook my head at him. Shane, wait for me outside, would you? You're making our guest nervous. He bowed his head and blurred away, the candle flames flickering wildly in his haste to be gone. You can lower your weapons, I told her. I don't plan on attacking you tonight. Why should I trust anything you say, she hissed. You tried to kill me, remember? You kidnapped an innocent girl to get to me. True, but then again you provoked the attack. Spying on me for the feds. We all have our jobs to do and parts to play. She sheathed her short sword at her hip. The stake slipped back into a holster on her forearm. A clever place for it. No wonder, I hadn't seen it the first time she used it on me. I was told you murdered four feds, and they're trying to connect you to their deaths. Did you do it? It was far from my proudest moment, but sadly was necessary. They left me no choice, I finally replied. That I highly doubt. I did not bring you here tonight to discuss my sins, I snapped, losing patience. Rudarius wants a war against the Phi, and seeing as you are part Phi, my eyes flickering to her pointed ears as clear evidence despite the fangs in her mouth, I assume you are upset at the news. She rolled her shoulders and leaned back against the closest wall. Not really. They're your kin. Are they? I was kidnapped by Rudarius and no one rescued me, at least no one who was Phi. And my favorite part was being bitten by one of you stinking monsters and turned into a half-vampire. I'm tainted. The Phi don't give two shits about me, so why should I care about them? That was not what I expected, and I fumbled for a reply. Had the Phi really turned their backs on her just like that, for what she was? And who she was? Why wasn't she more upset by being betrayed by her people? Then again, Seneca was the only Phi vampire I'd heard of. Ever. She was an unknown in our world. I glanced at her rings again. Wondering why a royal or noble Phi would be raised outside of Otherworld to begin with. Your parents, who were they? I asked. What does it matter, they're dead. Were they nobles? Royals? What? No. They were normal Phi, she replied sharply. Why are you asking me about them? Normal Phi don't have rings of power, I pointed out. If you were raised around them, you would know. Her hand curled into a fist, tucking the rings out of sight. You're not answering my question. Your rings. Where did you get them? Was she not the Phi Rudarius wanted to turn into a weapon? I saw her face in his dungeon, but then again, she could have just been one of the many Phi he kidnapped over the centuries to drain their blood. 
She was rescued, though, by who, I wondered. Your rings, I repeated. They were my mother's, she said quietly. They came to me after I escaped Ruderius's dungeon. You didn't have them when he held you captive. No. I thought they were lost, she whispered, running her fingers over the gemstones as they glowed softly. The day I received them, why am I even telling you this? She snarled suddenly, pushing off the wall and aiming for the door. I'm done talking to you. I blurred around her and blocked her path. I am not finished with you. The stake sprung free of its holster, and the tip was pressed against my chest, this time aimed directly at my heart. Stand aside, or I'll make sure this time I don't miss. I spread my arms wide, keeping my gaze locked on hers. A tiny voice in the back of my head said she wasn't bluffing, but without her agreeing to aid me, or the rings and the dust I could get from her veins, there was no point in living anymore. Ruderius would figure out what I was up to, and he'd tear me apart for it, piece by piece. I'm as good as dead if you don't hear me out, I confessed. Why should I care about your problems? She pressed the stake harder against my chest, drawing blood. You're just another monster going bump in the night. A killer. Look who's talking. Her eyes narrowed, and she drew her arm back as if to plunge the stake into my chest. Except she didn't. It slid back into its holster, and she took a large step back, appearing at war with her emotions. A fi came to us recently, I told her, lowering my arms. He bore a ring like yours, and on it was a sigil for a royal family. Ruderius, as after any fi with rings, because of the power they control. All fi have magic. Yes, but royal fi have more. Much more. I've seen it. And they are the only ones with rings to manifest it. I've never done anything great with these rings, she told me. You have the wrong fi. I would say I'm sorry, but I'm not. Ruderius will have his war, I said, when she made to walk out the back door. My word stilled her, but she didn't turn back around. He's already started, and no one's even noticed. When he finally attacks, it'll be too late to stop him. He's powerful, so much more powerful than he was before. So you want us to what, stop him from starting a war? Her voice was cold. I want revenge, I seethe. This time she did whirl around. I let loose of my fury. I want to see him bleed, hear him beg for his life. I want him dead, but I can't do it alone. I'm not who you think I am. I'm the freak. Nothing more. You are more, I argued. You said someone rescued you from rude areas. Who was it? A mage, she said softly. Where is he now? I don't know. He went missing years ago. There was more to her words than what she said out loud. I saw the truth in her eyes. She was looking for him. If he was a mage, then he was probably one of the many rude areas saw fit to capture and imprison. Or dispose of. She should know what was happening in other world because of her damned boyfriend. He worked for the demon ambassador. Mages going missing was something many in power would take notice of. Ruderius's view on the meddling of mages was widespread, so if they started disappearing, I doubted there were many in power who would care, but still they would know. He was weakening them, right in front of their faces, and they were too ignorant to see it. When was the last time you were in Otherworld? Years. And I don't plan on going back. Not like anything's going on there anyway, Owen would have said something about it. Even as she said so, she didn't seem convinced. Ask your demon what's happening in Otherworld, I said. She still. Ask him about the missing mages. Make him tell you the truth. Mages? What do you mean? Ask him, and then call me when you're ready to talk again. I left a small piece of paper on a rotted end table with my number. Until then, I'll assume our truce is still on. Agreed? Agreed, she said reluctantly. I don't trust you. That's very smart, I said, then blurred out of the house to the end of the drive where Shane waited. Nice to see you don't have another stake through your chest, he commented. Well? We need more time to convince her, 
I said as we strolled casually down the road. There's not much of that to go around right now. Lacey's suspicious enough as it is. And if Rude Arius gets even a hint of what we're plotting, we're dead. He had a point, but there was no rushing someone to seeing the truth about who they were. After two hundred years, I'd learned many things about the mind. The more a truth was forced on someone, the less likely that someone was going to accept it. I planted the seed. All she needed to do now was ask the right questions of the right people. If she was the woman I thought she was, I'd be getting a call sooner rather than later. Why not just take her now? Shane suggested. There's two of us. We can handle her. I would rather have her on our side, at least for a while. Fighting her continually would grow old, and it would be a shame if she got lucky and finished one of us off before we were able to kill Rude Arius. I still say we take her now, he muttered, but I ignored him. Together, we blurred back to the mansion. Lacey awaited us on the front steps, arms crossed, tapping her toes obnoxiously loud. Well? Well what? I replied, moving past her without slowing. Where have you two been? She sniffed, and her eyes flared red for a second. You were around humans and Phi. Following the master's orders, I informed her. We're still supposed to be searching for Phi with rings, are we not? We got word there were several in the area, and went to investigate. And? And we must have missed the Phi. I smell it on you, she accused. You do, but they weren't worth taking, I explained. No rings. And as of right now, those are the only ones I'm going to trouble myself over. If you'll excuse me, I'll be below seeing to the dust. I left her scowling behind me and strode through the mansion, then downstairs to the lower levels. The vampires who distilled the dust from the fi blood were hard at work as always, wearing gloves and masks to ensure they didn't get it on their skin or breathe it in. They were overcautious, but I didn't blame them. We'd all seen plenty of times what happened to a vampire who drank the wrong Fi's blood. It wasn't a pretty sight. Sir, Christian said as he bowed his head to me when I reached the cells. Everyone accounted for. Yes. No one has broken free. Good. And has anyone else come to speak to you? I breathed in his ear, so no one else would overhear. He nodded. I took care of it. As I knew you would. I'm going to check the prisoners, and then return upstairs. I glanced around the lower level once, then added, ensure I am not disturbed. Of course, sir. He took his post at the end of the corridor, as I walked along the cells. They lined both sides, and majority were filled with Phi barely clinging to life. Many had been here for months, some years. A few would be dead before the dawn, once they were drained of the last bit of usable blood. The one I wished to speak with resided at the very back, chained to the wall and missing his left hand. When I neared the bars, he lifted his head and spat at my feet. Lovely. What do you want, Hellspawn? Ouch, that hurts, I said with a smile. Really? You've been down here all this time, and that's what you come up with. You can do better than that. Do you enjoy being a monster? Or is that just because you're a vampire? Monster. He thought I was a monster. Hadn't he met Rude Arius? When the Phi started to laugh and mutter in Phi, I glowered at him. If you're going to curse me, at least do it in a language I understand. Not cursing you. He leaned forward as far as the chains would allow him. Pitying you. Pity. I don't need your pity. No. You're in a worse cage than I am. I hissed as I grabbed the bars, then I reached through, closing my hand around his throat. I could kill you right now, and walk away without feeling a thing. I am in no cage, Fi. He laughed harshly. You believe what you want, but one day your sins will catch up to you. I know who you are, or who you used to be. I knew your father, once upon a time. You think he would enjoy seeing his son turned into a mindless beast. A puppet on Rudarius's strings. I tightened my fist. He gasped for air, but didn't fight to get free. You know nothing. 
I know enough, he rasped. He broke you, after all, it's a shame. I squeezed even tighter, feeling his neck ready to crack in my grip. I came down here for answers, though, not to be lectured by him. I released him, and he staggered away from the bars. You say you knew my father, but I wonder if you knew someone else. A fi girl with fiery red hair and green eyes. Does this girl have a name? He asked as he rubbed his throat. Seneca. The fi's eyes widened as he charged the bars, the chains forcing him to stop short. You've seen her. Where? You know who she is? I asked, surprised by his reaction. Of course I do. What have you done to her? Where is she? Tell me. He stretched out with the one hand he had left but couldn't reach. If you've hurt her, I don't care what you do to me. I will find a way to tear your heart from your chest and watch you turn to ash. This was not what I expected at all. He acted as if she meant something to him, and yet she didn't seem to think there was any fi who cared for her at all. Who was this prince? Who is she to you? I asked him. You, you don't know who she is. She's not here. She's not, I admitted. We've had a couple of run-ins, and she's a formidable opponent who cares nothing for other fi. I paused, unsure of what to ask him next. Where did Taylor capture you? The Vale. Down south, he responded. That explained why he didn't know how close he was to Seneca right now. Who is she to you? I asked again. The Fi shook his head. No. I'm not telling you anything about her. And why is that? She doesn't care about you. It's in her blood to care, he argued. She's like me. A royal. Seneca was a royal. She sure didn't act like one. And she claimed her powers weren't that great. Either she was better at lying than I first assumed, or she had no idea what she was. Is there any reason she wouldn't know who she is? He closed his mouth and returned to the far corner of his cell, sinking to the floor. Fine, if you don't wish to tell me anything, then I'll tell you what you clearly don't understand about her now. She was bitten and turned by a vampire. She's been cast out by your kind. Does that ring any bells? You're the one who turned her? He bellowed and charged toward me. I'll kill you for this. Never said it was me, I informed him. Happened a while ago, after she was captured and tortured for years. By Rue Darius. He screamed and cursed me, straining to get free of the chains holding him. The agony in his eyes was quickly followed by hatred and regret. I understood none of what he showed, and could only watch as he broke down in furious tears. The longer I watched him, the more guilt shone through, as if he knew already what Seneca had been through. The sun will take you all, he ranted. I'll see that you burn. That you all burn. Who is she? I asked once more. My sister. She's my sister. And you, you've ruined her. His sister. If he was a prince, then that meant Seneca was a Phi princess, tainted by a vampire, but a royal nonetheless. She had the power to call sunlight in her. Now all I had to do was get her to see the truth of who she was. And get her to trust me. If she really was that powerful, then there was a slim chance I would be able to bring down Rude Arius using her. Afterward, I would take her ring and blood for myself, but letting her kill the bastard would keep me in a good light with the coven. They would see her as the enemy, and I could take what was rightfully mine. An echo of the scream I heard from the shattered crystal ball reached me again, and I hissed quietly at the thought of having to kill Seneca. If she got in the way, I wouldn't have a choice. Why did it bother me so much, suddenly? She was this Fi's sister, and I was just going to up and murder her? A long time ago, I would have punished a vampire for doing what I was about to do. I hadn't been this conflicted since I killed those feds. Focused. I had to stay focused on the end game. Where is she? The Phi demanded. Where is my sister? Don't worry, I said with a wink, summoning the evil face I'd worn for far too long. I'll take good care of her for you. I walked away, his yells of anguish following me down the corridor, 
as I waited impatiently for Seneca to make the call that would change both of our futures forever. Chapter 10 Seneca I sprinted back into town as fast as I could, aiming for the diner. Lexi was waiting on the corner, with Owen right beside her. He sighed in relief to see me alive, his eyes scanning me for any visible wounds. He frowned but I shook my head, stopping him from asking me anything. I wanted to make sure Lexi was all right and get her home. Then I could fill him in on what happened. Sort of. I fought with myself over how much to tell him just yet. Seneca. Lexi hugged me hard. What happened? How did you get away? No vampires are going to take me down, I told her. Did they hurt you? At all? No, not really. Scared me, that's all. She wiped tears from her cheeks. He came out of nowhere and just said he needed my help to get you. I know and I'm so sorry, kid. You shouldn't be involved in this mess. I'm okay, honest. I don't care. You have enough of your own shit to deal with instead of getting dragged along into mine. I hugged her close again. Tonight could have gone so wrong. If Draven wanted to get to me, he could have easily killed Lexi, and there would have been nothing I could do to stop him. I failed her. Right, how about we get you home? Can't I stay with you tonight? No, not while I have vampires after me. I want you to go home, and from now on you don't leave your house after dark. If your mom starts giving you trouble, you call me, but you do not leave your house. Got it? She nodded as she held fast to my hand. Together the three of us walked to her house, while I constantly searched every shadow we passed for a sign of Draven or Shane. He might have said he wanted a truce, but why would I believe him? Why did I believe half of what he told me? I didn't, at least not all of it. And not fully. All this time, I believed Draven was one of Rudarius's most trusted vampires. When he started talking tonight, claiming he wanted the vampire dead, I was ready to laugh in his face, except for the conviction in his eyes. He said he wanted revenge and I felt it, his raw anger and need for it. As much as I fought it in myself, the notion of revenge had me smiling, until I caught Owen eyeing me suspiciously. I forced the smile away and focused on getting Lexi home safe and sound. Once we delivered her to her door and I heard it lock, Owen and I changed direction and headed home. The entire way, I waited for the barrage of questions but they never came. He growled under his breath instead. Inside I unarmed myself and stood in the kitchen, mind a mess, as I worked on understanding what occurred tonight. Did you finish him off? What? I asked, only half hearing Owen's question. Draven, from what Lexi described he was there. Is he dead? He was there but he's not dead. Not yet. Why not? I ran my hands through my hair, messing it up as I attempted to think of what to say. It's complicated. And that means what exactly? It means he got away for now. He just wanted to talk. Those words sounded ridiculous even to me, but it was the truth oddly enough. About what? Why did they kidnap Lexi? So many questions. This was one of those moments I wished Owen was in Valesque, working, so I wouldn't have to stand here and explain every detail to him. Or lie to him. Since I was not about to tell him what Draven told me. He wanted me to talk to Owen about what was happening in Otherworld. The missing mages bothered me more than any other part of that conversation. If Macron had indeed gone missing, and not just up and left on his own, and if Owen knew about it, why wouldn't he tell me? There was someone else I needed to speak with first, before I tore into him about lying to me. He wanted to get to me, I said, keeping it simple. So he could talk to you. That doesn't sound like the Draven who was trying to kill you. It doesn't, but all he did was warn me about staying away from the coven or there'd be consequences. Yeah, that sounded good enough. Seems like a lot of trouble to go through simply to warn you. It does but he's not exactly all there. I'm going to shower then go to sleep. Seneca, are you telling me everything? He asked, catching my hand when I walked past him. 
I squeezed his hand and gave him the brightest smile I could muster. I am. I stood on my toes and kissed his cheek. Promise. My gut clenched at the lie, but I would get to the rest of my conversation with Draven tomorrow. I hopped in the shower and made my plan for the morning as the water washed over me, doing nothing at all to soothe my anxiety about everything Draven told me. There was only one person that might be able to tell me if he was being truthful or not. Well now, this is a surprise, Minnie said as soon as she opened her front door. I know, and I'm sorry about the other day, but I need your help. I held out a bag of scones from the cafe, as well as a tray of coffees. I come bearing gifts. She sniffed the air and sighed happily. You're lucky I have a sweet tooth. I grinned as she waved me inside then closed the door. Do you know why I'm here? How many times do I have to remind you? Seer not psychic. Though I do sense the agitation in your voice. Is there trouble with Owen? She asked as she easily maneuvered around her home and sat down on the couch. I took the chair opposite, setting out the scones and coffee. I'll take your silence for a yes. It's true but he's not why I came here. Oh come on, you can't say that and then not give me the juicy details. Is he driving you crazy? Crazy doesn't begin to cover it. Knowing she'd be more likely to answer my other questions, if I gave her a bit of gossip, I told her all about my trip to Velesque with Owen. And our recent fights. When I mentioned his being overprotective, she nodded knowingly. What? He's a demon. They're always protective of ones they love. That's not an excuse. No, you're right, but it's built into his DNA. Don't be too hard on him, though I must say he is more stubborn than any other demon I've met. And the following you around thing can get annoying. He's the good guy, I said quietly, picking apart a scone that I no longer had an appetite for. If he keeps getting involved so deep with what I'm doing, I don't know. You want him to stay the good guy. It's admirable, but he's an adult. As are you. He'll either figure it out or he won't, but you can't force him to decide. Even if it might save his life. Her hand paused with her scone halfway to her mouth. And there's the real reason you came to see me. What else has transpired in your life, Seneca? I sense you're bleaker than you were when we spoke last. Then I was just dealing with nightmares. And now? Now the nightmares have come to life in a very different way. I shoved the ruined scone aside and sat back in the chair. I had a very interesting conversation with Draven. I slipped off one of my phi rings and set it on the table. Minnie tilted her head at the sound, her hand finding it quick enough. What do you know about these rings? She dropped it in her palm, then closed her fingers around it. I know they are certainly rarer than they have been in past few centuries. Who wears them? Last I heard only royals and those of noble bloodlines had rings, though the royals bore a sigil on theirs. She opened her palm and ran her fingers along the band. A sigil much like the one your ring bears. I knew what she talked about, but Macron never told me anything about the rings. The day he gave them to me, he simply said they had been in his keeping since my parents passed. I never questioned how or why. Too much shit had happened to me at that point to care. They were my mother's, and that was the only thing that mattered. And if I have them, if I can use them, what does that mean? The most the rings had ever done for me was to throw someone away from me. It was helpful, but nothing extraordinary as Draven seemed to believe. What did the vampire tell you? He said those with rings were powerful, very powerful. My magic though, it's never been my best asset. Yet, she corrected. You are young Seneca, very young. In a world of monsters and the supernatural. If I wanted to pay heed to her notions, it sounded as though she was telling me sometime in the future, I would be displaying power much like Draven described. He seemed to believe I was more than a normal phi, and it had nothing to do with being bitten by a vampire. I told you once before, darkness was on the horizon. Minnie held out my ring. It draws closer every day. Would that darkness happen to be in the form of Rudarius? 
I took my ring back and slipped it on my finger. Or him wanting to start a war against other world. I know you don't like to hear it, but I cannot tell you. Surprise, I muttered. Minnie scowled at me, her blind eyes eerily focusing as if she could in fact see. I tell you what you need to hear, Seneca, so do not take that tone with me. You are integral to all of our survival in the coming storm. I fear for you. I fear for your very being. The closer you get to the truth, the harsher your world will become. The seed of evil is already within you, and that monster of a vampire exposed it. Made it grow. He wanted you to turn so he could use you, manipulate you. You may have been rescued physically by Macron that day, but that seed remains. All it needs is the right motivation to sprout and grow, to strangle the good. Evil? I asked, alarmed. I'm not. I mean, I know I can be a bit bad, but I'm not. I'm not evil. What seed are you talking about? What was she saying, that I was born evil? No one was born evil, right? I see several paths for your future, she said earnestly. There is no clear vision which one you will take. Every decision you make shifts the paths. And Draven? Do you see him in my future? She shut her eyes and let out a heavy breath. The air crackled with her power, and her nails dug into the cushions. When her back went rigid I rushed to her shaking her shoulders, but then she shook out her head and patted my hand. Draven is indeed part of your future, in more ways than one. He will either become your ally or your enemy, but I'm afraid even those two choices are shrouded in fog. His is a tormented soul. Not unlike you. She patted my hand again, pulling me down so her blind eyes looked into my green ones. You must tread carefully now, so carefully. Do not act rashly no matter what you learn. I can't promise that. I know, but I had to say it anyway. Realizing there was nothing else helpful she could tell me, I thanked her for the advice and made to go. If she was right, and if what Draven hinted at was true, then I was not just a normal phi. My parents weren't normal phi. They were royals. It couldn't be true. If they were royals and if I was too, why didn't anyone come for me after my parents were killed? Or when Macron saved me from Rudarius? Or even after, when I was turned into a vampire? Whatever I was, royal wasn't it. No one from the Phi world gave a shit about me, and the only family I had was dead. As I walked back to the cottage, I studied the rings on my hand. Why would Macron give them to me if they weren't really my mother's? Why hadn't he just told me the truth? With every step I took, my anger grew, until I was seething about everything I hadn't known about myself. Minnie's mention of having a seed of evil in me, only infuriated me more. I'd done some shitty things in my life, I knew that, but evil was such a harsh word. Rudarius was evil. The vampire who attacked me was evil. But me? He told me several times while torturing me he would stop, if only I would give in. Vaguely, I recalled his saying I could be invincible if I gave in to him. Right before Macron came for me, I'd been close so close to agreeing if only the pain would stop. Evil. I pressed my hand to my chest, as if I could feel this seed buried within my soul, find it and rip it out. I would just have to do as Minnie said, be careful not to let myself fall completely over that line and into the darkness. I found myself in the garden without knowing how I got there. The orbs shimmered red and orange as they surrounded me. I was anxious. My hands clenched and unclenched, replaying the conversation I had with Draven. Then the arguments with Owen. And seeing Macron everywhere. All this shit from my past being dragged out into the open again. Every scar on my body ached with remembrance and set my teeth on edge. Never had I felt this way before, and I didn't like it, but had no idea how to get out of this darkening mood. Rudarius. He was my main problem, and if Draven said he wanted to kill him, maybe it was time to hear him out, if only so I could get my revenge. Seneca? Where have you been? Owen asked as he joined me in the garden. Went out for a walk this morning. You left your cell here. I was about to go out looking for you. 
as I said just took a walk. Everything's just fine. You don't sound fine, he argued walking around until he faced me. He hesitated when he finally laid eyes on me. Did I miss something? No but I think I did, I said slowly. When I ask you over and over again if anything's happening in other world, and you tell me no, are you lying to protect me, or because you actually can't tell me the truth? His face went completely blank. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't lie, I hissed, losing my tight rein on my anger. I told you days ago I saw Macron, that I believed he was alive and in trouble. And I told you it's probably nothing. You're lying. You just don't want me putting myself any closer to whatever the hell is happening in other world. Macron isn't the only mage missing, is he? When he didn't say anything, I laughed harshly. All this time you've been lying to me. You knew Macron was alive. I never said that, he muttered. But you knew something about them? I asked in disbelief, but he was shaking his head. Tell me the truth. I have, he snapped. If you needed to know, I would tell you. Missing mages sounds important to me. There are no missing mages. Why are you even asking me these questions? Who did you go see this morning? No one important. Seneca. I crossed my arms and kept my gaze steady. It was nothing to do with you. Is that right? Yeah it is. And what were you asking about? Does that have anything to do with your conversation with Draven? The one you're not telling me the whole truth about. You don't get to stand there and call me out for lying when you've been doing it too. He raised his hands, growling furiously, then stomped around me toward the door. Where are you going? We're not finished talking about this. I am, since there's nothing to talk about. I'll see you tomorrow when you're finished acting like I'm the enemy here, instead of Draven. Then he was gone. The garden that had been filled with our yelling voices moments before was now uncomfortably quiet. I went into the cottage, and I looked at the door for a long while, waiting for Owen to come back, but as the minutes ticked by, I realized he was serious about staying away. Good, that was good. Maybe we needed some time apart. His month was nearly up, and all we'd done was bicker with one another since we came home from Valesque. Too much was going on for me to sort out all the raw and confused emotions. The issue with Draven should have been clear-cut. Spy on him, get the intel and hand it over to the feds. What did I do instead? Found myself questioning who I was, all because of that rotten sleazeball of a bloodsucker. Why was I even bothering listening to a damned word he said? If Rudarius was really kidnapping mages and was preparing to start a war, Someone in Otherworld would have noticed. When did you get so stupid? I muttered to myself. Draven was playing me for a fool and nothing more. He realized I was better than him, could kill him if I wanted to, so he came to me with this story about missing mages and taking on Rudarius to get me off his back. Made me start asking questions of Owen that would tear us apart. Granted the two of us hadn't gotten along the greatest, and it was mostly my fault, but I never doubted our relationship so much until Draven got involved. Owen was right. I let Rudarius and every vampire connected to him drag me down and disrupt my life. All it took was a couple of weeks for me to spiral out of control and to start to think there was some huge plot. Rudarius was evil, that I was certain of, but as far as I knew, so was Draven. I texted Owen that I was sorry, but if he wanted to stay away tonight, I would understand. I wasn't going to go through my entire explanation through text, so wandered around the cottage, cleaning and picking up. Usually, I kept the place neater than this, and it bothered me I let it get so messy. Eventually, I found myself in the garden again. With every weed I yanked from the dirt, I cursed my gullibility even more. Even Minnie had me going. She might be a seer but they were known to be wrong more than they were ever right. I let myself get caught up in the madness that was once my life, instead of remembering my job. Remembering where I belonged and where I was happy. My hands dug deeper into the earth, relaxing me and clearing my clouded mind. Seeing Macron, 
could even be explained away by my overactive imagination kicking in. By the time I finished with the rose bed and moved onto the wildflowers, I was pissed at myself. I was better than this. It was how I survived the past few years on my own, by seeing through the lies the bad guys told me. Sweat covered my face and I wiped at it, getting dirt everywhere. I scooted down the line of beds and dug around the base of an overgrown thorn bush that had cropped up in my garden. Never had I torn out so many weeds. Not until the feds set me on Draven. I cursed and grunted as I yanked on the bush, attempting to wrench it from the ground. I pulled until my arms hurt, and I clenched my jaw so hard I expected my teeth to crack. The roots suddenly snapped, and with a yelp I went sailing backward but never hit the ground. Two strong arms caught me, and together Owen and I hit the grass. I tilted my head back, looking up into his amused face. Did you get in a fight with the bush? I realized I was holding said bush and shrugged. You know me, picking fights with anything and everything including you. Seneca. No, let me get this out, I said cutting him off. I know I'm not the easiest person to get along with, and I do tend to wallow in the past. For some reason I don't understand, I wanted there to be a reason, I guess, for all the suffering I endured. I tossed the bush aside and turned all the way around so I could look him in the eyes. Taking the case on Draven was a bad idea. You're right. I've let myself be taken in, and I'm slipping back into the past. He reached for my hands and kissed them both with a sigh. I'll stop you from slipping too far, he promised. But you have to talk to me when you feel your world coming apart. I'm not good at that part. Trust me, I know, he replied with a light laugh. We're young, Seneca. Extremely young, considering what we are. You have all the time you need to find a way to move on. Telling the feds to piss off on the Draven case might be a good step. Yeah, might be, he agreed. You want me to take care of it for you? No, I can handle them. If they decide to come after me though, then I might need your help. He kissed my forehead. You have it. Always. You know I can't promise that I'm going to be able to change, I mumbled, resting my head on his shoulder. I'm not a good person. I'm not sure I can be any more. We'll work on it. First, I think I should help you with this garden before you get into a fight you can't win, he said with a wink as he helped me to my feet. When we were up, the urge to be close to him struck me hard, and I wrapped my arms around his waist. I'm sorry for doing this to you. You can hate me if you want, you know. Don't hate you, he assured me, hugging me back just as hard. Worry about you, is all. About us, but we'll get through this like we always do. I believed him. Or I tried to. We worked side by side in the garden for the rest of the day, with me shoving any more worries about Draven or Macron or the rings on my fingers aside. None of it mattered. If I was from some supposedly royal bloodline, no Fi cared enough about me to tell me or to come find me. I owed them nothing. That night as we turned in for bed, I took off my rings and laid them in the small wooden keepsake box on my dresser. The weight being gone was odd, but at the same time I felt lighter. The magic always coursing through my veins quieted down, though it was there with me all the same. You all right? Owen asked. Yeah, I said with a smile. Yeah, I feel pretty good. I climbed into bed more relaxed than I had been in weeks. I was walking through my garden. The sun shone overhead, and a warm breeze rustled the leaves of bushes around me. I glanced about, but my cottage wasn't here. That wasn't right. I spun, searching for it, but then the garden shimmered and vanished altogether. What took its place was dead and smoldering, as if the fires only recently died down. Owen, I yelled, worry growing in my gut. Owen. He's not here. The sound of that voice made my breath catch and my feet froze in place. Macron. Seneca. I blinked, and he stood before me, but he did not look like the same mage who walked out on me years ago. His hair was longer, and a matted beard covered his face. His eyes were hazy, and there were fresh wounds on his arms covering scars I knew hadn't been there before. He seemed weak, as if he could barely keep himself upright. This isn't real. This? 
He raised his hands. This is real. What? No. This is a nightmare. I'm afraid not. War is coming, and you must be ready for it. Or with who? I asked, a nagging feeling telling me I already knew. Rudarius. If you cannot find a way to stop him, what happened here will happen to all of Otherworld. Where is here? This had to be a nightmare. Had to be. This was one of the seven houses where we mages used to come to gather and train, he told me sadly. Now it's nothing but scorched ground and ruins. The vampires have overrun it, and I hear rumors in the cells of Rudarius finding a weapon. A fi weapon. The rings, I told him quietly. He's found a way to use the rings. He hesitated, a frown wrinkling his forehead. Seneca, it's time you remember who you are. What is that supposed to mean? Why does everyone keep telling me that? Just listen to me, he said gravely, grabbing my shoulders hard enough to hurt. You must stay in the human realm and do everything you can to stop the war. Whatever you do, do not enter other world. Do you understand me? He cannot get his hands on you. Not again. Is that where you are? You can't come after me. Just save them. Save as many as you can before it's too late. How long since you were captured? He wavered, but I asked him again. How long? Six years. And the year before. The day you up and left me without a word, what were you doing? I asked, furious. What was so important you decided to leave me? Do you have any idea what I went through after that? I do, which is why I had to come to you this way. He reached for me, but I stepped back out of his reach. I left to protect you. When I heard you were turned, it killed me, but you must understand. Heard, you knew I'd been turned. Rumors spread, he said simply. Everything that's happened is for a reason. There is much you don't know and I have no time to explain it all. Stopping this war from entering the human realm is what you need to do now. He frowned as he glanced at my hands. Your mother's rings, where are they? I took them off, I said, rubbing my naked fingers self-consciously. You must keep them with you at all times. Do you understand me? I began to answer but had to stop, gasping for breath. The air grew heavy, and it was hard to get any in my lungs. What's happening? Our time is up. They're coming, and I can't be found contacting you. Remember what I said. This is a nightmare, I insisted. Nothing else? Is it? He took firm hold of my hand. Remember my words, Seneca. Your life is about to change forever. Do not turn away from who you truly are. From your destiny. You must find the one who is meant to help you. Find him. What destiny? Find who? I gasped when my hand grew hot. Macron? But he was gone, and the world around me fell away into nothing. I sat up with a curse. Owen snored lightly beside me, and I rubbed my hands down my face, ready to go back to sleep. Ah! I gasped when my right hand touched my face. I pulled it back, squinting in the darkness, but it was too dark to see. Careful not to wake Owen, I got out of bed and tiptoed to the bathroom. Once the door was closed, I turned on the light. What the hell is that? On my palm was a brand, as if it had been burned into my palm. As soon as I saw it, I knew what it was. The sigil from my rings. The nightmare hadn't been a nightmare at all. Macron everything he said. I looked at my reflection in disbelief. So much for convincing myself Draven was wrong. I had to find out what was happening in Otherworld. Agent Williams. He would know. He'd have to. Maybe it was why they had me going after Draven, to begin with. When morning rolled around, I'd call him first. If he didn't give me the answers I needed, then I'd have to take more drastic measures. One way or another, I was getting to the truth. Chapter 11 Seneca Asshole, I yelled as Agent Williams hung up on me. As soon as I woke up, I wanted to call him but didn't want Owen to overhear. Bad enough, 
I had to find an excuse to cover up the brand macaron burned into my palm. I claimed I'd cut it slicing up steak for breakfast. Owen bought the lie and had hopped in the shower. That was when I called Williams, but the second I mentioned war and Rudarius, he told me to stop digging around for a conspiracy and do my job. When I shifted gears and asked about Macron or any other mages, he muttered something under his breath about politicians with big mouths, talking around their bodyguards, and then proceeded to hang up on me. I glowered at my cell on the kitchen counter as Williams's words rang through my head again. Politicians and bodyguards. Shit, I whispered realizing what he must think. Owen. He thought Owen told me about Macron, which meant Owen had lied to me. And that there was someone else who would be able to answer my questions. The only issue with that was I would not be granted a meeting with the demon ambassador simply because I was Owen's girlfriend. However, with Owen's badge, I could gain access to the building. The water was running in the shower as I crept into the bedroom, then dug around in his pants. When I found his wallet, I pulled out his security badge and shoved it in my back pocket. Hey, Owen? I said as I opened the bathroom door, thinking up a lie as I went. Lexi called. She wants to meet me for breakfast. Can we catch up for lunch at the diner? If you want, yeah. She all right? He poked his head around the curtain. Think she was having a nightmare, sounded a bit shaky. Want me to come with you? Nah, we're going to have some girl time. Might take her for a manicure or something. His brow arched, and I mentally kicked myself as I kept on smiling. Manicure. I never had a manicure in my life. If you're sure. I'll see you for lunch then. I waved at him and left the cottage in a hurry. I had to get to Valesque, sneak into the embassy building, and pray no one stopped me before I could get to the ambassador and ask him why no one was reporting missing mages, or why the feds seemed to believe he would know anything about it in the first place. It wasn't the best plan in the world. I admitted it to myself quite a few times on my way to town, but there was no turning back. If I was being lied to, it was time I found out why. Technically speaking, only a demon could open a portal to Valesque. However, if one knew where a demon had recently, say within the last month opened such a doorway and had enough magic, he or she could open the same doorway by force. I'd put my rings back on when I'd awoken in the middle of the night, after I found the brand on my palm. They glimmered now as I stopped near the place Owen had come out of the night the vampires threatened me. If I used the one in my garden he opened when we visited his family, I knew he'd feel it and come running. So therefore it had to be this one. Work for me, I whispered as I reached out, sensing Owen's magic. The hairs on my arm rose as my rings glowed brighter. I shifted to my right, and they dulled, so I moved back to my left and didn't stop until they were glowing solidly. I pictured the doorway in my mind, the flames that came with it, then twisted my hand. Ever so slowly, an opening appeared and stretched outward with each turn of my hand. Finally, I stood before a doorway to Valesque. With a final glance around to ensure no one saw me, I hopped through. It shut immediately behind me with a loud pop. A demon or two passing by gave me a curious look, but didn't start shouting in panic. I took a moment to get my bearings, and thanked my luck that Owen had come back to the human realm, using a portal two blocks away from the embassy building the ambassador resided in. Keeping my pace as normal as possible, I walked down the sidewalk and through the large open courtyard between all the capital buildings. It was early here too. Demons were on their way to work, talking and laughing, or drinking their coffee and checking their phones. It was almost identical to the human world, except oddly enough, the demons weren't as rude. When I reached the embassy building, I held up Owen's badge, not showing his face, only enough for them to see the symbol. I would have to swipe it once inside. I'd seen him do it a couple of times, and he told me often enough about how much of a pain in the ass it was when the system went down. Though it was magic and not computers, it could have difficulties depending on the way the wind blew. I got inside the doors then paused. Getting through the next checkpoint was going to be impossible. Owen's face would pop up with the badge, 
and I did not look like him at all. A crowd of people bustled in behind me. Not employees. Tourists. Grinning, I slipped into their group, ignoring the words the tour guide was reciting as she led them, now us, closer to the checkpoint. They would be permitted to go through with a group pass, but would only have access to the first floor. I had to get all the way to the top. It was a start though, and I took it. Holding my breath, I passed through the checkpoint with the group then slipped to the side, down another passage. Owen had given me a private tour one time, without the ambassador knowing of course. I was a hired gun. No one would want me to know the layout of the building, in case someone ever hired me to off the ambassador, which I probably wouldn't do. Maybe. Right now, it wavered as to whether or not I liked him still. Halt, a voice yelled, and I froze. You. Where's your badge? I held up Owen's badge, cursing myself for getting distracted. On my way up. 2. The Ambassador. The demon's brow shot up as he looked at my face, obviously lacking horns, then down at my bare feet. You're fi. I am, I said, thankful he hadn't noticed the fangs in my mouth yet. Problem? When did the ambassador get a fi on his detail? I hadn't wanted to resort to my vampire abilities, simply because I loathed them, and because my hypnotism was not as strong as a regular vampire's. It wore off extremely fast. Now it seemed it was my only option. I shut my eyes, focusing on what I needed from this demon, then opened them. His mouth went slack, and the hand that had been reaching for his sidearm fell limp at his side. You are going to take me straight to the ambassador's office. I have a very important meeting. You will not let anyone else stop us. The demon nodded. He blinked a couple of times when I pulled the control back and glanced around. Ah yes, shall we continue on to see the ambassador then? Thank you that would be most helpful, I said brightly and let him lead on. The demon did as I asked, and we walked through the embassy, him telling me all about the portraits we passed and the history of the building. I let him carry on. When we passed the first guard, I tensed, but the demons merely nodded to each other and we walked down the hall. The next guard glanced at me suspiciously, but whoever I put the mind control on seemed to have some pull in this building, and no one stopped him to ask who I was. By the time we entered the hall that I knew ended at the ambassador's doors, I grinned, thinking this plan might work. Until the two guards at the door spotted us. What's she doing up here? The large demon on the right asked. Taking her to see the ambassador. She has an appointment. Both demons frowned. No one's seeing him today the first said again. Roger, you feeling all right? The demon I thought I had control over held his head, as if struck with a sudden headache. Any second now he was going to realize what I'd done, and I had no time for that. Not being able to carry any weapons with me, I resorted to my vampiric speed and strength. I grabbed hold of Roger and chucked him into the two others, then leaped over the pile of demons, sprinting toward the doors. A hand reached out and snatched my ankle, taking me to the floor, but I rolled and kicked the demon in the face. He slammed into the wall, cursing as he held his bleeding mouth. Intruder, he shouted when I hissed at him. Shit, it's Seneca. Damn it. Why did I have to be the only part fi, part vampire? I lunged at him with my fist, decking him as hard as I could, but as strong as I was, demons were very large and hard to take down. On the third hit, he finally slumped to the floor, but the other two were finding their feet and yelling. With no time left, I dove for the doors and burst through. What the hell? The ambassador yelled in alarm. Who are you? I slammed and locked the doors behind me, pressing my back to them as his guards beat against them on the other side. Ambassador, you and I need to have a word. You! The demon with sharp gray eyes snapped, pointing a finger at me. You're Seneca. That would be me, sir. Drop the sirs. If you're here to kill me, let's get this over with. I have work to do today. I'm not here for a fight. He moved out from behind his desk, striking a formidable pose. I have a question, and it needs to be answered, and Owen seems incapable of breaking his orders to keep quiet. The demons hollered through the other side of the door, 
asking for their ambassador. You should really let them through, he commented. He took a step toward me, until I held out my hand with the rings on it. They hummed with power. He paused. What do you want from me? Like I said, answers. Why do the feds seem to think you know about mages going missing in other world? The demons on the other side heaved as one, and the doors groaned, threatening to give way. I slammed myself back into them, but they were too strong. Any second now, they were going to bust through. The ambassador's eyes narrowed. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. Owen's been lying to me this whole time. Everyone has. What's happening in other world? I'm sorry, my girl, but you are sadly mistaken, and now I fear it will cost you dearly. The doors cracked behind me, and I turned to try and brace them. The ambassador snarled ferociously, and something heavy slammed into the back of my head. I slumped to the floor as the room went dark. The next thing I heard was Owen's voice, and I wondered what I was doing lying on a couch. This is unacceptable. How did she get your badge? I don't know, sir. I'm sorry, Owen replied in a rush. She must have swiped it from me. She managed to get all the way to my office. Do you have any idea how bad this looks for you? What if she hadn't come here asking questions and had wanted to kill me? Granted, she's a small spit of a thing, but I do not want to have to kill someone in my office. I smiled as my eyes fluttered open, head throbbing. Yeah, I think I could take you, I grunted. Ouch damn, what did you hit me with? Seneca? Owen hurried to me, helping me sit up, but he was far from happy. What were you doing? Have you completely lost your mind? I tore myself from his grip. No, you all have. Mages, I want to know about them right now. This again? He sighed, rubbing a hand down his strained face. I've told you there are no mages missing. Nothing is happening in other world. Oh no. I tore the bandage from my hand and shoved my palm in his face. Then why is Macron coming to me and telling me there's a war coming? Why did he brand my hand? Owen took hold of the hand in question, studying it closely. The ambassador peered over his shoulder, but his angry face gave nothing away. I didn't come here to kill him, but I need to know. Owen released my hand, a strange look coming over his face as he glanced to the ambassador. I'm afraid Seneca may be in need of help, the ambassador said solemnly. Help? I frowned. Then my brow shot up as I staggered away from them both. You mean mental help? I'm not crazy. I know what I've seen. Seneca, please, Owen begged, coming toward me. Do you have any idea what you've done here? You're going to be banished from Valesque for this. For life. I don't care. I'm not crazy. There are no missing mages, the ambassador shouted. None. I opened my mouth to argue with him when the doors burst open and a demon rushed in out of breath, holding a paper in his hand. Ambassador, two more have gone missing and another house has fallen in Otherworld. The mages. They are, they are calling for aid. The ambassador had been waving his hand, as Owen cursed quietly under his breath. I looked at them each in turn, as a dangerous smile spread across my face. You were saying, Ambassador? How about we have that talk now? Chapter 12. Draven. I had been in my chambers, wondering if I'd read Seneca wrong when I received the text. All it said was, she wanted to meet me again at the farmhouse, and to get there as soon as the sun had set. She made no indication of what she wanted to talk to me about, and Shane protested my going alone, but that was one of Seneca's conditions. If she was my chance at killing Rudarius and getting out of this shit show, I would go alone. She might have almost killed me once before, but I was prepared for her this time. I had two iron daggers sheathed at my hips. If she wanted a fight, she'd be getting one hell of a showdown. When I reached the farmhouse, I sniffed the air outside, catching a hint of Fi and Vampire, but no one else. Seneca was here and was alone. I had told Shane before I left if she did attempt to kill me or refuse to help me, I would be coming back with her whether she liked it or not. 
He'd prepared a small safe house far enough away from the mansion that Lacey wouldn't find it. A place to keep our secret weapon out of sight. I stepped up to the front door and pushed it open to find Seneca pacing back and forth in the living room, candles lit all around her. She barely stilled long enough to nod at me as I entered. No glaring, no insults. She continued her pacing. If she had boots on, I'd have said she would have created a rut in the floorboards by now. You wanted to meet, I said after a couple minutes of watching her. I'm assuming you've come to a decision. Almost. She stopped short. I need you to be honest with me first. Why should I do that? Because of these. She held up her ring fingers. You're asking me to trust you and believe you, but I have to know this isn't a trap. That you aren't dragging me back to Rudarius, because if you are, I will gut you here and now. Got it. Got it, but I'm not working for him. Then why not? You're part of his coven. One of his closest subordinates. I snarled at the word. Her brow arched, but there was no fear in her eyes. I am not, I see, through clenched teeth. He has stolen much from me, as I told you before. No. No more broad sweeping explanations. I want specifics. What did he do to you? I crossed my arms. No. No. Something changed since our last meeting. You tell me what, and I'll tell you everything you want to know about me and Rude Arius. I waited for her to walk out at my demand, but she pressed her thumb into her opposite palm, eyes taking on a haunted look that told me whatever she found out, whatever she saw, was worse than she thought before. The mages. I found out they are, in fact, missing, but it's worse than that. That would be news to me. How? She studied me long and hard, then said, The mage who rescued me came to me in a dream. He showed me what was left of one of their gathering spaces. Rudarius had it obliterated, and it wasn't the only place. Five out of seven houses of mages have been decimated. The mages are either dead, barely got away with their lives, or were taken by vampires. It would appear Rudarius is already well prepared to start a war against Otherworld and no one seems to care enough to stop him. How did you find all this out? Part from the mage and the rest from the demon ambassador. You spoke directly to him. I asked surprised. Didn't give him much of a choice. Because of it, I'm banished from Velesk. Indefinitely. And Owen is pissed. She seemed to be fighting with herself on how to feel about it, and finally shrugged. Worth it, though. Got some answers. What's the ambassador doing about it? The demons are assisting the mages who managed to escape. That's all they would tell me. And the mage who came to you in a dream. I pushed. What did he tell you? Enough to make me question my entire life so far. She scratched irritably at her palm. He wants me to stop the war from the human realm. You don't seem happy with that answer. I said slowly. I'm not, she agreed. And I'm not happy that it appears you and I are going to be working together if you can convince me you truly want Rudarius dead. Spill. What did he do to you? Turn you. I hissed as I thought of what that piece of shit had done to me. No, I was turned two hundred years ago by a man who came to be my father, I explained quietly. He was head of the Bleeding Crown Coven and I was his heir. Her brow furrowed in the dim lighting. I've heard of that coven. Did you hear it was taken over by Rude Arius? I snarled. My rage over that night, coming out more and more, now that my chance at revenge was beginning to emerge. He slaughtered my family, including my father, because we were one of the few covens who stood against his reign over us all. I was taken captive and tortured in his dungeons for decades. I should have stopped talking right then. She had no need to hear anymore, but the words poured out as I realized that in all my years of living, I'd never told a soul what I was about to tell her. The need for her to hear the whole truth needled at me. No idea why, since no matter what she said, I would be using her to kill Rudarius. He broke me, 
I whispered, so quietly, she wouldn't have heard me if she wasn't part vampire. He made me believe I was evil, just like him. That I could only be loyal to him. That my father had committed atrocities that caused him to be executed. The air grew still, and the ruby on Seneca's ring glowed with power. Her eyes were fixed on the wall behind me. She was grinding her teeth as her skin paled. For a solid minute it was eerily quiet, then she gasped, and the sound was loud enough to hurt my ears. She was muttering under her breath about someone named Minnie, and then cursing someone else named Macron. Find him, it can't be. What's wrong? I asked, confused by her reaction and words. Many have been taken by Rude Arius. Including yourself. It's nothing, she replied hastily, though her face gave away that it wasn't nothing. There was a strange recognition as she looked back at me, like she was really seeing me for the first time. It confused me in more ways than one. At least now I understand your need for revenge. You believe me just like that. Her green gaze flickered to mine, and if I'd had a heartbeat, it would have stilled from the amount of agony and pent-up rage in that one look. Takes a broken person to know another broken person. You said he hurt you. You never said what he did. She sniffed hard. Doesn't matter. What does is, I believe you, and if you really do have a plan for stopping Rudarius, then I will join with you to kill him. You make it sound like the worst option out there, siding with me, I said with a sneer. You murder people for fun, she pointed out. I don't. I don't kill anyone for blood. I am not like you. Not yet, I said. She hissed in warning. If there is truly a war coming, you'll change your tune soon enough. We'll all have to. You think I'm so bad for what I've done. Just wait. Plan, she said stiffly. What is it? Your rings, I said, nodding to them. You have them because you're of royal blood. You have the power to call down sunlight. If we can get Rudarius alone, you can destroy him. That's it, she exclaimed. That's your plan. You're kidding, right? It's all I have so far. I'm being watched. I thought you said Rudarius trusted you. He does, but sadly he's not stupid. I am the son and heir to what was the rival coven to his. If I were to ever get enough support, enough power, I would become a viable threat. I walked toward her and she backed up so I stopped. Those rings are our one chance. You understand this plan of yours puts me and me alone at risk. I'll be the one in the line of fire. I bared fangs as I suggested, you could always give up your blood and I could use the rings. The words were barely out of my mouth when I was slammed into the far wall. She moved too fast for me to keep up with, and though she wasn't cutting off air, her hand closed in with those rings glowing fiercely, ready to unleash her magic. She opened her mouth wide, flashing fang as her eyes shimmered from green to red and back again, shifting from one side of who she was to the other. No vampire will ever use my blood again. Do you understand me? Rudarius, I whispered. He used you for dust. Her hand closed even tighter, and I went completely still. You have no idea what he did to me, and you never will. If I think for one second you're going to turn on me, you'll regret it. I don't care how old you are, I will rip your head off and go after Rudarius alone. You'd never get close enough. Is that a challenge? Desperate people can do quite extraordinary things. He's in other worlds surrounded by his coven, I reminded her. You need me. As she continued to hold me in her grasp, I searched her gaze for any hint of what she had gone through in those dungeons. It couldn't be any worse than what I suffered through, but the longer I looked, the more my heart sank and emotions I hadn't sensed in years sparked to life. She said she was broken like me, but that wasn't true. Rude Arius shattered whoever Seneca used to be, tore her apart, and set her soul on fire. If that demon of hers hadn't been in her life these last couple of years, this would be a very different woman standing before me. More dangerous. Darker. Evil. She suddenly released me as if she read my thoughts. Destiny. What? I asked confused. Nothing. 
Just something a seer told me about you. That caught my attention. What about me? Whether I like it or not, you and I are just getting started with each other. She spun the ruby ring around and around on her finger, contemplating. That it was destiny, I was turned into a vampire. And now it's my job to stop the war. Destiny. Who had she talked to? I did not see myself working with Seneca, except to kill Rudarius. The moment he was dead, I was finished with her. Done. Shane's words of simply taking her and being done with it came back to me. And I almost did in that split second. Knocked her over the head and made off with her into the night. Except my body refused to listen to my order to move. In nearly a hundred years, I thought I was alone in my plight and my suffering. And yet, here before me was a woman who understood exactly what I'd gone through. It was beyond curious, and like before, words slipped out of my mouth before I could stop them. If I found someone who could prove to you without a doubt that you are a royal and you can kill Rudarius, would you agree to this plan? Would it convince you that we're after the same end game? And who would be able to do that? Give me a couple of days, and I'll show you exactly who. Her brother. I nearly said her brother, but I'd kept it to myself. If she had no idea she was a royal, the chances of her knowing she had a brother were low. Normally, I wouldn't care if I hurt her more except her green eyes were so troubled, adding to her burden seemed cruel. I'll be in touch, I managed to get out, then turned around and blurred out of the farmhouse before I could say anything else that might get me in trouble. As I sprinted through the countryside toward the mansion, I replayed the conversation in my mind. It wasn't the words that passed between us I got hung up on. It was the way I acted around her. For years, I let myself be sucked into being the heartless killer Rudarius needed. He wanted someone gone, I dispatched them without question. I'd grown cold to the world and everyone in it. When Seneca staked me during our first fight, she ignited an anger in me and awoke a part of me I believed was gone for good. Once upon a time, I was a positive good soul. Rudarius saw that destroyed. Now maybe Seneca would bring that draven back. What would she want with a bloodsucker like you anyway? I muttered to the night. She might be part vampire, but being with one I assumed would never happen. Especially with that demon of hers hanging around. I scoffed, wondering if he truly understood the woman he was with. Chapter 13 Draven You want to do what? Shane demanded, as soon as I got him alone in my chambers. We don't have a choice, I argued, glancing worriedly at the door. Lacey saw me come back and though she hadn't stopped me to chat, I saw the look in her eyes. For the last couple of days, she'd been following me around, asking questions of all the guards, as well as Shane and Christian. Our time is running out. We need her on our side. We need her rings and her blood, he hissed. Why didn't you just take them? The draven I was forced to become would have done exactly that. Kidnapped Seneca without a thought, but I was exhausted from playing the carefree monster Rudarius turned me into. I wanted my old self back, and one way or another, Seneca was the way to do it. She said it herself. A seer saw our futures entwined somehow. Find him, that's what she'd been muttering under her breath. That him I sensed was me. I'd been waiting for a sign like this for far too long to miss out on my chance at revenge now, just because the path suddenly got hard. I'm doing this, I told Shane. You can either help me or stay here. What do you want to do? You're giving me a choice, he asked, confused. Why wouldn't I? You turned me, he said, as if I needed reminding. If you order me to come with you, I'll do it. I will never fail in my loyalty to you, so why are you asking me what I want? I sighed as I gripped his shoulder. I didn't ask you if you wanted to be a vampire. Well, no, he agreed slowly. I should have. I dragged you into this life because I was selfish. You're my friend Shane, the only one I've got, I confessed. I want us both out of this hell. But if you wish to stay and keep yourself safe and alive, 
Then I'll understand. He reached up and grabbed my arm. You sure you're feeling all right? Seneca didn't put some weird voodoo crap on you. She's fine, not a witch doctor, I said dryly. Yeah, well, I've never seen you act like this. It's weird. Give a guy a break. This is me. All me. I swear it to you. He backed away from me, pacing the length of my room once, twice, then halfway through the third time seemed to make up his mind. What do you need me to do? Lacey. You need to distract her, so I can get the five prints out of the mansion. And take him where? The safe house for now, I guess. Once we meet there, we'll wait a day and then move him to Madwich. Distract Lacey, he said, nodding. I can do that. She does think I have a thing for her. Don't get caught up in whatever shit you're about to pull, I warned. I'll need you for what comes next. And what will come next? That, my friend, is a damn good question. Sneaking the only prince in our custody out of the mansion without being spotted was going to be a pain in the ass. Not like we even had his ring to give back to him. Rudarius took it. I now regretted cutting off his hand, but if I hadn't done something, someone else would have. If it had been Lacey's call, the prince would have been tortured until he had no idea who he was. Getting him to trust me now was going to be impossible. Shane and I parted on the main floor, with me casually making my way toward the stairs leading to the lower levels, and him greeting Lacey loudly as he entered one of the parlors. I heard her say something in a disgusted tone, but Shane was resilient. She would not be able to get rid of him easily. Once below, I searched for Christian and breathed a sigh of relief when I spotted him at his post near the cells. Alone. I nodded and spoke with a few of the other vampires as I aimed toward Christian. I greeted him and then nodded for him to follow me out of hearing range. I need you to do me a favor, I whispered. Of course, sir. In three minutes exactly, I need you to pull the alarm. His mouth parted as he looked at me confused. The alarm. What for? To clear a path. And then I need you to keep the stairwell clear, allowing me to sneak something out of the mansion undetected. Can you do that? If you need me to. What are you taking out? Not what. I glanced down the rows of cells until my gaze landed on the one at the end. Who? No one can know, Christian. Three minutes exactly. He hesitated, like he wanted to argue, then nodded and returned to his post, checking his watch as he went. Once he was situated, I blurred to the end cell where the Phi Prince was chained up. He appeared paler, weaker. He could barely lift his head to glower at me as I reached for the lock on his cell door. What do you want? He muttered, his mouth moving lethargically over the words. Getting you out. Don't have much blood left. He managed to straighten more. I hope you all choke on it. Save the insults for later, I told him, unless you don't want to see your sister. She's here. He perked up immediately, pushing to his feet with a grunt. No, we're going to her. He watched me closely as I quietly opened the cell door then walked in and worked at the chains binding him. They were iron-made and had burned his skin at his wrist and ankles. I expected him to attack me at some point, but he stood perfectly still, as if expecting the same from me. This is a trick, he finally decided. Rudarius sent you here to trick me into telling you about Seneca. Not even close. Then what? You can't expect me to believe you're taking me to see her, after what you've done. He held up his handless arm. If I hadn't used an iron dagger on him, his hand would have eventually regenerated, but the iron ensured his hand would never come back. It had been beyond cruel, and the guilt piled on with all the rest I suffered under for my past actions. All in the name of Rudarius and my revenge. I am sorry for that, but you were right. I was? About me being in a cage. You were right. But Seneca is my way out. She can defeat Rudarius, but she doesn't trust me or believe me that she is royal. I need you to show her the truth. And then what? We all team up together, he asked sarcastically. 
Yes. My single word shut him up, and he peered over my shoulder. Where is she? A few hours away. I'm getting you to a safe house tonight. By tomorrow night, you'll be reunited with a sister who doesn't even remember you. I check my watch. Thirty seconds. You coming or what, Prince? His scowl said he didn't trust me, but his eyes held a sliver of hope that I was telling the truth. He bobbed his head and asked me how this was going to work. I held up my finger, watching the seconds tick by. When three minutes passed, an alarm rang out. Confused yells came from the vampires as Christian ordered them all out of the lower level. I waited for the last set of footsteps to fade away, then motioned the prince forward. What's your name, by the way? I asked over my shoulder. Marley, he told me. Interesting name. If you say so. He stumbled, and I caught his right arm, slung it over my shoulders, and helped hurry him along. Still don't trust you. Who said I trusted you or your sister? You're helping us. Correction, I'm helping myself through her and you, I pointed out bluntly. We all just happen to want the same bloody thing. Really, Lacey's voice rang out. I cursed as she appeared at the bottom of the stairs. Lacey, you should be evacuating, I told her, quickly coming up with a story she might buy. Not that anything useful came to mind at all. Should I be? I think I'll wait right here for our master to come, she hissed, her eyes flaring red as she bared her fangs. That way I can see how he tears you apart for betraying him. I told him you would turn on him. Told him, time and time again, but he never listened to me. You really think you can hold me here? I asked with a laugh. We both know I can beat you. She snapped her fingers, and three more vampires appeared behind her. You're a fool, Draven, which is sad considering how handsome you are. I wish you could have simply given up this silly quest for revenge. Wasn't I enough? You. I laughed harder and louder as her smile fell, and she hissed like a wild animal. You're nothing but a cold, heartless bitch. We all know who you want to be with. Pity he would never be with you. You cretin. Yeah, well, what can I say? Takes one to know one. Might I point out, Marley whispered, that we are outnumbered, and without my rings I am fairly useless being this weak. Don't worry, I have some friends here. I'm afraid not, Lacey commented and snapped her fingers a second time. Christian stood to her right with a stake in his hand aimed right at Shane's neck. The sight confused me until I caught the evil glint in Christian's eyes. Traitor, I snarled. If Marley wasn't so weak, I would have charged the vampire across the room. You're one to talk, he shot back. Turning on our master, as you have. He is not my master, I said as my rage rose. He is nothing but a murdering piece of trash, and I will see him dead. I'm afraid that's not going to happen, Lacey sighed, and I grow tired of this conversation. Guards take the prisoners to their cells to await Rudarius's arrival. He should be here within the hour. He might be, but we wouldn't. Was this part of the plan? Marley asked. Getting us killed. No. Now shut up. Lacey and her goons might think they had the upper hand, but I was older than all of them, except her. I was one of the best warriors in this coven, because I was a soldier all those years ago when my father turned me. A true fighter. These freshly turned vampires were nothing to me. I locked eyes with Shane, and he winked at me. I spied the hint of silver in his gloved hand, hiding and waiting for its moment to appear. Sneaky bastard. Knew there was a reason, I turned him. Can you run? Marley shot me a look. Really? Yes or no? I can try. I shoved him to my right, then blurred toward Lacey. I slammed into her with my full body weight, throwing her back into her goons. S. He screamed for them to attack, and they quickly found their feet, but it distracted Christian long enough for Shane to duck beneath the stake and drive his own into his captor's side. Christian yelled in pain, but Shane was too fast and jabbed him repeatedly until he was drenched in blood. I let them be and met the three goons attacking me. I blocked two hits to my face, 
but caught a third to my side that threw me off balance. A second jab struck my nose, and I hissed as I reached for the blades at my hips. I'd switched them out for my regular ones once I returned to the mansion. The silver blades glinted in the overhead lights as I lashed out, slashing and striking at the three vampires after I regained my footing. I rolled beneath a kick and sliced open the vampire's shins as I found my feet again, then spun around in time to meet a stake being driven toward my heart. I blocked it and knocked it with a hard strike of my dagger to the vampire's hand. It skittered away across the floor as I kept hold of the vampire. I drove one dagger home to his neck and the other his thigh. The vampires cursed and shouted as they fell away from me, leaving Lacey and one goon left standing. Shane yelled and threw himself at the goon taking him down for me. Lacey extended her claws as she approached, hissing furiously as she made ready to attack. A quick glance told me Marley was out of harm's way, but I didn't see him anywhere in sight. Great, the one person who could help me get Seneca on my side and he took off on me. Not sure what I expected, but it wasn't that. You will pay for this, Lacey threatened. She swung her arm down, her nails catching my cheek. I grabbed hold of her wrist and headbutted her. Not tonight I won't. You will never escape here. Not while I'm living. She shifted her feet, making ready to come at me again, when a strange sound made her stop. She frowned, glancing up and around. When the noise came again, I found myself doing the exact same thing, wondering what it was. Roasted vampire, anyone? Marley asked, holding a blowtorch in his right hand. Lacey tilted her head in confusion, but I smelled the gas and yelled for Shane to run. I blurred toward Marley, grabbed hold of his arm, and dragged him with me up the stairs as the gas hit the flame of the torch he left behind. Lacey was right behind us when the explosion rocked the mansion, and fire shot up with a roar. I spied Shane ahead of me as he bolted out the front door. I threw myself and Marley out after him, kicking it shut in Lacey's face. Her scream ripped through the night air as the vampires who had evacuated at the sound of the alarm stood on the grounds, looking on in shock and confusion. Lacey's wasn't the only shriek as fire tore through the mansion room by room. A second explosion shook the walls, and with a groan they collapsed, one after the other. Holy shit, Shane muttered. You're insane, I added, turning to Marley. And? And nothing, I said quietly, seeing more and more of Seneca in him. Somewhere inside her was the same craziness, waiting for a chance to be unleashed. If the two of them went after Rudarius, I would be more than happy to see it. We need to get out of here. I tugged on Shane's arm and Marley's, guiding them through the vampires. Many had rushed to the flames, trying to find a way inside to help those trapped. The screams followed us down the main drive and into the trees. When the adrenaline wore off, I grabbed Marley's arm and slung it over my shoulders again. You going to make it? Yeah, as long as neither one of you goes for my blood. Prefer to remain alive. Your blood's safe with us. My rings. What happened to them? Rudarius has at least one. I never saw the other one. You said you have to have them, to use your magic. Sadly, yes. Can't you make more? Shane asked. Marley planted his feet so hard we nearly toppled over. You can't just make more Phi rings. They were created centuries ago, by the first Phi. There are no new rings made every few years. The ones we have are passed down parent to child, and so on. Once they're gone, or tainted, he added with an angry shake of his head, that's it. They're finished. Your sister has three, I commented. Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. Marley nodded. They came from our family line, as did mine. We walked on through the night, aiming for the safe house in the woods. It was more of a shack, but it was good enough to keep us out of the sun for a day or two if need be. You're going to have to clarify for me why you aren't with your sister. I couldn't explain it, but why he wasn't with her bothered me. If he was her brother and they were royals, how was it she wound up on her own? Why do you care? You said it yourself, you're only using us, he said, not angrily, but with curiosity. I have my reasons. 
It was all I trusted myself to say, and was grateful he didn't ask me anything else. We reached the shack a couple hours later, with Marley carried over my shoulder, when his body finally gave out and he collapsed. I set him down inside as gently as I could, then shut and bolted the door. Shane closed the curtains for when the sun rose, and we sat down across from each other, each beside a window to keep an open ear out for anyone approaching. Ruderius is going to be pissed, he said with a dark grin. That crazy son of a bitch blew up the entire operation. Yeah. Shame we didn't think of it first. Think it'll slow him down at all? I wanted to say it would, but if Ruderius had nearly wiped out all the mage houses and acquired Phi Dust needed to activate the rings he stole, he could start his war in Otherworld any damn time he wanted to. No, I finally whispered. No, if anything, it's going to make him move up his plans. There's no hiding my plans now. May the bleeding crown rise again, Shane said sincerely as he crossed his arm over his chest. I mirrored him, then settled back against the hard wooden wall. The bleeding crown would return, or I'd die trying to see it restored. There was no other path for me. Chapter 14 Seneca I checked my cell again and grunted in annoyance. There'd been no news from Draven. Nothing. No news from Owen either. I hadn't seen him since I was thrown out of Valesque, through the portal, with him watching me as if I had in fact lost my mind. Too bad I hadn't. Mages were being attacked, and though the demons were doing their best to protect the ones who escaped Ruderius's wraith, they weren't openly calling him out for it. The ambassador claimed it was because the demons did not want a confrontation with the vampires, for political reasons. That was bullshit. The ambassador might be a tough-looking demon, but he was worried. Scared almost. And he should be. Ruderius was not just some simple vampire. He was old, very old, and now that he harnessed the power of the five rings it would be nearly impossible to stop him. I paced around the cottage again absently rearranging objects on tables and pieces of furniture, needing to keep my hands busy. I wanted to find Draven, but where would I go? He said he was bringing someone to me, to convince me. I'd racked my brain since he left me, but no one came to mind. Macron told me to find him. Now I wasn't sure if he meant find Draven, or find this other person the vampire would be bringing to me. Why can't anything be simple? I shouted the question to absolutely no one, as I stood in my living room. He's part of my destiny, but how? And why? Is this enjoyable to you all up there? I continued to rant. Find it funny to torment the rest of us down here? There was no answer from the universe. Not that I expected there to be. I hissed angrily as I went back to my pacing, when a heavy knock sounded at the front door. Owen would have just walked in. Cautiously, I approached and opened it a crack. Care to let us in? Draven asked, but he wasn't alone. Shane stood behind him, but I didn't care about the vampire. I frowned at the man between them, the man who looked half dead. Then I saw his pointed ears. No, not a man, a fi. I stepped back, opening the door wide enough for the three of them to get inside. The Phi was cursing as they helped him walk, then deposited him on the couch. I locked the front door. Damn Marley, think you could stand to lose a few pounds, Shane muttered, stretching his back. Marley? I repeated, looking at the Phi as he caught his breath. Who the hell is this? The person I brought to convince you, Draven informed me. Seeing Draven in my living room should have alarmed me, but neither he nor Shane gave off a dangerous vibe, not anymore. The Phi lifted his face, and a pair of intense green eyes looked right back at me. I flinched. They were the exact same color as mine. His hair was red, darker than mine, and he was missing his left hand. I was about to ask who he was again when his right hand reached out and touched my arm. A warmth spread from where his palm rested and my breath caught. Seneca, he whispered, eyes flooding with emotion. It's been too damned long, sister. Sister? I repeated numbly. What no, you you can't be. I don't have a brother. Yes you do, he assured me. 
You have an entire family waiting for you in Otherworld. I'm sorry it took me so long to find you. I don't. No. I backed away from him, running right into the coffee table. Draven snatched my arm to stop me from falling, but I yanked myself away from him too. What is this? You didn't think I suffered enough, so you're going to play this cruel joke on me? He's your brother, Draven said sternly. I blew up Rudarius's operation to get him out of the mansion, killed a good number of his coven. You have to accept the truth. Prove it. The Phi Marley got up with some effort and walked toward me. He reached out and took the hand Macron had branded. This sigil? It's from our house, Seneca. It's on the rings you wear. We are brother and sister. The room spun, and though I was breathing my lungs burned as if I was drowning. Learning the mages were being captured was one thing, but this? I couldn't deal with this. Not on top of everything else life decided to throw at me lately. I found myself staring at Draven, but his face was set. There was no hint of this being a lie in his eyes. Why? I managed to ask. Why don't I know about you? It's a very long and complicated story, Marley said, but then a key sounded in the front door lock and the door swung inward. Seneca, I have news. Owen trailed off as he stood in the doorway. Time seemed to slam to a screeching halt, as his gaze flickered from me to the two vampires and the phi in the living room. The air changed when his eyes narrowed in fury as he focused on Draven. Owen just wait a second, I said but too late. He roared and threw himself at the vampire. Draven and Owen went down in a heap, smashing into furniture and rolling around as their fists punched into each other's faces. I yelled for Shane to keep Marley out of the way and rushed in to break them up. Owen shoved me away, and I stumbled backward, landing on the couch with a grunt. He grabbed Draven and threw him into the kitchen. He landed on the table and broke it in two. Owen stop. He stalked after his prey, a look I'd never seen before in his eyes. You need to listen to me. Filthy bloodsucker, Owen growled as if he couldn't hear me at all. Draven sneered as he got to his feet, spitting blood from his mouth. You think you can beat me? I'll kill you, Owen seethed. No, you won't. I rushed in between them, but Owen shoved me away again then lunged at Draven. They tussled and punched, each getting in hits that had me wincing. When they crashed through the glass back door and landed in the garden, I cursed stubborn demons and blurred after them. I threw myself onto Owen's back, forcing him to let go of Draven to try and get me off. I held on tighter and shoved him to the grass, holding him there. Enough. What are you doing? He ranted, fighting to get up but I held my ringed hand in front of his face, the stones flaring to life. His eyes widened in disbelief then narrowed. You, what did he do to you? He's the enemy. Was, Draven chimed in. Not anymore, mate. You shut up, I snarled at Draven. Owen, please, you have to stop. He's not the bad guy. At least, not the one we need to worry about. He grunted as he pushed back, but I slammed him into the ground even harder. Just stop and listen to me. Rudarius has been attacking the mages because he wants to start a war against the Phi. He's using their rings. Draven wants to kill him as much as I do. He's here to help. You expect me to believe that? I expect you to trust me, I challenged and backed off so he could get up. Owen, look at me. I'm not under any mind control. This is me, and I'm telling you the truth. Macron and the other mages, we have to save them and stop Rudarius. Please. Owen wiped the blood from his face, and when he glared at me, there was only betrayal. It was worse than if he'd slapped me, but I stood my ground. I was not going to apologize for being right about seeing Macron. Or for not killing Draven when I had the chance. You're just going to trust him now, is that it? Owen asked quietly. I never said that. He needs my help to bring down Rudarius. We can end him. And then what? You don't think he'll turn on you? Kill you too? No, I don't, I said, and I wasn't the only one surprised by my words. Draven shuffled his feet, 
blinking furiously as if he was having an internal argument of his own. I continued, he attacked Rudarius's coven last night. And what? That makes it okay for what he's done? He's a killer. So am I, I emphasized each word and Owen took a step away from me. If that's what it takes to bring Rudarius down, then so be it. You're siding with the enemy, he argued. Am I? I shot back. You've been lying to me this whole time. Everyone has. The only one who hasn't is Draven. He's connected to my future, whether I want him to be or not. Owen's nostrils flared. What does that mean? Who have you been talking to? When I didn't answer, he scoffed. Minnie. You're listening to a seer? Over me? Really? That's what it's come down to? You lied to me, I hissed. How am I supposed to trust you, after you've lied to me about Macron and Rudarius? How? I was following orders. Yeah, orders. You keep telling yourself that. Why else wouldn't I tell you? He shouted, throwing his arms up. Why? Because you think I can't handle the truth, I yelled back also louder, my anger rising. You think I'm weak, that any second I'm going to fall apart. I'm tired of you thinking you need to protect me all the time. I'm not some fragile woman who wants to be rescued. This is who I am, Owen. The silence stretched out uncomfortably between us, until he finally bowed his head. If this is who you are, siding with the villain then I can't be around you. I won't watch you fall, and I won't let you drag me down with you. He stalked through the garden, and when he neared the edge he called back over his shoulder, you're on your own. I'm done. I waited for the pain to set in of his leaving me, but all that filled me was anger. Anger at him for not seeing the truth or trusting me. Anger at him not believing in me, like he said he did every damn day. He kept the truth from me, because he wanted to prove to me, that I could have a simple content life with him. I hissed into the darkness of the night. Seneca, Draven said quietly as he neared. What? My hands curled into fists, debating taking out some of my pent-up anger out on him. If you're going to fall apart, do it fast, he said without any emotion. Rudarius will know I've taken Marley. We don't have time to waste. I'm fine. I insisted and at the sound of crunching glass, turned to find Shane and Marley joining us in the garden. That demon Marley asked, who was he? I swallowed the lump in my throat. No one that matters now. What does matter is why the hell you weren't in my life. Who are we, and unless you want me to rip your throat out, you'll tell me the truth. Right now. I'm tired of being lied to. I am your brother, and right now that's all I can tell you. We have to get to Otherworld, warn them before it's too late. Rudarius will be making his move now that I've made mine, Draven said. I forced his hand. I know his plan. His coven will gather at his stronghold in Otherworld and prepare to fight. Is it daylight over there? I asked. It is but that won't stop him, Draven said. He can't call the night. He can, Marley argued. He has my rings one of which is able to summon shadows. He can make it night whenever he wants, as long as he wants. I glanced at my own rings. And what powers do mine have? Hopefully enough to stop Rudarius, Draven murmured. I said I wanted the truth, I said to Marley, ignoring the vampire. What do they do? I will tell you everything you need to know, but we must leave here. Macron told me to stop the war from the human realm, I argued, suddenly unsure of what I should do. I don't think I'm meant to be there. Macron? Marley asked, confused. He's the one who told me to come and find you. I don't understand why. What is he to you? Digging my thumb into my opposite palm, I glowered at the Phi supposed to be my brother. My family by blood. He's the reason I'm still alive. He's the reason I'm not still with Rudarius. The reason I wasn't turned into a weapon against our own kind. Yet. Minnie's warning about turning evil rang in my ears, but I pushed it down deep. I was not evil. I wasn't. I was pissed right now, yeah, 
but I was not about to turn on anyone here. Except for Owen. I'd attacked Owen to stop him from hurting Draven. If that wasn't messed up, I wasn't sure what was but there was no going back. I am sorry, Marley said gently, reaching for me, but I stepped out of his reach. You have every right to be furious with me. I wasn't there when I should have been. I was alone, I whispered. Alone in that dark dungeon being tortured for years. Where the hell were you, huh? Where? Seneca, now isn't the time, Draven said. I turned my glare to him and he sighed, shutting up. He brought this phi into my life. He would have to deal with the consequences. Where were you? I demanded again. In other world, Marley told me. I laughed darkly. He grimaced. You have to understand, it wasn't safe for you there. It wasn't safe for me to stay with my brother? Not just me, he said but shook his head. Please we don't have time for this. We'll make time. Who am I? You are Princess Seneca, Marley announced loudly. A princess of the Lower Kingdom. Burning Thorn, that is your family name. Yours and mine. We are royals, Seneca, and it is time for us to go home. I hadn't heard him right. Couldn't have. I was Seneca Savage. Savage. Not Burning Thorn. Princess? I was not a freaking princess. He limped toward me, and when I went to back away again he latched onto my wrist and my rings glowed with power. What are you doing? I snapped, fighting to get away, but he held on, a fierce determination in his eyes. Let me go. The same warmth I felt from him earlier flowed over and around me, as the light from the rings exploded outward in a swirl of blue, green and red. Draven and Shane were quickly surrounded by it too. Marley's grip tightened on my wrist so much it hurt. The light blinded me as my feet left the ground. We spun end over end, and I fought to get free but he held on. I waited to be sick as my stomach roiled, and then we hit something hard, falling in a heap to the ground. The grass was under my cheek, and I pushed up, wondering if we were still in my garden. But when I looked around, I cursed. Last I checked, I did not have a castle in place of my cottage. Wherever we were it was night, but there were no stars in the dark sky. No moon either, which seemed odd to me. Really odd. Torches surrounded the garden we'd landed in, leading down a path toward the castle. Shouts sounded, and then heavily armed men in armor converged on us, lances aimed at our faces. Draven hissed, pressing his back to mine as we looked down the guards. Vampires, the large guard before us said angrily. He was Phi, his shimmery blue and black translucent wings fluttered in agitation behind him. Why have you come? Who sent you to our realm? No one sent us here you halfwit, Draven snapped. Can you not piss off the heavily armed guards, I muttered through clenched teeth. What can I say, I get angry when I have silver spears aimed at my chest. It's all right Captain, Marley said, climbing unsteadily to his feet with Shane's help. Several of the guards muttered in surprise, then two rushed forward to aid him. They're with me. Prince Marley, where have you been? Finding someone we lost a long time ago. Lower your arms. Do it now. One by one, the guards listened to their prince. The Phi Marley referred to as captain, bowed his head as he stepped forward. We feared the worst prince. But why have you brought vampires here? The king and queen will not be pleased. They'll just have to hear me out then, because we need them. Hey, not all of us here are vampires, I muttered. The captain tilted his head as he studied my face. You are different, but you are a vampire. Who is this woman, prince? Marley made to answer when more shouts came from the path, as a man and a woman, both wearing crowns of silver on their heads rushed toward us with several more guards right behind them. When the woman stepped closer, my eyes widened in shock and I staggered backward. She hugged Marley, as did the man. Both seemed upset with him about leaving in the first place. He assured them he was fine and stepped aside. I had business in the human realm. And it appears I came just in time. It should not be night. The man and woman both glared at the vampires, but when their gazes landed on me, they paled and the woman sucked in a pained breath. Her hair was exactly like mine. 
her face nearly identical to mine except older. And those eyes. Those were my eyes staring back at me. This woman, the queen I guessed, from the circlet on her head, why did I look like her? My heart pounded away as I shook my head, not willing to believe any of this was truly happening. Marley said I was a princess. It didn't even click until right then that our parents, my parents, were the king and queen. If that was true, then who the hell was I raised with? Seneca? Draven whispered. You all right? No, I am not all right. What the hell is this? Watch your tongue, the captain snapped. Captain, perhaps you should watch yours, Marley said sternly. This is Princess Seneca, my sister, and long-lost daughter of the king and queen. She has finally returned home to us. Daughter, the queen spat angrily, her eyes growing colder the longer she glared at me. What daughter? Mother, Marley scolded. She held up her hand, silencing him. We have no daughter. Whatever creature you've brought here, she is not our Seneca. Draven hissed as if angry for me at her harsh words. A small part of me appreciated it, since I was too stunned to do anything for myself in response. Mother, Marley tried again. She has come home. It's time. That is not my daughter, the queen insisted again. She is nothing but a monster. Arrest them all and throw them in the cells. I will not have this tainted being in my presence any longer. You bitch. My yell made every guard gasp in shock as the queen's mouth fell open. What did you say to me? You heard me. You think I wanted to come here? Your son dragged my ass here. And you, I don't want anything to do with you either. If you are my parents, you did a piss-poor job, leaving me alone in the human realm. Who raised me, huh? Who were they? Did you even care when they died and left me alone? I challenged even as two guards moved to grab hold of my arms. I fought against their hold, trying to get to the woman Marley claimed was my real mother. Did you care when I was taken by Rudarius? She clenched her jaw as she glanced at Marley with a look I couldn't read, then back to me. I lost my daughter many years ago. You are not full fi. Not anymore. The hollowness in my soul turned to a burning fire of pure rage. I screamed as I lunged for her, ready to attack her or kill her. I wasn't even sure in that moment, and didn't really care either. I heard someone yell my name, and then more guards were on me, dragging me away. I heard a tearing sound as someone yanked on the back of my shirt. Suddenly the weight on my back was gone, and I fell to my knees in the grass barely a foot away from the queen's skirts. A hush fell over the garden, heavy and wrought with tension. I wondered what happened when cool night air brushed across my back. My now exposed back. Your wings, Marley whispered. I curled in on myself, knowing exactly what they all saw. Marley's voice was tortured. Who did that to you? Seneca, where are your wings? The words became lodged in my throat as I felt their eyes on me, judging me, confirming their queen's words that I was a monster. Slowly I sat upright, and glared right into those green eyes I wanted nothing to do with as I said, they were stolen from me. Happy mother? Is this what you wanted for your daughter? A brief flicker of regret flitted across her face, then she turned her back to me and marched away. The man I assumed was my father follow. You heard your queen, the captain said. Take them to the cells. Captain, Marley argued as I was hauled to my feet. Wait. I am sorry prince but I have no choice. I let the guards take my arms and guide me down the stone path. Behind me Draven kept whispering my name, but I tuned him out. Marley and the captain continued to argue, until we were inside and led down a set of stone steps. I was shoved into a cell, and the iron door slammed shut in my face. I remained facing the wall, with a tiny window showing me overgrown weeds and nothing more. The only light came from scattered torches lining the walls on the outside of the cells. There were no walls between the cells, just iron bars. Seneca, Draven called to me. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what? I asked, defeated. How had this happened? Why had I let myself get mixed up in this mess? Your wings. Who took them from you? 
Who the hell do you think? I grabbed the bars as I shook them viciously. You think you know pain, Draven? You know nothing. You hear me? Nothing. Just leave me alone. We'll get out of this. Your brother will make them understand that we can stop Rudarius. Or he won't, and we'll rot down here forever, I replied quietly. Seneca, he said, but the clanging of bells ringing overhead followed by shouts stopped whatever he was going to say. Somewhere in the dark recesses of my mind I knew what those bells meant, had heard them before. Alarm bells. The castle was under attack. I climbed on top of the rickety wooden bench in my cell, stood on my toes and peered out through the tiny window. Sets of legs ran past. Guards, from what I could tell. The bells continued to peal as Draven and Shane whispered behind me. I didn't need to listen, to know they were talking about the same thing I was thinking. Rudarius had come to the Phi Kingdoms. We were too late. Thank you for listening. This has been a Ciara Graves book. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new releases.